Hello, everybody. Sorry. <laughs> Chair McPherson, we are ready to start. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is February 23rd, 2001 at 9 a.m. Uh, welcome to the meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Supervisor, if I may, before I call, do roll call, I will give the public listening the ways to participate in our meeting today. Very good, very well. Thank you, and actually, I would like to introduce myself. I am actually the Chief Deputy Clerk of the Board, and my name is Stephanie Cabrera. And to those listening, welcome to the teleconference for February 23rd, 2021, Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors meeting. Pursuant to the provisions of the Governor's Executive Order N29-20, this meeting is being held virtually. The County welcomes the public to participate in today's meeting using the Zoom link provided on our website at www.santacruzcountyca.iqm2.com. Click on today's date and then the agenda. You will find the Zoom link there or you will be able to type it in as you see it on the screen. If you wish to participate by phone, you may do so by calling 1669-900-6833. The meeting ID is 886-4522-8831. And again, you may call 1669-900-6833 and enter the meeting ID. If you need further help logging into today's meeting, you may call the clerk of the board's office at 831-453-2323 and someone will help you log into the meeting. Thank you. Very well, thank you. And uh, clerk, please call the roll. Koenig? Present. Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. Thank you, Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, we will now have a moment of silence uh, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. I have the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to, to the, the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. all. Uh, Mr. Palacios, uh, CAO, did we have we consider late additions to the agenda, additions and deletions uh, from the consent or regular agendas? Uh, yes, Chair Mc, McPherson and members of the board, we have a number of corrections and uh, and some uh, additional materials. On the consent agenda, item number 52, there's a correction. The item should read, approve the addition of 34 full-time equivalent limited term staff positions for the emergency shelter response and rehousing efforts related to COVID-19 and approved funding of the benefits representative positions as recommended by the director of the human services department. On item 53, there's additional materials which are attached to the email. There's an addenda on the consent agenda. Item 67.1, this will be to adopt a resolution authorizing the chair of the board to complete the designation of sub-recipient agent resolution form 130 as required by the hazard mitigation grant program and take related actions as recommended by the county administrative office. There's a board memo printout, there's a resolution and Cal OES designation of authorized agent form. There's also an addenda 67.2 this is to adopt a resolution approving and accepting the terms and conditions related to the enclosed property acquisition agreement, approve a amendment to cooperative agreement for real property services between the County of Santa Cruz and the SCCRTC, increasing compensation by $596,310, authorize the chair of the board to execute the deeds associated with said agreements 
and take related actions as recommended by the Deputy CAO, Director of Public Works. There's a board memo printout resolution of Highway 1 acquisitions. There's a quick claim deed section 83 transfer, RTC county co-op agreement, and there's an easement contract and deed. Uh, there's additional materials as well. There's a revised attached, revised memo page one and a revised attachment E. That concludes our uh, additions and corrections, Chair McPherson. Thank you. Uh, item number four, the uh, any announcement by board members of items that they would like to have removed from the consent to the regular agenda? Seeing none, uh, we will go to item number five, public comment. This is the time for any person uh, to address the board once during public comment, not exceeding two minutes. Comments must be directed to items on today's consent uh, and closed session agendas yet to be heard items on the regular agenda or on the topic, not on today's agenda, but within the jurisdiction of the board. We'll take additional, uh, we'll take uh, public comments now for up to 30 minutes and if necessary, additional time will be allowed for public comment to be, uh, to be made after the last item on today's regular agenda, which is going to be going into the afternoon. Um, is there anybody that would, uh, from the public that would like to make comments to us? Yes, Chair, we do have members of the public that would like to make public comment. If I may address these members on the protocol for public comment for a moment. Yes. Okay. To those listening, now is the time for public comment. If you wish to comment and are joining us through the Zoom link, please find the hand icon on the bottom of your screen and click on the icon to raise your hand. This will place you in line to speak. When it is your turn to speak, I will call your name or you call you by the last four digits of your phone number when it is your turn to speak. If you're calling in from a phone, please dial nine now. This will virtually raise your hand and I'll identify you by the last four of your digits. Each speaker, you will have two minutes to speak. Please accept the unmute and start speaking when your name is called. Caller 1999. Your microphone is unmuted and you have two minutes to speak. Good morning, my name is James Ewing Whitman. Can I be heard? Yes. Excellent. So um, there's 983 pages on the agenda today. I wish I had time to comment on number 15, 19, 25, 26, 32, 36, 45, 49, 55, and 65. Uh, I thought there was a meeting on February 9th. This is what I wrote. The dogs hold an election. I don't have time to discuss how dogs pick their leaders, except to say centuries later, they still have not found a candidate that smells good under its tail. Yet in the USA, before it became USA Incorporated, by the 1871 Organics Act, there was an office in every county level that could arrest the president. Maybe more candidates should try this example of a platform. And this is from His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. The paradox of our age. We have bigger houses, but smaller families. More conveniences, but less time. We have more degrees, but less sense. More knowledge, but less judgment. More experts, but more problems. More medicines, but less healthiness. We've been all the way to the moon and back, but have trouble crossing the street to meet the new neighbor. We build more computers to hold more information to produce more copies than ever, but have less, less communication. We have become long on quantity, but short on quality. These are times of fast foods, but slower digestions. Tall men, but short character. Steep profits, but shallow relationship. It is a time when there is much in the window, but nothing in the room. Here's something I like to offer to community members. So besides the ability to provide notices of liability to the FCC and ANSC, 
that are both international corporations, as is USA Incorporated, every community member will have the opportunity to provide notice of liability to Microsoft, Apple, SpaceX, etc. I am offering free opportunities to learn how to do this and with only the cost of printing and with a very interesting document about the history of foundations that seem to control every aspect of every city and county in the U.S., but with specific focus upon Santa Cruz County. You have two minutes to speak. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start speaking. Good morning, Chair McPherson. Good morning, members of the board. This is Jim Heaney. I am the uh, Chief Steward for the County of Santa Cruz, my employees of the General Representation Unit. Um, I did contact the board over the weekend. We have a grave concern about item 42, which is the outsourcing of the cook's positions at uh, at the jail uh, kitchens. And we are asking that the board remove this from the consent agenda and put it as a regular agenda item so that we may address this item. So that is our request this morning. Um, this, as far as I could tell, is the only opportunity for us to ask for this to be removed from the consent agenda, which used to be a regular portion of the agenda before we went digital. Thank you for your time, I am done. Carol Bourne, you have two minutes to speak. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Good morning, this is Carol Bjorn. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. In 2008, Dr. Anthony Fauci co-authored a paper about the Spanish flu pandemic. In that paper, what did Dr. Fauci and his colleagues find? Here's a quote. The evidence from the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic indicates that bacterial pneumonia led to the vast majority of deaths, end quote. I'm going to read that again. The evidence from the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic indicates that bacterial pneumonia led to the vast majority of deaths, end quote. So what would cause the bacteria to proliferate? Wearing face mask. Here's another quote. The virus landed the first blow while bacteria delivered the knockout punch, end quote. So Fauci knew that masks caused the bacterial buildup that caused pneumonia. Not only did he not warn the public of this, he recommended the public wear a face mask, even though we all know there are effective treatments for COVID-19 such as HCQ. So please remove any face mask requirements from the, the people of Santa Cruz County today. Please also remove any other um, restrictions around COVID-19 today. Further, as I have previously talked about, the PCR tests and the COVID vaccines have not been approved by the FDA. Therefore, they are classified as emergency use authorization, which means they're experimental. They cannot be mandated. Mandating products approved for emergency use violates federal and state law since EUA means the product, products are investigational and experimental. Federal and state law are both very clear that mandates are legal for EUA products. This comes from the Nuremberg Code. Pardon me, Chair McPherson. Supervisor Coonerty has his hand raised. Yeah, um, thank you. But just briefly, uh, to speak to Jim Heaney's point, um, we had a moment where uh, the board members could remove items, uh, but we left uh, all the items on the consent agenda. I would encourage any members uh, of the county bargaining units or impacted employees or concerned community members to speak about that item during this oral communications time. You, you have two minutes, just like you would um, if the item had been pulled and it's an opportunity for you to have your voice heard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well. Thank you. Caller 2915. You have two minutes to speak. Please accept the unmute and the timer will begin when you begin to speak. Good morning. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, good morning to the board and staff. I am uh, bringing to you some information I think is very critical, especially for our CZU fire areas. Tomorrow is at 8.30, the California State Board of Forestry will hold a 
fire safe rule making workshop. This is bringing back reg uh, proposed regulations that are shocking. I'm going to read for you an excerpt from comment submitted by CSAC and the rural county representatives of California to the board. Quote, the proposal to flatly prohibit rebuilding of existing homes and businesses lost due to disaster within these no-build areas is more severe than the prior draft regulations and is especially ill-conceived. Rebuilding an existing home or business creates no new impact, no heightened fire risk, and no increased fire serve need. There is no nexus to require upgrades to existing public roads as a condition of rebuilding these structures. Moreover, prohibiting homeowners and small businesses who have lost everything from rebuilding their homes is unfair, particularly to uninsured and lower income residents who cannot simply afford to move elsewhere. The resulting displacement would also hinder achievement of this region's housing goals, further exacerbating the housing and homelessness crisis. Board staff's concern for, quote, replicating an excessively hazardous situation, end quote, is notable, but this does not justify dispossessing residents of their homes and their livelihoods, end quote. This meeting will be virtual tomorrow morning beginning at 8.30. I have contacted Assemblyman Stone and Senator Laird and... and Veronica Velasquez, you have two minutes to speak. Please accept the unmute and the timer will begin when you start speaking. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Veronica Velasquez. I work for the Department of Family and Children's Services as a senior social worker, and I also serve as chapter president for SEIU 521 membership here in the county. I'm here to speak with you today about item 42 on the board's agenda, the sheriff's proposed outsourcing of cook positions in his department. I urge you to vote no on this outsourcing. Outsourcing will not fix the financial crisis our county faces. Uh, for con context, the supposed savings from our outsourcing our members' jobs amounts to less than 0.001% of the county's budget. And what do we? What do these minuscule savings buy us uh, instead of a good union job with living wages, benefits, and a pension? Uh, workers will receive minimum wage and minimum benefits. Um, since the pandemic began, cooks have gone above and beyond, including regularly working overtime to make sure meals are served uh, during this extremely stressful period. Not one meal has been missed for an officer or an inmate. The sheriff's outsourcing our members' job after all their hard work and everything they've been through this past year is the slap in the face. Um, what makes this proposal all that more frustrating is that help is on its way. Santa Cruz County is projected to receive 53 million in relief revenue through the upcoming federal relief legislation. Uh, the intent of this relief funding is to cover for specific budget deficits like the one facing the sheriff's department. As a union, we are ready and willing to work with management to do everything we can to make sure that we pursue preserve these uh, union jobs, um, that we have a lot of uh, qualified, uh, competent um, community members that um, would be able to benefit from uh, living wages um, and uh, appropriate health care in this community. Um, outsourcing hurts our community um, without helping the financial challenges the county faces. I urge you once again to vote no on the item. Thank you, James Sandoval. You have two minutes to speak. Please accept the unmute and the timer will begin when you start speaking. Hi, can, good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, supervisors. Uh, my name is James Sandoval. I'm the union representative for the fixed route and paratransit operators at Santa Cruz Metro and the paratransit drivers and lift line in Watsonville. I forwarded you um, all an email I received from Tony Sloss, a vaccine liaison officer for the Public Health Operations Center, where I asked him um, various questions and clarifications and um, trying to figure out when transit operators are able to get the vaccine. I also asked him um, a couple of other questions uh, regarding that. And I saw that we were moved from phase 1B tier 2. and. Um, I don't really see us anywhere else on that list. So um, 
I can't seem to get a direct answer or even a rough estimate of when it will be our turn. I do want to emphasize that our operators are on the front lines exposed every day in a box with many passengers breathing the same air. And we just recently went through an outbreak at Metro where many operators caught COVID. You know, every day we, we can't get the vaccine could be detrimental. MTA has lost over 136 operators and counting due to COVID. Um, I just urge you as County Board of Supervisors to prioritize your bus and paratransit operators in the county so, so we could get the vaccine soon. Thank you very much for your time. Monica McGuire, you have two minutes to speak. Please accept the unmute. The timer will begin when you begin speaking. Thank you. I, I'm. Can you hear me? I guess it's Monica. Um, we are continually not being responded to, which is still very painful um, because that is your jobs. But the the key is to bring you new information. I'm so sorry for that last gentleman that he hasn't got this yet. Please hear this coming from the highwire.com uh, investigative reporter. Uh, Mr. Jackson and this truth that these vaccines are not actually even vaccines, they are treatments. Please hear. As these vaccines were coming out, we were we were promised a safety net um, as they were being trialed. And we saw these things coming into markets and coming into people's arms at that point and they vaccinating millions. We were promised a safety net and we were promised um, uh, answers and ways to uh, to petition if we get hurt. and. Headlines are showing what appears to be the truth, uh, and this is right out of New York Times. This is called this is the FDA. Uh, as millions get shots, FDA struggles to get safety monitoring system running. Not even is running. So it says in here, the much touted system the government designed to monitor any dangerous reactions won't be capable of analyzing safe, safety data for weeks or months, according to numerous federal health officials. For now, federal regulators are counting on a patchwork of existing programs that they acknowledge are inadequate because of small sample size, missing critical data, or other problems. It gets better. Use FDA officials acknowledge that a promise monitoring system known as BEST is still in its developmental stages. They expect it is it, it to start analyzing vaccine safety data. So I'm pausing it. I hope you could hear that well enough. The truth is you can go to thehighwire.com, just as it sounds, or childrenshealthdefense.org and see all the information about this is not a vaccine on the layers that we usually know and understand. Please inform. Jessica Peters, you have two minutes to speak. Please accept the unmute and the timer will begin when you start speaking. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Uh, just want to address the public comment time period. It, it seems to be more difficult to communicate with the board these days, and I'm wondering what's changed. Why are public comments being limited to two minutes at each meeting? Every single person is being cut off. As a matter of fact, everyone that spoke this morning has been cut off up to this point. Also, I'm wondering why web comments aren't being read into the record. You need to read these comments. For many, this is the only way that they can participate. They can't wait two hours during the workday to comment on other on the issues that they're looking to talk about. Um, other boards, they're giving three minutes. Please give the public their due time and opportunity to communicate with you. Thank you. User one. You have two minutes to speak. Please accept the unmute and the timer will begin when you start speaking. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Um, Dr. Sharon Goldberg provided a testimony October 4th, 2018 before about 5G dangers to the Michigan State Committee Subcommittee, Michigan Senate Committee. I'm urging and I'm asking, I'm urging people who are listening and asking uh, the Board of Supervisors myself to, to uh, for a halt to the 5G deplor deployment. deployment. Um, also, we can contact the planning department. They have a hearing tomorrow uh, morning um, regarding increasing the proliferation of 5G. Um, just as this county deemed itself a sanctuary county, it can take back um, take back its sovereign, sovereignty to protect the health of its citizens. Here's Dr. Sharon Goldberg. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. 
I'm Sharon Goldberg. I'm an internal medicine physician. I've practiced medicine for 21 years, and my background is mostly academic, internal medicine, hospital-based, clinical research, and medical education. Um, I am going to skip many of the things I wanted to say because I didn't realize it was only five minutes. Wireless radiation has biological effects, period. This is no longer a subject for debate when you look at PubMed and the peer-reviewed literature. These effects are seen in all life forms, plants, animals, insects, microbes. In humans, we have clear evidence of cancer now. There is no question. Um, we have evidence of DNA damage, cardiomyopathy, which is the precursor of congested heart failure, neuropsychiatric effects. So 5G is not a conversation about whether or not these biological effects exist. They clearly do. 5G is a conversation about unsustainable health care expenditures. Why do I say this? Thank you, Jim Haney. You have two minutes to speak. Please accept the unmute and the timer will begin when you start speaking. Thank you. Again, Jim Haney, uh, Chief Steward for the County of Santa Cruz. Uh, my apologies for needing to come back on because uh, apparently there's been a change in process here where in past years, uh, the union and other members of the public could come and ask for something to be removed from the consent agenda. Apparently, we have to do that through a board member now. Uh, as a, uh, someone spoke earlier, this does not seem to include the public very uh, democratically. But briefly, uh, we have an issue with item 42, which is the outsourcing of the cook's jobs for a number of reasons. Um, absolutely, uh, these folks have shown that they are solid and committed county employees. They work any shift they're asked to work, they work overtime. And even though personnel will tell you that they're going to be placed, these folks are cooks by profession. They're not looking to work on a public works road crew. They're not looking to do clerical work. They're looking to do what they believe is their life's calling, which is to feed folks. And that includes inmates, that includes the sworn officers. And there's no way that our uh, contractor is going to do nearly the jobs these folks do. It's gonna have a negative effect not only on them, on their families and on our community. And a number of these folks will not be placed. And so they will be going out into a pandemic world, attempting to find work in the food industry where look around, restaurants are at partial if they're even open uh, staffing. So what we wanna tell you is essentially that uh, the email I sent the board this weekend that mentioned many items where Airmark, the contractor, is truly a bad company. And I'm really surprised that the county has not done their due diligence when reviewing this contract to make sure that the company was competent and capable. The state of Michigan fired this company because they found maggots in their kitchen. Is this what you want as a board? We ask you to not approve this contract today. Thank you. Thank you, Carol Bourne. You have two. Number two, you have two minutes. User number two, you have two minutes to speak. The timer will begin when you begin speaking. Right here. Um, this is Marilyn Garrett. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, the problem I see here is that though we're told this is a government of, for, and by the people, it's of, for, and by the corporations like Verizon, the telecom industry, et cetera. And corporate rule is incompatible with democracy. We're trying to get some democracy here and protection of the people. I want to continue the testimony of Dr. Sharon Goldberg on the hazards of 5G, and this county is rolling out the red carpet for this disastrous technology. Here's Dr. Sharon Goldberg. I think most of you know statistics. They're very scary. One in three American children will become diabetic in their lifetime, and if they're Hispanic females, the number is one in two. So what does this have to do with wireless radiation? Wireless radiation and other electromagnetic fields, such as magnetic fields and dirty electricity, have been clearly 
associated with elevated blood sugar and diabetes. That is what the peer-reviewed literature says. It is not opinion. The closer you live to a cell tower, the higher your blood glucose. That is based on hemoglobin A1C measurements. So the idea with small cells of putting the cells closer to people's homes and bedrooms scientifically is very dangerous. And from an economic perspective, it's dangerous. And you may not know this. I was shocked to find this out. But the way you create a diabetic, a model of diabetes in rats, in the lab, is by exposing them to 2.4 gigahertz. And this is not for long-term exposure. Um, Thank you, Chair. That concludes the speakers for public comment. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, we will now move to uh, the items uh, or to action on the consent agenda. And I will ask each board member if there's anything that they may want to remove or comment on uh, on the agenda. Uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Koenig, or Supervisor Koenig. Uh, no comments, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Supervisor Friend. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do want to comment on item 57, which is a public works project in my district. And I want to uh, thank Mark Strudley and his team uh, uh, and others that have been working on this in the public works department. It's, it's actually quite a remarkable uh, wetland restoration project that will address some of the flooding issues down on the, uh, by the Pajaro River mouth, as well as for the Pajaro Dunes area. Uh, if you haven't been down there, it's an absolutely beautiful area, but it floods consistently and there's been some habitat related issues. Uh, this project, which he and his team have taken the lead on, uh, is going to be fully funded by outside sources and will do a lot to address some of the flooding of that issue, but even more importantly, to restore the environmental conditions down there. So um, this is a project that is often overshadowed by the Greater Papua River Levee Project, and I understand why, but this is something that they deserve a lot of credit for, for the work that they're doing down there. I just want to acknowledge their work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Supervisor Coonerty. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, good morning. Just a couple of comments. First on item number 43, which is the uh, sexual assault forensic program. Um, I just want to thank uh, Sheriff Jim Hart and his team uh, for getting this back up and going on this side of the hill. It's, a, it's an important effort uh, to uh, address victims to assist victims of uh, sexual assault uh, in this county and I'm glad it's I'm glad it's happening. Item number 48, the Fish and Game Commission uh, allocated a relatively small amount of, amount of money, but to five really cool programs, which will uh, expose our youth to science and nature. And I just wanted to take a moment and recognize the work of that commission and these grants uh, and the organizations that do the work. Item number 56, which is the CZU repairs uh, by Public Works. I just wanna take a moment um, to thank the Public Works staff who worked quickly and hard um, to repair culverts and roads and our infrastructure in the wake of the CZU fire. Um, they did excellent work and they did it quickly. Uh, and, I'm, uh, and we're all grateful for, uh, for the work they did under very difficult conditions. And finally, on item 67.1, um, this is the uh, OR3, the Office of Resilience, Rebuilding and Recovery, um, applying for hazard mitigation grants. I think in our new reality, this is incredibly important um, to start building our infrastructure for this new reality that we see not only in our state, but uh, now across the country in Texas this week. Uh, it'll be another place next week where uh, old infrastructure is going to be very challenged uh, by the impacts of climate change. So uh, I'm excited they're doing this. I do want to add additional direction that uh, any grant should be approved by the board. Um, as you can imagine, though, though there's competing public interests or uh, other efforts, and it should come before us so that we can hear from the community and uh, make sure that it works with what the what these communities want. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Caput. Uh, uh, thanks, Bruce. Uh, I'll just comment on uh, number twenty-seven. Like to welcome uh, Felipe Hernandez as the fourth district appointee to the Human Ser Services Commission, and. Uh, a quick comment on item number 39, 
it's good to see uh, unanticipated revenue in the amount of $69,500 for the Azteca Youth uh, Soccer Program, which uh, uh, is based basically in South County, but they do travel. And uh, it's a real good program under the probation department. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Cabot. I have a couple of issues I'd like to address. Uh, number one, uh, first one is item number 26, the Highway 1 and 9 encampment, which I know a lot of us have received some correspondence uh, regarding this issue. I want to thank Supervisor Coonerty's office uh, for partnering with my office to bring this item forward. Uh, for co uh, We co-signed a letter uh, to the same effect from the Santa Cruz Mayor uh, Donna Myers to the governor's office. The public health and uh, safety situation at the intersections of highways one and nine uh, really is unacceptable. And we are requesting the governor to give his approval for Caltrans to work with the city to close the camp and clean the property. Uh, local governments cannot bear this burden alone and the state's help here is really critical. We will continue working with the city to prevent these large encampments from forming. Uh, and it's gonna require a collaborative effort of both our social services systems and our law enforcement partners. So I wanna thank the city for this cooperative effort and I hope we can address and clean up this, this um, encampment uh, very quickly. Um, just generally on items 31 to 36, uh, there are commission reports and from uh, various commissions. We have about 40 of them throughout the county. And this is a good opportunity to once again, thank the community members who serve on these uh, uh, committees and commissions. These are volunteer efforts and roles that advise the board on our staff on the important issues facing our community. And I also wanna thank the county employees who staff these commissions uh, for all the work they put into providing the advice to the board uh, and our departments. It's very much appreciated and we, you just need to know that and thank you for your ongoing efforts. On item 52, uh, the limited term positions, uh, I wanna thank uh, you and our human services department for its management of our COVID-19 sheltering system and all the personnel uh, that effort has required and it has been plenty and many people that have been in, uh, engaged in this. As mentioned in the report, there are deadlines associated with the funding that underwrites our current sheltering. Uh, we're working on how to maintain shelter for folks after COVID so that their housing remains destabilized. Um, uh, and I, I look forward to hearing more about this report in March. Um, as uh, Supervisor Coonerty mentioned on the, the repair work that Public Works is on item 56, um, I also on item uh, 63, with everything else going on that we have at the moment, it's easy to overlook the ongoing repair damage that occurred during uh, close to four years ago now. I wanna thank again, the Public Works Department for coordinating the repairs on Oak Bear Creek Road and for their management in these repairs, as well as our Measure D program and the fire recovery response. So uh, Public Works has been above and beyond the call of duty for months on end now, um, and we really do appreciate it. And I think that uh, concludes our comments on the uh, consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve? I'll move the consent agenda as amended. As amended. Moved by okay. Coonerty. Second. I'll second, uh, second Supervisor Cabot. Yeah. Okay, uh, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Supervisor Coonerty? Aye. Supervisor Caput? Aye. Chair McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Yeah, Motion passes. Approved. Okay, we will go to our regular agenda, item number seven, and one of the most delightful uh, times of our, our board meetings that we have each year, and that's the presentation of our 2020 employee recognition program as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. Uh, Mr. Palacios, would you like to introduce this item, please? Yes, uh, Chair Mc McPherson and members of the board, uh, we're doing something a little bit different. Um, we normally would be doing our annual employee awards program, but this year because of the um, COVID uh, situation, we have decided to do it a little bit different. Uh, 
In 2020, uh, our community was faced with monumental challenges, including the COVID-19 global pandemic and CZU lightning complex fires. Uh, these are uh, incredible emergencies that our staff has had to deal with. Um, the worst, worst uh, pandemic, at least in many of our lifetimes, at the same time as the worst, worst uh, fires in our county's history. Uh, over the years, we witnessed how all county employees responded to these challenges and performed his or her work in a, manager, in a manner which deserves special recognition. In an effort to recognize all employees for their dedicated service on behalf of the County of Santa Cruz, individual or team nominations for 2020 Employee Recognition Awards were not requested. Instead, department heads were asked to submit 2020 departmental achievements supporting our local residents during this time through the efforts of their staff. In lieu of an award ceremony, we ask that the Board of Supervisors recognize all county staff by issuing a proclamation highlighting departmental accomplishments. Department heads have been invited to speak as a representative of their staff regarding their accomplishments during this very uh, significant and difficult year. And with that, each board member will be uh, asked to present awards for the five of the county departments. Board members will present the award to a department and a representative of that department will be invited to speak for a few minutes following the presentation of the award. And with that, I, uh, I see that we would start, I believe with Supervisor Koenig. We'll be presenting the first of our awards um, so Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, CAO. Uh, so staff in the agricultural, uh, this, this award goes to the agricultural commissioner. Staff in the agricultural commissioner's department quickly formulated a plan for rapid deployment of much needed protective equipment in spring of 2020. As agricultural production in our region got underway and protective equipment was difficult to find. The department organized the delivery of COVID-19 protective supplies and distributed information regarding access to COVID-19 testing, food resources, and rental assistance to farm worker housing locations in Santa Cruz County, including the Buena Vista Migrant Center. In addition, staff went out of their way to prioritize delivery of these protective supplies while continuing to complete their regular work assignments. And on several occasions, this meant working long days and weekends, which staff did without hesitation. Each member of this department deserves accolades for all that they have done to support the agricultural community during this difficult past year. Accepting this award on behalf of the Agricultural Commissioner's Department is Agricultural Commissioner Juan Hidalgo. Uh, good morning, Chair, members of the board, Juan Hidalgo, Agricultural Commissioner. Uh, thank you so much. My staff and I are humbled by this recognition. As a department, we are proud of the opportunity to work and collaborate with growers and local community-based organizations to support our agricultural workers during the challenges we have experienced this past year created by the COVID-19 pandemic and then the wildfires this past summer. These collaborations made a tremendous difference in getting important protective equipment quickly out to our farms to protect our essential agricultural workers. I want to thank my staff for their efforts and dedication to find ways to continue to serve and support our community under the extraordinary circumstances we have experienced these past few months. So thank you so much for the recognition uh, uh, to my staff and myself, uh, and we really appreciate it. And it's been uh, an honor to be able to step up as a department to support our community uh, during a, a, a time of need that uh, we haven't experienced in our lifetimes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner. Next, it's uh, my honor to award, um, at, uh, recognize animal services. Animal Services staff, volunteers, and the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office worked tirelessly providing outstanding care to animals that were left behind due to the, due to the mandatory evacuations during the CZU Lightning Complex fires. 
Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter was not only a safe haven for approximately 400 evacuated animals, but also an emergency supply drop-off and pickup location for evacuees. SCCAs also managed the animals at the county fairgrounds and in total oversaw the care of over 1,900 evacuated animals. From dogs and cats to exotic birds, snakes, and livestock, the SCCAS team made sure they were well cared for. Some animals required special medical attention from outside contract veterinarians, which was provided as well. All animals evacuated from the fires stayed at the shelter and fairgrounds free of charge. Staff were also able to take in animals from shelters that had to close to the public due to COVID exposures and were able to get many of these animals adopted out to new homes. The Animal Services Department demonstrated their commitment to serving all pets in need, regardless of their owner's financial circumstances, by having staff travel to homeless encampments to vaccinate animals. The shelter also allowed low-income community members to receive free vaccinations for their pets, as well as get free food for their pets at their pet food pantry, as well as through pet food distribution events in Watsonville. The immense amount of work that the Animal Services Agency performed in order to save and caretake the animals of our community during this past year is just outstanding. And we all thank them for their tireless efforts. Accepting this award on behalf of the Animal Services Department is Program and Development Manager, Erica Anderson. Thank you. Hi everyone. So for all of us, I think uh, 2020 was such a tough year. And I am so proud of our team and what we were able to accomplish uh, despite all these challenges. Each of our staff members were deployed as disaster service workers during this time as well, serving as staff at the different human shelters that were set up throughout the county, which also included our animal control officers serving as delivery drivers, bringing food, breakfast, lunch, and dinner to each of those sites as well. Um, when the pandemic hit, our doors remained open the entire time, as we knew it was so important to continue to provide these free and low cost services to the community. And I'm also very proud of our staff and volunteers who made that possible and stuck through all these challenges to really provide these essential services to pet owners in need. Then the CZU fire hit and that completely flipped our worlds upside down. And in total, we were caring for over 4,500 animals. This included not only the 500 that were at our shelter, the 1,200 that were at the fairgrounds that were being cared for by just amazing community members. But this also included the thousands of animals that our officers in the Santa Cruz County Equine Evacuation Team were going back into the burn zones on a daily basis to provide food and water to these animals that were left behind. Um, 2020 truly brought forth such a great need for us to see how we could meet people and their pets where they were out in the community. And that sometimes meant leaving our shelter site and going out and seeing what people needed. And I think often people think of the animal shelter as puppies and kittens. And I'm not gonna lie, we do get to cuddle a lot of cute animals here, but we really have learned from these challenges this year, how to accommodate the community and provide our services in sometimes a new and innovative way so that we can meet them where they are. And something that really stuck with me this year was said by a community member who lost her home in the fire. We were housing her pets for many months. Um, she said that she wasn't sure what she would have done with her pets during this time had animal services not been able to provide our safe keep program. And that question made me really nervous for what other communities might not be able to provide if they don't have a department like ours being able to support pet owners. And that made me very proud of the services that we provided this year. And I'm so thankful for this recognition for our department and the support from the community so that we can continue to make Santa Cruz County a better place for people and their pets. So thank you for the support today. Thank you, Development Manager Anderson. Next up, I wanna recognize the assessors and recorders departments. As a response to stay at home orders, staff in the recorders department worked tirelessly to set up remote workstations to record documents offsite, allowing staff to say, stay safe while keeping up with increased recording volume. Staff in the assessors and recorders departments assisted residents impacted by the CZU lightning complex fire at the recovery resource center at the Kaiser Permanente Arena by connecting them with various agencies and providing information regarding property tax relief. In addition, assessors and auditor controllers departments worked together to expedite property tax relief to victims of the CZU lightning complex fire, relying on their long hours and years of experience 
working together to process these tax redu reductions quickly and efficiently. During an incredibly, an incredibly difficult and stressful time, these departments provided much needed support and guidance for our residents that were impacted by the CZU Lightning Complex fire. And for that work, we thank them for all their hard work and dedication. Accepting the award on behalf of the Assessor and Recorders Department is Assessor Sean Saldivia. Good morning. Can you see me? <laughs> uh, we can't see you, but we can hear you. Okay, sorry about that. Well, I wanna thank the members of the board uh, on behalf of the staff of the Assessor Recorders Office. Uh, staff has really come together over the last year to not only maintain, but to extend services uh, to folks in need in the public. Uh, we now have staff in the Recorders Office that are recording from home. Uh, electronic recording. This is the only way we've been able to stay current with recordings over the past year. Uh, they've done a wonderful job. Staff in the assessor's office has really reached out to those affected by the CZU fires, uh, whether it's direct mail or email or phone calls. We even manned a, an information booth down at the uh, Resource Recovery Center for uh, quite a bit of time uh, to really get the word out on the tax relief that folks are entitled to uh, who are victims of that fire. Uh, those are just a, a couple of the ways that staff has really went the extra mile over the last year. And I wanna thank this board uh, for recognizing them with this proclamation. And, and I apologize about the video. I have no idea why that's not working. Thank you, Assessor Saldavia. Next, I wanna recognize the Auditor, Controller, Treasurer, Tax Collector's Office. Staff in the Auditor, Controller, Treasurer, Tax Collector's Office showed a tremendous amount of flexibility and resiliency during 2020. As vendor payment processing transitioned to be an almost fully remote operation and new procedures were implemented to allow for electronic processing of wire transfers, bank transfers, and other types of reports and forms using DocuSign. The county's collection teams processed over a thousand COVID-19 related penalty waiver applications, and their website was updated to be able to accept electronic collection payments and the property tax administration team uh, in collaboration with the assessor's department issued hundreds of supplemental tax credits in response to the CZU fire and the unfortunate reductions of the assessed values of properties. Staff collaborated with the personnel department and were able to process hundreds of extra help employees hired by the county to respond to the local emergencies, set up new pay codes for emergency response and COVID-19 related sick leave and respond to the various payroll implications of having a remote county workforce. As the financial engine for the county, we couldn't have gotten through this past year without your staff and we sincerely thank you for all your efforts to keep the wheels turning. Accepting this award on behalf of the Auditor, Controller, Treasurer, Tax Collections Department is Auditor Edith Driscoll. Thank you, Chair McPherson and members of the board. Thank you for this acknowledgement of the dedicated staff in this office. We are charged with the safeguarding and accounting of the assets of the taxpayers. This year, that also included staffing key roles in response to the CZU fire emergency, as well as the pandemic. This was not done alone. We also want to use this opportunity to thank our fellow departments who allowed us to fulfill our mission. On behalf of myself and the only 44 staff in the Auditor Controller Treasurer Tax Collector's Office, uh, we all would like to say thank you for the acknowledgement. Thank you, Auditor Driscoll. Well, thank you, Supervisor Koenig. I'm going to handle the next set. And I have to say how excited I was to hear not just what you talked about with those departments, but in general, this entire uh, recognition really does help paint a picture of each unique role that each department played during not just the pandemic, but also during the fires. And it really is quite remarkable, the work that county employees have done. And I have the honor of starting off with the county clerk of elections here and staff in the county clerk uh, elections department hosted voter outreach meetings through Zoom to provide information about the November 3rd, 2020 election and the changes that were being made to conduct it safely. And mobile voting units brought voting to all areas of the county, including communities that were impacted by the CZU lightning complex fires, as well as to all the hospitals, senior living and senior care facilities 
where voters were not able to access voting easily. Staff also implemented a voter service center model, which involved mailing a ballot to every registered voter and providing in-person voting locations with extended hours to help flatten the voting curve, as they had said, to encourage voters to vote in ways other than in-person on election day. In addition, the staff worked with our information services department to set up a voter hotline that was staffed by county employees, which involved creating a special uh, conference line that rolled the voter hotline calls to various departments, buildings, and phone systems, and setting up restricted access to the voting registration database for the database for the hotline operators to obtain information and help direct the voter. They really did think of everything. And we would like to thank the County Clerk and Elections Department. Our county was able to safely participate in the election last November. And we saw the highest turnout in the history of Santa Cruz County. So accepting on behalf of the Clerk Elections Department is Program Coordinator, Marie Segura. Good morning, thank you. Good morning, Chair McPherson and members of the board, county staff and citizens. I'm extremely honored to be receiving this recognition for our Clerk Elections Department. We have faced exceptional challenges this year, but these challenges strengthen us to perform better at each stage and reach our election goals. Our staff could not have been more accomplished this year. And we had, would not have been able to do it without the support of so many county departments and also citizen volunteers. Personally, I, after, after 32 years of county employment in HSA public works and clerk elections, I hope to retire next month if my paperwork falls into place. I will exit my employment from the clerk elections department and I could not be more proud to have served with such wonderful staff and very supportive open door policy clerk supervisor to show ever. And with that, I thank you very much. And I thank all our citizens of the county. Um, it has been a huge pleasure in so many departments and so many facets of this uh, county work. Our supervisors have been very supportive to our department. So I appreciate, I appreciate this honor and thank you from all our department. Thank you. Congratulations on your retirement. Well thank deserved. You. You've had some wonderful people there retire in the last year. And so enjoy your retirement on behalf of all of us. We appreciate all that you did. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next department that gets some recognition here, well-deserved, is the County Council's Office. And staff in the County Council's Office provided focused legal services to assist the health services agency and the public health officer in responding to the COVID-19 crisis, which included significant collaboration in order to draft public health orders, pivot and adjust as new information service, and it sure did on a constant basis from the state, and to work with internal enforcement partners to implement these orders and also by the way to really help inform the board on on things that were going on and changes across the state and federal side staff drafted emergency ordinances contracts resolutions and directives to respond to the twin public emergencies to address shelter needs eviction protections increased services debris clearance and urgent needs for the purchase of goods all which help support our community in this extreme time of need staff also work collaboratively with the civil and juvenile divisions of the Superior Court to overcome logistical and technical hurdles to help ensure that the legal process in numerous matters continued to move forward at a reasonable pace, despite the significant challenges that were presented during the pandemic. We'd like to thank the County Council's Office for the many hours they put in providing legal support and guidance during this challenging year and accepting on behalf of County Council's Office as Assistant County Council, Jordan Scheinbaum. Jordan. Good morning, board. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of the Office of County Council, we truly thank you for your board's proclamation. Whether helping craft emergency health orders side by side with our county's public health officer, or working with stakeholders or our enforcement partners to implement those orders in some of the most challenging times anyone can remember, or coordinating nearly hourly with our general services department and our CAO's office to draft emergency ordinances, resolutions, and contracts so that the county could shelter folks who lost their homes in the CZU fires and provide desperately needed emergency services. I saw our entire office spring into action with this singular mindset of helping critical county departments step up and serve those in need. It made me truly proud to be part of the county council team, and I think that feeling is shared by my colleagues, who are the ones that truly deserve the recognition here today. 
I think I speak for my whole office when I say we were proud to be of service and lend aid so that other county departments that directly impact people's lives could do their jobs and help our community in a time of real need and do so in a truly concrete way that really help people directly. So we very much appreciate your board support and we thank you kindly for your proclamation. Thank you, Jordan, for your leadership and support of the entire county family and to everybody at the county council's office for your outstanding guidance and leadership. We do appreciate it. Thank you. We'll move on to child support services. And when the COVID pandemic required staff at the Department of Child Support Services to work remotely, the department adjusted by training staff on the use of DocuSign, creating general email boxes for the receipt and processing of legal documents, reaching out to case participants with upcoming court dates to educate them on the new remote hearing procedures, and increasing the use of TextPro for text-based communication. Staff recognized that in a year that was rife with financial insecurity for many people, adding enforcement actions for the failure to pay full child support would not be in the best interest of the families and staff that were able to suppress certain actions while, out, out, while allowing others to get back on their feet again and begin making their child support payments in full again. In addition to staff serving as disaster service workers, the Department of Child Support Services provided 16 surplus voice over internet protocol telephones to the health services agency to support the COVID call center and contact tracing needs. The families of Santa Cruz County appreciate all that the child support services agency has done to continue their commitment to supporting families in our community during this challenging time. And accepting this award on behalf of the department is child support services director, Jamie Murray. Jamie. Good morning, board members. I'm honored to accept this proclamation on behalf of the employees in the Department of Child Support Services. It has been an extremely challenging year with the onset of the pandemic, the CZU Lightning Complex fires being thrust into remote work and state funding reductions, which resulted in workforce, workforce reductions. Through collaboration with personnel and my fellow department heads, the majority of our displaced staff retained county employment. Several of our staff step, stepped up and performed disaster service work. Everyone in the department learned new skills as we adapted to remote work and balancing work, home, and school obligations. We remain resilient and ready to provide child support services to the parents and children in our community. I am very proud of the entire team in child support services. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you for your team's great work this year. Uh, very flexible in adjusting to the needs of the community during this time. I do appreciate that. Uh, we'll move on to the district attorney's office. And the DA's office had issued, as I'm sure many of you saw, press releases to alert the community about CZU fire-related scams that were taking advantage of fire victims and educated many in our community on how to protect themselves. Staff in the DA's office also worked with the Santa Cruz Superior Court to implement a system in which attorneys and parties could appear for court remotely supported the courts in their transition to accepting documents for filing online and in collaboration with the Information Services Department, established an online payment system which helped protect the community members as well as staff by reducing the need for in-person financial transactions. In addition, staff implemented the Neighborhood Courts Program, which many of us were involved in, which is a community-driven pre-filing diversion program designed to divert low-level misdemeanor offenses from entering the criminal justice system. Thank you to the entire DA's office for your efforts of the past year and accepting the award on behalf of the DA's office is our district attorney, Jeff Rosell. Jeff. Perhaps we don't have Jeff or Jeff's on mute. Maybe Jeff is giving a closing statement somewhere. Jeff this is your last chance. We know you like the microphone. Can, can you hear me now? Oh, we got, well, of course. Of course okay. you showed up there. All right, go for yeah. it. District Attorney Jeff Rizal. Thank you. I just wanna say on behalf of uh, the DA's office, uh, we are very grateful. And I just wanna, for the award, I wanna take a few moments to acknowledge our staff. Uh, throughout these challenging times uh, with the fire, with the, the murder of Sergeant Gutzweiler and many other challenges that we have faced, uh, the employees of the DA's office never lost sight of our mission and our duty to promote public safety. 
we have uh, not only with the remote uh, ability uh, with the courts uh, to, to uh, appear from home, but we have literally filing intake, all of the coordination with law enforcement agencies took place with, within a very short period of time. We also, uh, throughout this, I want to acknowledge those people that have been continually going to court. We have had uh, court appearances literally uh, every day where people have had to actually show up to court uh, in the midst of all this. And I, want, I think that needs to be acknowledged. Our unfailing commitment to victims uh, has continued. We have victim service representatives that have continued to provide service to victims throughout these challenging times. Uh, and uh, they have been challenging, make no mistake about it. I also wanna say that in terms of investigations, uh, investigators were up uh, for burglary and suppression uh, efforts to prevent looting, that the Bureau of Investigations literally took over the entire investigation of Sergeant Gutzweiler's murder. Uh, and those sort of things just show that we are working in cooperation with our law enforcement partners. We have an Apple settlement that Consumer Affairs did. They brought in $4.1 million, went after one of the largest corporations in the United States that was taking advantage of consumers. And uh, they, they were diligent in pursuing uh, that action and rectifying the behavior that had taken place. I also just wanna say that we've done many things. You mentioned um, supervisor friend, uh, peer court but there's been uh, peer review, there's been numerous other programs that have taken place. We're involved in the Blueprint for Safety. We did a South County Halloween event for uh, people that weren't gonna have a Halloween and that was incredibly successful through the efforts of a lot of folks in this office. So I just wanna say, uh, you touched on a lot of things we did. I've only touched on some of them, but make no mistake, the unfailing commitment from this office to protecting the public and public safety continued throughout these times. I just wanna make sure uh, I acknowledge that and we thank you and we are humbled by the award. Thank you, DA Rozell. And I think you were able to showcase uh, how much work your team has continued to do. The fact that work has not stopped over the last year and you guys really are uh, one of the top teams in the state and we appreciate that. Uh, congratulations to all those that were just acknowledged. I'm going to hand this over to my colleague, Supervisor Coonerty. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Uh, this is an exciting day, I think, to show the wide variety of work that's been done. And then also the way the departments have supported each other. Um, I think that collaboration not only paid dividends for the people who were um, you know, suffering from impacts from COVID as well as fires, uh, but hopefully for years to come. Uh, the first award I'm going to present today is to the General Services Department. Uh, that department played a major role in coordinating the, the collection of donations and supplies from four community members who were impacted by the CZU fire. Just days after the fires erupted, staff and General Services Department began taking steps to ready the county warehouse to accept donations from the public, making it the first, this first time the county had ever set up a location to accept community donations. As a, and then the community response continued to grow and staff collaborated with the Human Services Department to open a secondary warehouse in Watsonville. Because the outpouring of support from the community was unmatched, a system for tracking donations was needed, and assistance from the Auditor, Human Services, and County Council's Department led to the creation of a database for organizing the many items received. This database also allowed staff to develop a comprehensive layout for receiving donations, coordinating donate, uh, requests for donations, and for the subsequent delivery of the items to fire evacuees or to the evacuation sites. It was truly a team effort and managing in, in managing the collection and distribution of these generous donations. And through their hard work, the General Services Department and volunteers from the Volunteer Save Center were able to deliver much needed provisions to our displaced community members. On behalf of the county and the hundreds of people who received invaluable supplies, we thank you for all your hard work and commitment to help our fellow residents in a time when they needed it the most. Accepting on behalf of the General Services Department is Deputy Director Carol Johnson. Good morning, and thank you, Chair McPherson and members of the board for recognizing our staff of the General Services Department for their response to the August CZU lightning fire. I'm extremely proud to be a part of the General Services team. 
This community-wide effort would not have been possible without the dedication and tireless hours of our general services staff who were supported by employees in every county department, as well as retirees, community businesses, and residents. Our employees readied the warehouse in record time to be able to begin accepting donations of food, water, sleeping bags, tents, and so much more. It was incredible and heartwarming to see people drop off items one day and turn around the next day to volunteer. To give you some idea of the volume of donations, at one time, the line of cars waiting to donate went from the warehouse at the back of the M-Line campus almost to Highway 1. In addition, shortly after our M-Line warehouse was up and running, the county set up a second donation site down in Watsonville with the help of staff from HSD as well as the city of Watsonville. So thank you again for recognizing the staff of the General Services Department. We were humbled and so grateful to be able to support the county in, this, in their time of need. So thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thanks to your whole team. Uh, the next department we want to recognize is Information Services. 2020 was uh, the year that relied on technical support and innovation from the Information Services Department more than ever before. Staff completed major infrastructure changes and upgrades and created copious documentation on remote procedures to support some of the 1,200 or more remote workers accessing county resources from home and elsewhere. The ISD department also provided vital communication resources and support from the Office of Emergency Services and first responders during the days following, uh, during and following the CZU fire. By providing remote uh, communication abilities and technological resources to evacuation sites and command centers. Staff deployed laptops and printers for emergency response personnel, personnel set up call centers in support of responding to the need of evacuated citizens and created real-time county websites for fire victims and evacuees with maps of the impact of destruction and guidance for rebuilding. Without the quick thinking and problem solving of the ISD department staff, this past year of sheltering in place and working from home as well would have been much more difficult. And we thank you for continuing to come to our technological rescue uh, over and over and over again. Accepting this award on behalf of the ISD department is Assistant Director, Assistant Director Tibby McCann. Chair, Board, Mr. Palacios, I am Tibby McCann, Assistant Director in ISD, and I am honored to receive this recognition and accept this proclamation on behalf of the ISD department. Much of the time, not having recognition is a good thing for an IT department. That means everything is generally working. This year, it was a little bit different. In fact, it was a lot different. In addition to our never-ending normal work, we got 1,500 county staff up and working remotely when the shutdown happened. Happened. We spun up COVID shelter after shelter with Wi-Fi and internet, supported the EOC, TEPs, created website after website, apps, maps, worked to keep the communication infrastructure up and alive, deployed radios, cradle points, phones, PCs, laptops, and as Ryan said, printers, purchased and deployed $1.5 million worth of CARES equipment. Most of this was done in the midst of high pressure, rapid turnaround, and at times life-threatening conditions. We even managed to support a presidential election with 17 new polling sites, one mobile unit, plus a voter hotline. Admin, IT support, networking, telecom, GIS, sysadmin, radio shop, duplicating, programming, project management, and management. We were all in, all 61 of us, masks on, over and over during the year. It was also very personal for us, especially the CZU fire. Seven ISD families were evacuated and one lost his home of over 25 years. So it was real to us and the work meant more than ever. The amazing spirit and positive attitude by all of ISD was inspiring as the hits and the demands kept coming. I could not be more proud to acknowledge this recognition by the county. Thank you on behalf of ISD. Thank you, Tibby, and your whole team. Thank you. Uh, we really appreciate your work. The next department is the Parks and Rec Department. During the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Parks and Rec Department supported our community by providing childcare to essential workers. And when the shelter in place restri restrictions were relaxed, staff redesigned the childcare program to serve on-site support for children connecting to their online remote learning classes. 
Maintenance staff continued to keep our parks and facilities clean and safe, despite the added risk of in-person work, and put up new signage at all the parks describing the COVID-19 guidelines and practices, which in some cases involved removing entire picnic tables to ensure social distancing. Maintenance staff also assisted at the Santa Cruz County Fairgrounds, erecting animal enclosures for livestock and pets displaced by the fire, as well as assisting numerous uh, log logistical pro projects from delivering bottled water to the San Lorenzo Valley to helping clean up at fire evacuee shelters. We thank the Parks and Rec Department for their countless hours they put into keeping our community safe at our parks and facilities, and for also take care taking care of our children during the past year. Accepting this award on behalf of the Parks and Rec Department is Director uh, Jeff Gaffney. Thank you, and thank you, Chair and fellow board members and CAO Palacios for uh, giving us this uh, recognition and award. And, and Supervisor Coonerty, I think you were right on in that um, the way the departments work together and, and the camaraderie and, and partnership that we had, I think that's been palpable just in the last couple of um, recognitions and, and acceptance for those, those proclamations. So um, I wanted to recognize that first. And then I wanted to also just um, thank our employees in this department. It's been an honor and a privilege to be the director here at Parks. And from day one, as you highlighted, our staff has been there. Parks have been open from day one. We've had people that have taken care of and stewarded those lands and, and facilities and continued to do that without hesitation, even despite all of the ambiguity and fear that was out there in the beginning and, and continued to progress through the pandemic. Um, our recreation staff um, as well, they provided services to um, children at times when they had no idea whether their own safety would be at risk or not. They provided facilities uh, and care for those kids uh, so that families and, of essential workers could make it to work. Um, and I guess what was really uh, just amazing to look back is to watch how much we've actually made progress through this pandemic as a department um, to be able to provide services to uh, communities, especially underserved communities and, and people of color that we weren't able to get to before and were really critical during this time. We opened more parks, we opened more access points. Um, and again, um, in partnership with all of the people that are being recognized on this um, during this proclamation today. And it was just, uh, again, I can't uh, express how much of an honor and privilege it is to work in this county and work with these people every day. So thank you. Thank you, Jeff, and thanks to your whole department. Finally, uh, I'm gonna be presenting the personnel department. The personnel department played a huge role in mobilizing our response teams to both the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the CZU fires. Despite managers and non-managerial staff being reassigned to staff the COVID-19 response departmental operations call center for over five months, the personnel department was able to onboard nearly 600 disaster service workers to staff the county's homeless and evacuee shelters and other disaster related services, which required creating, testing, and implementing emergency same day hiring processes. To support the families of our county employees, the personnel staff collaborated with the Parks and Rec Department to set up five childcare centers for essential county staff, including negotiating space use with two non-county properties, managing logistics, and ensuring all COVID-19 safety guidelines were met. Staff also collaborated with the CEO, CAO's office, the ISD department, and members of others departments to establish the county's first remote work policy, which entailed researching best practices from our neighboring counties, as well as reaching out to private technology companies and other state and local jurisdictions for guidance. We thank the staff of the personnel department for all their hard work behind the scenes that allowed our county employees to respond to the unpre unprecedented disasters over the last year. Accepting this award on behalf of the personnel department is Director Ajita Patel. Good morning. This past year has brought forth some unprecedented challenges, to say the least. The personnel team has shown resiliency, creativity, dedication, and most importantly, commitment to public service. I am honored to work with this group, and on behalf of our department, thank you for the recognition today. Thank you, Ajita. Um, I'm now going to hand it off to uh, Supervisor Caput. Yes, uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, and 
I just want to say I'm proud of all the departments in the uh, uh, County of Santa Cruz and how everybody came together. And, uh, we, we had multiple disasters happening simultaneously and uh, to coordinate all that was, uh, was ex extremely tough and people were working under very pressured uh, situations. Uh, it's my honor to be able to give awards to three uh, departments, the planning, probation, and public works, and also uh, uh, the sheriff's coroner's office. Uh, I'm here to present the employee recognition award to the planning department. Uh, during the past year, staff in the planning department per performed intensive field and technical work to assess and characterize the geologic hazards within and outside of the CZU uh, Lightning Complex fire burn area and organized information for communications about the debris flow hazard that resu resulted from the uh, fire damage. Uh, staff were able to complete an accurate damage assessment throughout the burn area, which facilitated opening the area for the return of evacuees and continue to provide information needed for managing recovery and uh, rebuilding within the area. A planning department staff uh, were able to success successfully transition to working remotely through changes and uh, looking at uh, technological uh, uh, information without a loss of services to the public. They created an electronic intake system for discretionary zoning permits, per performed virtual building and code compliance inspections, and held virtual public uh, hearings for the Planning Commission and Zoning Administrator, as well as other public meetings. We want to thank the planning department for all their hard work in helping the community members uh, through a very complicated process during un, uh, under uh, extreme stress uh, going on. Accepting this award on behalf of the planning department is assistant planning director Paya Louvain. I hope I'm pronouncing your name uh, correctly. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. On behalf of the planning department, thank you so much for the recognition today. It's a real pleasure to be part of recognizing the contributions, the very sustained hard work and commitment to service that was shown by the planning department staff this year. All the divisions of the planning department, we work together to quickly move our operations online to keep the services that we formerly gave in person remote and we kept the public in remote public hearings. Our planning commission was among the earliest in the state that was up and running in a remote manner. We were handling everyone's increased need to communicate and we kept normalcy for the part of the community that wasn't directly involved when they really needed it wherever we possibly could. And then came the fire. The planning department staff, um, especially the building inspectors and code compliance, they mounted part of the early response they evaluate and document fire damage right after the event, property by property, and they do it in a way that will really assist the property owners with their insurance processes and with rebuilding going forward. The planning department brought our geologic and engineering expertise to recognize and characterize and help respond to the debris flow hazard, which was and continues to be a threat to health and safety in the aftermath of the fire. Staff that wasn't directly engaged in response work was serving in the local assistance center, um, giving early information to people who were affected by the fire. We brought our specialized skill and a what can we do to help orientation to everything we did this year. The, the, the public service was free flowing and inspiring and it was really a great pleasure, it is a great pleasure to recognize all of the staff that did that and that they're continuing to do this. Um, I'd like to specifically thank the geologic and, and environmental planning team, development review and zoning, the building counter staff and the plan check team, 
code compliance, administration and fiscal staff people, the sustainability group, and code compliance. We're very proud, I'm very proud of the work that we all did this year and um, we're all very grateful for the award. So thank you very, very much on behalf of everyone in the department. Okay, I'm holding up a copy of the resolution. I don't know if you can see it. There you go. Thank you. And we go next up, uh, we have the probation department in response to the uh, CZU lightning complex fires. Staff at the juvenile hall coordinated, uh, coordinated the relocation <coughs> of detained youth to Santa Clara for over two weeks uh, where they were cared for during the evacuation. As a response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the scale of pretrial services significantly, uh, significantly increased to serve an uh, alternative to incarceration, which has been essential to protecting the health and safety of inmates and jail staff. Juvenile and adult divisions shifted to curb, curbside wellness checks focused on meeting the needs of youth and their families by providing assistance with remote learning, school supplies, food and baby items, as well as referrals for rental assistance, food distribution sites, and behavioral health support. In addition, the Student Success Project Team partnered with the Santa Cruz County Office of Education the Pajaro Valley Unified School District, the Community Action Board to ensure students were supported with remote learning throughout the purchase and distribution of Chromebooks and the establishment of a tented resource center where family could get assistance with Google Classroom information resources and children could access tutors and be assessed for other needs, student success project needs. We thank the probation office for, uh, in many ways, uh, for how they stepped up to help our community during a challenging year. Accepting this award will be probation department assistant chief uh, officer, uh, Valerie Thompson. Uh, my, uh, my children uh, received uh, Chromebooks and they're doing homeschooling also. And uh, we appreciate all that you've been able to do. We're looking forward to getting them back into the actual classrooms and we'll see how that turns out. So Valerie, uh, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair and members of the board and CAO Palacios. Thank you for acknowledging the great work and commitment of our probation staff. On behalf of our chief, Fernando Geraldo, and our management team, I wanna thank our staff for, the, for their efforts to support not only each other during the pandemic, social unrest, and CZU fire response, but also for how well they adapted and shifted to safely meet the needs of those we serve and supervise. Our staff maintain meaningful partnerships with county and community partners to provide equitable, comprehensive, and supported services to individuals in contribution to stability, well being, and community safety. As you heard from Supervisor Caput, our probation staff displayed tenacity, creativity, and commitment to excellence throughout the year and during much uncertainty. Yet, they stayed the course, managed work life balance, which included virtual education for their own children and care for their families. We kept our department open and provided much needed support, support services, and supervision services that included providing food, daily necessities, activity kits for families, holiday baskets, and connections to needed services. We are truly proud of our staff's work this past year, and we thank you for today's proclamation. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, next up, we have the Public Works. Uh, the Department of Public Works has 120 staff members and over 10,000 hours uh, they were involved with the CZU fire response 
supporting uh, operations, providing shelter support, and uh, they were part of the rebuild and repair process. Uh, Public Works took a lead role in coordinating coordinating the debris flow preparation efforts, uh, working with Caltrans, Cal Fire, the Planning Department, the Sheriff's Department, the Environmental Health Division, Santa Cruz County Fire, local fire protection districts of the city of Santa Cruz, along with the geographic information services, the Office of Emergency Services, NETCOM, the Regional Water Quality Control Board, and the National Weather Service, and other organizations. Uh, Staff also updated the county's rain gauge monitoring system to add new rain gauges in the burn zone and also created a new dashboard tied to debris flow that would trigger thresholds to help response units anticipate impending emergency. Over the past year, Public Works helped support our infrastructure during a time of uncertainty, and they are helping us to prepare for future events. We owe them a great deal of thanks for this large and actually dangerous undertaking. Accepting this award on behalf of the Public Works Department is the Deputy CAO, Matt Machado. Hi, Matt. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Chairman and Supervisors. I appreciate the recognition today. Uh, I'd like to thank all the men and women in the Department of Public Works for their extraordinary effort and commitment to providing this essential service to our entire community on a daily basis. I'm very proud of the department's direct response and support for the CZU fire and for the leadership role in planning and preparation uh, and monitoring for the debris flows. I also want to thank the Board of Supervisors and the CAO office for their continued support. I thank you for this opportunity to recognize our amazing staff. Thank you, Supervisor Caput, for this opportunity. You're very welcome. Thanks, Val. Uh, lastly, we want to recognize the staff of the Sheriff's Coroner's Office. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, staff in the Sheriff Coroner's Office worked uh, closely with the public health officer. Uh, to educate local businesses and community members about the rapidly evolving nature of all of the uh, health concerns. They also implemented numerous new procedures and systems in both the operations and correction bureau to better protect the community, staff, and the incarcerated population from contracting COVID-19. Staff also responded to many uh, social justice, civil unrest events, which included mutual aid requests from outside the county while still providing robust services to our community. During the CZU Lightning Complex fires, the Sheriff's Office successfully evacuated 70,000 residents from the San Lorenzo Valley and Scotts Valley, and they remained in the impacted area for 38 days to provide security and other services. The Sheriff's Office was a regular presence during present press conferences about the fires and were able to provide the community with up-to-date information during a rapidly evolving uh, numerous uh, emergency. And uh, we thank the staff of the Sheriff Coroner's Office for their commitment to protecting our community during this year of unforeseeable tragic events and accepting this award on behalf of the Sheriff Coroner's Office is Sheriff Jim Hart. Hi, Jim. Uh, we can't hear you.
There you go. Still can't hear you. Okay. Good morning, Supervisor. Can you hear me? Hi. We can hear you now. Hi. Good morning. Well, I I just want to start out by saying that I, I think this presentation is really a, a good way to demonstrate to the community that local government is working for them regardless of the circumstances. In my 33 years with the county, I've never seen a year like this. This year really challenged us, uh, both all uh, the county departments and the sheriff's office with multiple crises occurring at one time. We started out the year with COVID. We went into some civil unrest and we had the tragic killing of Sergeant Gutswiller. And then we had more civil unrest. And then in August, the CCU lightning fires kicked off. That took us through September where we experienced some deep budget cuts and furloughs. And then we went right into debris flow planning. And then oddly in January, we have another event where there's 20 spot fires and more evacuations. And during that time, uh, my staff has remained resilient, committed and dedicated to their jobs and to this community. I think the silver lining with all of this tragedy that occurred in 2020 is that county departments are working more closely together than ever. And our relationships with other agencies like Cal Fire, the Highway Patrol, State Parks, and the local police departments are very strong. And so I, I wanna thank my personnel for all the work that they did in 2020. And I also wanna thank the CAO, the board, and all of the county departments. I think we all banded together and served Santa Cruz County well uh, during uh, a lot of, of really challenging times. So on behalf of the Sheriff's Office and, and my personnel, I wanna thank you for the recognition. And I also wanna thank you for all your support that you guys give us. Very welcome. Thank you. Thank you uh, uh, go ahead, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Um, and thank you to everyone, the well-deserving awards for each department. I'm going to finalize this and I want to note that uh, the scheduled item for firefighter awards is at 1045. We'll do that upon completion of this presentation. Uh, I have the distinct honor uh, for giving uh, this award to the staffs of the Board of Supervisors um, for the past year, both the district staffs and the administrative support staff of the Board of Supervisors has worked tirelessly to communicating with the public to keep them up to date on the ever-changing COVID-19 pandemic and vaccination efforts, the CZU fire, uh, lightning fire complex, and the rebuilding efforts, and, and we also responded to inquiries and concerns about other community issues, which are always consistent. Uh, in an effort to continue to have a presence for their districts in spite of the stay-at-home orders and social distancing requirements, uh, adaptations were made to improve remote access for constituents through video conference town hall meetings and regular talks with community members and neighborhood groups. Staffs of the Board of Supervisors Office also helped to manage the county's response to fire the fires and the collab then collaborated with county, state, and federal agencies, as well as with nonprofits to ensure our community members who had lost so much receive the assistance and support they desperately needed as, and as quickly as possible. We really want to thank the district staffs as well as our administrative team for all they did this past year, working so hard to help each of us uh, as we all tried to support our community through a time of devastating loss. I will be accepting this award on their behalf and giving it to them. And there's usually two to three, you have two positions at each board of supervisors. And you cannot believe the complexity, the differences uh, of, of requests that you get in a regular year, which this certainly was not. Uh, I cannot be more proud of the staffs of, of who we have on the board of supervisors and for their response to each and every constituent that we have in the County of Santa Cruz. Um, you have gone over and above and been in so many meetings, uh, overseeing the coordinated efforts that have been going on. And believe me, as we've just heard from so many departments, this has been a, a, a tremendously uh, important and challenging time as we all know, but what uh, the way we have coordinated the efforts through our staffs and what they have done is just, uh, 
is just overwhelming to me. So I, I wanna thank the staffs of the Board of Supervisors. You are the best. Uh, we certainly couldn't do it without you. And I know that the people of Santa Cruz County who contact our offices day in and day out, week in and week out, are very appreciative of your support and your uh, immediate response as, as possible under some very trying conditions. So thank you to each and every one of the staff members. Uh, we didn't think that we would be able to have each and every one of them make a comment, uh, but I know that they appreciate and they like the work they do and they love doing it for you, people of Santa Cruz and serving you. So thank you to the staffs of the Board of Supervisors. My next uh, presentation is um, to the staff of the County Administrative Officers uh, Department, which has res uh, responded tirelessly to the COVID-19 pandemic and the CZU fi Lightning Fire Complex by putting in countless hours of staffing the Emergency Operations Center and serving as disaster service workers to support a variety of functions that include planning, logistics, shelter and care, uh, and many others uh, issues. Um, in order to protect the health and safety of the community, which is a top priority, the clerk of the board office was able to move to online meetings for the board of supervisors. In the cannabis licensing office, staff were able to increase licenses and maintain effective compliance and enforcement activities despite the logistical challenges of the past year. On the fiscal side, in 2020, staff in the CAO's office managed two budgets at the same time, uh, the one pre-crises uh, and the one after. And we continued to make progress on the county's management act initiatives. And as it stands right now, the county remains on track to complete more than 70% of the 180 objectives in the 2019-21 operation plan. In addition, Staff were able to complete and draft the draft of the three-year strategic framework to address homelessness and manage the smooth transition of homeless services coordination to the new Housing for Health Division. We want to thank the CAO's office for everything it has done to support our community this past year and for continuing to keep the county working toward uh, our future, our, our goals that we have, uh, that we've put in place uh, and accepting this award on behalf of the CAO's office will be uh, our CAO, uh, Carlos Palacios. Uh, Chair Mc McPherson and members of the board on behalf of the County Administrative Office staff, uh, we want to thank you very much for this recognition. Uh, our staff, um, as all other staff in the county, did a tremendous amount of work this year, not only in keeping the regular business of the county going on, but in responding to the emergency as well. Uh, our staff uh, were key members of the Emergency Operations Center uh, and provided 24-hour uh, coverage uh, during the crisis, especially during the fire. Uh, we also supported the EOC uh, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, our staff also helped uh, to set up uh, the COVID shelters and the CZU fire shelters, and our staff actually served as uh, disaster service workers. And a, a number of our staff actually worked in the shelters uh, to staff them. We also helped to serve and to set up the call, county call center for the COVID pandemic. And we did all of this work uh, while we ourselves were impacted by uh, the crisis. Two of our staff members actually lost homes uh, during the CZU fire event. And it's amazing to me that our staff continued to work at a time when they lost their own homes and continued to serve the public during those very difficult days. Our family, our um, staff also suffered from uh, COVID, both as all county staff, both uh, family members getting COVID and also. Uh, family members actually dying of COVID, and yet our staff continued to serve the public during that entire time. So it is with great pride, um, I accept this uh, recognition on behalf of my staff, and I also thank my staff for all the tremendous work they did uh, during this uh, very eventful year. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Palacios. Um, next, uh, we'll address the Human Services Agency, um, or HSD, which has stepped up to lead uh, COVID care and shelter operations for vulnerable people experiencing homelessness, which led to the activation of six hotel operations, two congregate care shelters, sheltering for transition, transition age youth and expanded shelter operations at the Armory. To date, more than 1,300 people have been served by these operations and approximately 250 extra help employees support these shelters. Extra Help Shelf also provided shelter management and logistical support in managing their collection and distribution of donations for fire survivors. Family and, and Children's Services utilized remote meeting platforms to ensure that parents were able to maintain visits with their children and during this past year, Permanency was achieved for 77 children, a remarkable achievement. Meanwhile, the adult and long-term care staff worked tirelessly to ensure older adults, persons with disabilities and veterans who would have care and safe housing as they set up the county shelters, staffed them around the clock, assessed client needs and linked residents to programs such as Project Room Key, FEMA hotel vouchers, home safe and housing assistance programs for veterans. ALT staff led targeted outreach, visited each evacuation site and leveraged technology to ensure critical in-home support services, APS and veteran services continued throughout the crises. Through Great Plates Delivered, which has served more than 215,000 meals to date, they are helping meet the needs of homebound seniors facing food insecurity. During a year in which so many of our community members lost employment due to COVID-19's impact on different industries, the Employment and Benefit Services Division was able to help more than 6,400 individuals receive access to EDD services. This is, these numbers are remarkable. I mean, this is not tens and hundreds, we're talking thousands. It's, remarkable of what they have done. Collaborative administrative teams provided departmental support by ensuring that all planned operations continued and they were able to incorporate new tasks and quickly set up an array of data collection mechanisms to support disaster services. The human services department stepped up to support our community in so many ways last year that we really can't thank them enough for how they helped so many people in such a time of need. Accepting this award on behalf of the Human Services Department is Department Director Randy Morris. Uh, thank you, Chair McPherson and board members. Um, I want to start by echoing the sentiments of, of a number of the departments who said they could not do the work that their department did without the partnership of the whole county family. And everything you just listed and everything I will say briefly was done in partnership with a number of county departments. Uh, I have been here just a year. It has been one heck of a year. <laughs> um, but one thing that I really enjoy is the sense of family and teamwork that is here. So it is my honor to uh, accept this recognition. I, I do want to share we have uh, we are a department of 500 employees. And like many departments, our workforce is compromised due to being on furlough. Uh, throughout this year, at any given moment, 10 to 15 percent of our staff are on approved leave time, supporting their children and their families at home. Uh, we also have deployed almost three dozen of our employees to handle a number of the uh, disaster operation centers. And like many departments, a number of our staff were evacuated. Uh, we managed a triple challenge this year. Uh, you listed Supervisor McPherson in that proclamation that our Child Welfare Division, our Employment and Benefits Division, our Aging and Disability Division, uh, had critical programs to run during this year in COVID, which were complicated enough. Uh, we also, as um, you mentioned in your comments about the CAO's office, we inherited the um, Homeless Services Office, the Housing for Health Office that is now in the Human Services Department, managing the real humanitarian crisis of homelessness that is uh, quite a challenge in our community. And last, I do want to recognize that we are managing four crises still. Uh, we are managing the um, shelter dock that has provided service to the hundreds of people in our community. Uh, though the CZU fires um, are over, we are still managing a human care branch of fire recovery and, of course, debris flow. 
And I just want to end by also recognizing the 250 new employees we've put on board to help deal with those uh, shelter systems with extra help staff and thank all 500 tenured employees and our extra help employees for their resilience, their perseverance, and it is just nothing short of heroic. And it's my honor to be the department director and accept this recognition. Thank you, Chair McPherson. Thank you, Ms. Morris, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, and finally, uh, the Health Services Agency. We wanna recognize the Health Services Agency whose role of the Health Services Agency or HSA in the COVID-19 pandemic response cannot be overemphasized. The Public Health Division led the HSA Department Operations Center for COVID-19 response and implemented the Save Live Actions Plan, whose highlights included mitigating the spread of COVID-19 through intense case investigation, contact tracing, and the development of isolation and quarantine resources for the community. HSC has been committed to providing consistent and accurate information to the public and help to staff the department operations call center alongside employees from the personnel and parks and recreations department. The health services agency has also used an equity lens in all its decision making, including dedicating community outreach resources and activities to the South uh, County and the Latino population who have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And HSA has opened a drive-through vaccination clinics and other vaccination sites throughout Santa Cruz County to serve our most vulnerable populations. HSA Public Health Division provided medical health leadership for CZU Lightning Complex Fires Emergency and public health staff were integral in the medical preparedness efforts for the planning of the debris flow evacuations. The entire Santa Cruz County community, community bears a debt of gratitude for the efforts of the, of the Health Services Agency and for all its tireless work during this challenging year. Uh, I cannot believe the changing messages that it gets, not almost week in, week out, but day in and day out that are ever changing and how you've adapted uh, in the Health Services Agency to serve the Santa Cruz County community to the best of your abilities, and they are very great abilities, is really remarkable. Accepting this award on behalf of the Health Services Agency is Director Mimi Hall. Thank you, Chair McPherson. It's my great privilege to accept this award on behalf of HSA staff. I'm really honored. It's such a wonderful recognition on behalf of, of every staff member and volunteer. I have been in awe of this incredible team and the perseverance and commitment they've shown over the last year. February 28th marks the one year anniversary that we as a health services agency first activated our department operations center in response to a threat to public health. Four days later on March 4th, your board declared a public health emergency due to COVID-19. Sheriff Hart said it really well. Over the last year, we have experienced so much loss and so much change and so much to look forward to as well. But what we have endured together as a nation and even as a county has been unimaginable. And I know that everyone is going to be forever changed. Because HSA as a local health jurisdiction has an integral role in any emergency response, uh, you are correct that our staff has been entrenched in 12 continuous months of an active emergency response to the pandemic, in addition to being activated to respond to wildfires and debris flow, while many of them were personally impacted by these emergencies to which they were responding. I wanted everyone to know, and our staff especially, how much they are recognized for the public servants that they are because even without a pandemic, they provide the vital safety net services to our county residents who have limited resources and limited access to care and services. We have always, pandemic or no pandemic, and we will always serve everybody from the elderly to the very young, from individuals to families and people who have limited or no income, especially during these times. And those experiencing homelessness, and the impacts to the people that we serve 
have not been seen as a burden, but they've been seen by our staff as a call to action. And our staff has acted at every level of the agency to show their commitment to the people of Santa Cruz County. Now, I know that every county department and so many in our community have endured great challenges and our county departments have much to be proud of in showing ability to adapt in order to serve. But I have to say, I'm especially proud of HSA staff. They have been in this continuous state of adaptation and commitment to respond to the needs of our community. And I wanna make sure that each of them know that we recognize collectively their heroism and their sacrifice, but more importantly, we recognize that they are people first before their employees and they have endured personal and family losses just like the rest of our community has faced. Our team has worn multiple hats. Many of them have worked consistent overtime for 12 months straight. Our staff are also parents who have been doing double time as homeschool teachers, caregivers for their older family members. And, and just like many of you, our staff have also experienced loss due to COVID. So I want them to all know that today we all stand together to rec recognize them as people and recognize the challenges that they have overcome to achieve the accomplishments they have over the last year for Santa Cruz County, and that their actions have no doubt saved lives. The only way we can accomplish everything that we have in the last year in this community is it's only one way, together. And we have demonstrated that as a community and a set of county departments. So I wanna also express my deep gratitude to the Board of Supervisors and all of our county departments, all of them, from the CAO's office, GSD, personnel, ISD, auditors, elections, parks, ags, sheriff's office, everyone had to work together with a clarity of vision and purpose. And it's only that collective care and concern that we all showed that um, made our community take precedence over everything else. So today I join you all and I thank you very much in expressing immense pride and gratitude, recognizing the contributions of every single staff member and volunteer that has worked at HSA over the last year to save lives in Santa Cruz County. They truly represent the very, very best in humanity and I'm proud of them all, so thank you. Thank you, Director Hall. Thank you very much. Uh, and that concludes our County Employee Recognition Award Ceremony. Uh, and to summarize, we, we just couldn't have um, envisioned the challenges that we faced in this past year. But with the dedicated staff and what they have done over above and beyond the call of duty, it has been remarkable work. There's no question about it. Uh, time and again, one department uh, had to coordinate efforts with the other, and they did it seamlessly, and they did it very well. And we have been able to get this far, and uh, I think we're going to be going onward and upward from this point forward for sure. And I, I also want to thank so many, uh, this is for our county employees, and I think that the general community needs to recognize how much uh, extra effort people put in to serve so many. And also to you and the community itself. Um, we've heard of people lining up to give food or help others uh, at one place or another. People in the community really stepped up too. And I can't thank you enough for making our uh, efforts in the county as, as uh, convenient as possible, if you will, uh, and the way you responded. Overall, people have been courteous, understanding, and kind. And we need to keep that concept uh, as we have in the county family throughout the uh, all uh, the entire Santa Cruz County community. So thank you for each and every one of the departments. Uh, we are glad that uh, we think this is the proper way to recognize uh, how so many people have done so much to help our neighbors. And uh, we're gonna be going, uh, moving forward 2021. It's gonna be uh, better than this last year. And uh, thank you again for all of your efforts uh, in the county community. And now I'm going to go directly into item number 10. And uh, that's a presentation of the Firefighter of the Year Award for uh, the career 
and the Volunteer Firefighters of the Year. And uh, Cal Fire Chief uh, Ian Larkin will be making an introductory introduction uh, for the recipients of, of this year's um, awards. Uh, Chief Larkin, are you there? There he is, he's coming. Yeah, uh, one second, we have a technical difficulty with our camera. We can see you, go. Oh. All right. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, some technical difficulties this morning. Uh, good morning, Chair McPherson, uh, members of the board, uh, Mr. Palacios, uh, members of the public, and most importantly, our Firefighter of the Year recipients and their families uh, that have joined us here in our Felton uh, training room. It's with uh, great honor that I'm here before you today um, to present to you the 2020 Santa Cruz County uh, Firefighter, um, Volunteer Firefighter and Career Firefighter of the Year. Uh, this recognition is presented to a volunteer and career member of the County Fire Department that is given uh, uh, of themselves beyond the call of duty while providing emergency services uh, to their communities. Um, this year, uh, our recipients of this award um, are Volunteer Firefighter uh, Captain Joe Paquin and Fire Apparatus Engineer Adam Hall, uh, who will uh, come join me uh, up at the podium at the side here. Um, I'll just give some uh, brief statements about each individual, and then I'll turn it back to Chair McPherson. Um, the 2020 Volunteer Firefighter of the Year is Captain Joe Paquin from uh, Company 37 Davenport. Uh, Joe has been a volunteer with the County Fire Department at Davenport for 10 years. Joe has worked his way through the ranks to his current position as captain. He has been resourceful in his efforts to recruit new volunteers for the County Fire Department. Joe demonstrates a lead by example uh, demeanor in all aspects of his duties, which motivates those around him, encourage, prof encourages professionalism, um, growth, and provides exemplary mentorship. He commits countless hours to helping train new and current volunteer firefighters in obtaining required and ongoing training uh, that is mandated to be a volunteer firefighter. Joe has uh, been instrumental in assisting with Volunteer Basic Fire Academy as an assistant instructor. Joe has taken um, uh, a consorted effort to uh, help coordinate uh, facility maintenance and repair at the Davenport Fire Station. And Joe is a trusted and valued member of the County Fire Department and when, requested, when we requested of him, took on additional responsibilities in assisting with the oversight of a neighboring volunteer company in Bonnie Dune, Company 32, on an interim basis to mentor rising new officers within that volunteer company. And he did this with no hesitation. In addition to his commitment uh, to making the County Fire Department a better organization, Joe also works for Cal Fire as a fire captain assigned to our emergency command center uh, here in Felton. Joe has used his knowledge, skills, and abilities to help other firefighters be better prepared in providing services uh, to the community. And he does that all as a volunteer. Our 2020 Career Firefighter of the Year is Fire Apparatus Adam Hall from the Saratoga Summit Fire Station. Adam has served Cal Fire since 2016. <clears throat> and in that time has always been assigned to the County Fire Department service area. Adam came to Cal Fire after serving as a county volunteer for three years with the Company 29 South Skyline Volunteers. Adam has provided exceptional leadership in his assignment, as well as fostering close working relationships with the county volunteers and the local fire agencies, which makes him a unique ambassador for Cal Fire and the County Fire Department. Adam sets high standards for himself. He has a positive attitude. His professionalism resonates with his supervisors and his peers. Adam has become one of the go-to guys. Uh, he is always willing to take on new challenges and he is instrumental in training the county volunteers uh, in their weekly and monthly trainings. Adam is a member of the Santa Cruz County uh, Apparatus and Equipment Standards Committee. And Adam demonstrates a strong work ethic, positive attitude, and a constant willingness to go above and beyond uh, as expected of him, which makes him an integral member of the CAL FIRE team and more importantly, the County Fire Department here in Santa Cruz. 
It is my honor to present to you your 2020 Volunteer Firefighter of the Year, Joe Paquin, and your 2020 Career Firefighter of the Year, Adam Hall. And with that, I would invite uh, Joe to say a few words. Shift the camera just a little so we can see him. That'd be great. Can that be turned? Um, I'm sorry. Yes. We can see you right now. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Now. Hello. Um, I'd like to thank the Board of Supervisors, um, County Fire, and Cal Fire for the award and recognition. Um, it's a great honor and privilege. Uh, I'm really proud to be a part of this organization. Uh, it, County Fire, especially the men and women of the department, really stepped up during the CZ Lightning Complex. A lot of our, our team members in, in Davenport and Bonnie Dune lost their homes and still continue to volunteer um, the hours of, of service and commitment of the men and women of this organization is, is inspiring and it's something I'm very proud to be a part of. So this is a great honor for me and I, I really appreciate it. So thank you. Adam? I'd like to say uh, thank you very much. After such a challenging year for 2020, um, I'm blessed to work alongside some of the best um, in Santa Cruz County the men and women of Santa Cruz County Fire and Cal Fire. Uh, I'm thankful for my support from my family and from everybody uh, in the county, um, all of the volunteers who work alongside, as well as the members of the community. And I'm very honored to be receiving this award. Thank you very much. All right, and on behalf of uh, Chair McPherson, I have uh, two proclamations. Um, this is for uh, Captain Paquin, uh, congratulations. Thank you. And uh, Adam, congratulations. Thank you. And with that, uh, uh, Chair McPherson, I will turn it back to you. Thank you, Chief Larkin. And I wanna thank the two of you, congratulate the two of you, but thank each and every one of you, of your associates. Uh, you've seen the signs all over the county. Thank you, firefighters, public safety officers, and so forth. Uh, again, uh, to use this phrase above and beyond the call of duty and uh, to perform your tasks as professionally as you could have, uh, you and your all, all of your teams. Uh, we can't thank you enough from the bottom of our hearts in Santa Cruz County. So congratulations and thank you. And let's uh, keep, keep this cleaning up and keep us safe. Thank you very much for everything you do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chief Larkin. And uh, we are gonna go directly now into our uh, item number eight. It's uh, a study session on the process and timeline to develop the collective of results and evidence-based investments request for proposal, sometimes referred to as CORE, and direct staff to return on or before August 24th with a report on the proposed on, on the completed process, excuse me, and proposed framework as outlined in the memorandum of the Director of Human Services. Mr. Palacios, is uh, someone going to be, who's going to be presenting, Mr. Morse, are you? Can you hear me all right? I think so. We can hear you, Mr. Chair. I believe that the presentation will be uh, by um, Lisa Benson. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Yes, Randy Morris and Emily Bali will be doing the presentation today. Uh, Mr. Palacios had to step away from his desk for a moment. So yes, oh. I see Randy's now visible. Okay. Good. Yes. Good morning, Chair McPherson and board members. Uh, I think technically we are being shifted back into presenter mode and during that pause that was going on. So um, yes, I'm the human services department director and along with me as Elisa Benchin just mentioned is the deputy director, Emily Bali, but also a third colleague, uh, Nicole Young, who's the owner and principal of Optimal Solutions Consulting. And before we pull the PowerPoint up, I just wanna make a few introductory comments um, and then we'll go through the actual presentation. Um, for over 30 years, uh, well before my tenure, and I believe uh, generations before you all as elected officials, um, the board in this community has asked the human services department to administer general fund money to community-based organizations to help provide critical uh, safety net services to the community. Uh, about five years ago, there was a pretty significant policy shift in the way in which uh, this program was administered. 
And the name of the program was shifted from community programs to what it was called today, as you just uh, introduced Supervisor McPherson to CORE, which is uh, an acronym of Collective of Results and Evidence-Based CORE um, Investments. Because uh, as has been described to me, that transition of three decades of running the program one way to the current trajectory it's on, which was always meant to be incremental in nature, uh, was filled with discussion and debate by your board and a lot of feedback from our community-based providers. I wanna start to tell you what we are not planning to present today to put um, your board and anybody listening to August, as you listed, we have asked for us to be directed return when there will be debate and discussion about some important issues. So today we are not gonna be discussing and do not have any plans to uh, walk through or ask your board to take any action on anything related to the budget. We understand historically, there's been a number of questions about how much money is in this budget, whether or not there are COLAs built into this budget. And just want to recognize during this recession, your board took a previous action of reducing this budget by 10%. So today is not um, a presentation to discuss anything tied to the budget. That will be during budget season and we can revisit um, this uh, in August. Um, the second is, as you will hear in the presentation today formally, um, we are wanting and asking your board to support us coming back in August, at which point your board can make critical decisions based on our recommendations about how to structure the second um, request for proposal or competitive bidding process based on agreements and discussions that occurred that led to the first one five years ago. So I hope that's helpful to just keep um, your board focused on what we're not presenting because this has been um, points of controversy in the past and no, we are gonna walk through how we are gonna walk from here to August when those discussions will occur. So with that said, I will ask the PowerPoint to be pulled up um, and then we'll kind of walk through the formal uh, agenda. And I'm going to pause a minute to see if it gets pulled up. And that would depend upon um, Nicole Young and Emily being pulled up as presenters by, I believe it's the clerk of the board. So I will start in a minute if the PowerPoint's not up yet to not delay too much more. And if I can ask the clerk of the board, do you have Nicole Young and Emily Bali? Yes, both of them have been promoted to panelists. There we go. Okay. So thank you to my colleagues for running this through. So if you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> okay, so what we are gonna formally discuss is I will say a touch more about the background of CORE, which leads to where we are today. I will then turn it over to Nicole Young, who is our consultant colleague who will speak about how uh, CORE is much more than this RFP and a uh, funding model, but actually a movement. And then that will serve as foundation to turn it over to Emily Bali, who will end the presentation with a proposed timeline and process that we, the Human Services Department, want to engage upon with our community-based organization partners between now and August, when we will have some moments to make decisions under your direction about how to release the next RFP. So next slide. Um, so this is, I'm going to share a few things about the um, history of this program. Um, as I mentioned, as described to me for those three decades, uh, the money that your board asked human services to make available to community-based providers was not done through a pro competitive procurement process. So it's often referred to as RFP request for proposal. And the contracts that we had in place as human services department did not include um, results, often referred to as results-based accountability or other phrases. And so back five years ago when the RFP was released and the new awards that exist today were put in place, that was done through the competitive process and there are um, results and outcomes being measured in the current contracts. I also wanna recognize that there was a discussion that played out historically that led to the agreement of our um, jurisdictional partners at the city of Santa Cruz to work with us as the county of Santa Cruz collaboratively. So they took their general fund money as a city um, and partnered with us so that these RFP would done um, in collaboration. And then that way the city and county could issue awards um, through the same process. Um, I next want to recognize that um, there were two actions taken by your board historically that led to the term uh, being extended on two separate occasions. The original awards were um, put in place for a three-year term, and at this point they are in a five-year term, which we'll walk through, which uh, Emily will end the presentation on. Um, I did not have this history, um, so it was important for me to understand uh, what was behind this. The first 
is in December of 2018, when the county administrator's office presented to your board a proposal to move the budget process from a one-year budget to a two-year budget. Um, the CAO's office asked your board and your board approved aligning the term that was three years to four so that the procurement could line up with that um, next cycle of two years. Um, so that was done a good year plus before I got here that the term had already been extended. Um, and then the second extension occurred uh, in May when the COVID impact led to the recession and our community-based organization partners were struggling trying to keep their lights on, losing philanthropic and um, funding donations and a whole host of activities happened that led to us coming to your board and asking for a second extension, just given the chaos and the downward spiral that everybody was in at that moment. So those two actions occurred by your board that lead to this term being five year and we're getting ready to uh, release the RP in ways that we'll describe. Um, and the last item on this history is I wanna recognize that there is a program called Set Aside, which is approximately $150,000 of additional general fund money that had been purposed in different ways. And based on an action of your board in November of 2019, your board made the agreement to integrate that funding stream of set aside to align it with the competitive procurement process. So that dollar amount is also living alongside um, the full RFP that we're gonna be talking about. I do wanna take a minute to recognize that despite there being three decades when there was no competitive process and no ability for community-based providers to apply for these funds, once this door got opened for the RFP, these two extensions have meant that for those providers who do not have an opportunity to apply until this is opened again, though it has benefited the current providers, it has meant those who have been waiting have had to wait um, two extra years with these term extensions. So I do wanna recognize that happened. Um, the next item is you will hear from Nicole Young uh, why this um, effort is much bigger than a request for proposal and the approximately $4 million of general fund money, but it's actually a movement um, under which this RFP process is um, a tentacle of it. And I'll let Nicole cover that. Um, and the last item that I want to share is that this core investment uh, movement and RFP process is all aligned with the county strategic plan and operational plan. And there are actually two human service department operational plan items tied to core. Um, they're actually linked to the acronym of, of CORE, the first being making sure that there was sort of a results uh, menu, which uh, Nicole will speak to. And the second was tied to the E, evidence that there was a library of evidence-based best practices that our um, us as funders and our providers could refer to. And both of those operational plans are actually more than 90% achieved. So we're pleased despite COVID to be able to share that those are in place. And those serve as foundation for us to then move forward to operationalize um, the next iteration of CORE through the next RFP process. So my final statement before turning this over to Nicole Young, our consultant partner, is I do want to bring to the board's attention and those in the community watching that we mentioned this in a board action uh, I believe it was a couple months back where we asked your board to accept $50,000 from a, a philanthropic organization to add to um, Optimal Solutions contract to do their work that we mentioned it, and I think it's worth mentioning because of the recession we are in that the contract that we in HSD have with Optimal Solutions uh, is actually 81% um, federal and state money and philanthropic contributions to the contract. So it's only at 19 cents on the dollar that we're able to um, leverage those other dollars to have the work um, done in partnership with the community that Nicole is going to walk through now. So with that said, I turn it over to Nicole um, and then Emily will close us out and then we're all here for uh, responding to public comment or questions from your board. So thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Randy, and good morning, supervisors. Um, as Randy mentioned, CORE began as a funding model and really over the last few years, it's evolved to reflect its broader potential as a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being for all people across Santa Cruz County and across the lifespan. So when we talk about or refer to CORE as both a funding model and a movement, really we mean that it serves as a framework and provides tools to engage with diverse partners, amplify and align efforts, set shared priorities, co-invest resources, measure results, and increase equity. 
And so we view this funding model and the movement as deeply intertwined where one feeds into the other in a continuous loop. And really this broader definition of core has emerged from our work over the past few years that we're doing on behalf of the county to engage multiple stakeholders in enhancing and expanding the original core investments funding model. Uh, and so together with many people, we've created frameworks and tools that can not only be used in the upcoming core RFP process, but in fact, we're already seeing organizations and other collective impact initiatives start to use these tools in their own strategic planning and program planning, evaluation, grant writing and advocacy efforts. Um, and so my colleague, Nicole Lezen, who works closely with me on this, we're continuing to build capacity to apply the core investments framework within organizations and different collaboratives and across systems. So we're doing that by developing web-based tools, fostering shared leadership, and creating opportunities to build shared knowledge and skills through the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact. So things like the core coffee chats, core conversations, trainings that we hold, uh, forums that we co-host with other, again, countywide initiatives, those are all part of what we consider or fall under the Core Institute. And this is what I mean by the core investments framework. So it's the vision, the mission, the values, and the core conditions for health and well-being. And hopefully you recognize this graphic by now with these eight interconnected and really interdependent core conditions. So think of them as these are the things that every person needs across the lifespan to be healthy, happy, thriving. Uh, they also represent the systems in our community that um, interact with and provide resources and, and services to community members. And so we also want to think of our systems and sectors being uh, interconnected and inter interdependent as well. And when I say equitable health and well-being, we're talking about, you know, reaching a point where um, opportunities and outcomes can't be predicted for better or for worse by things like race, ethnicity, income, gender, immigration status, sexual orientation, or any other aspect of people's social and cultural identities. And then just know that every piece of this framework that you're seeing on the slide um, was developed with, again, extensive input, feedback, and conversation with many people, um, many who represented different organizations, and again, collect collective impact or collaborative initiatives from all different types of sectors. So this isn't work that we own, but really have built a sense of shared ownership over the last few years around these key concepts. And equity has been at the center and really a driving force in the evolution of course since the beginning. Um, and that also came from stakeholder input early on in our process. So I'll give you a quick update about two of the tools that uh, Randy mentioned just a moment ago that we've been working on. Um, and I really think that these tools will be useful to the county and the city of Santa Cruz in their role as funders in this upcoming core RFP process as well as to nonprofits that are applying for funding. <clears throat> so this first tool is what we're calling the core results menu. So you might remember a couple of years ago when uh, I co-presented on, on core and we talked about this concept of an online interactive menu, um, searchable by core conditions where you could connect community level impact statements with community indicators and keep drilling down to the program level. So we are excited to say that we have launched this online interactive tool. We launched it last October. Um, and the very exciting thing about it is that it actually lives within DataShare Santa Cruz County. So it's an existing platform um, that we didn't have to create, but we created kind of the concepts and the structure of this menu. Um, and I do wanna say that you know, the Health Improvement Partnership, which up until recently had been the administrator for data share and Conduit Healthy Communities Institute or HCI that basically runs the, the platform have been fantastic partners um, in this process as we've tried to take this from concept to a reality. So the menu itself is organized by core condition. 
And in each core condition, there are multiple community impact statements, meaning the kinds of results that we want to see in terms of health and well-being at a, a community level, countywide level. And for each of those impact statements, there's a set of community indicators. And then when the actual data is available in data share, it's, it's actually linked to that data. And again, within data share, wherever possible, if there is data that can be broken out by what we call equity dimensions, age, you know, age ethnicity, race, income, gender, um, that data can also be viewed in, in different ways on data share. Um, so we're really uh, excited to be able to have launched this menu. We've conducted some initial training on it um, through Core Coffee Chats. We actually have a couple people that have agreed to be test users for us. So they are um, trying out the menu. They're giving us feedback about how they're using it, what works well about it, what could be improved. And so we really consider this a living tool. Um, and, but we've already received feedback from some of them that the menu provides a helpful way to think about how their specific programs or plans for programs align with and contribute to community level impacts and indicators. Uh, and then they're finding that the sample language that we've created in a certain part of the menu um, that provides suggested language about how to uh, kind of articulate strategies and program outcomes, that they're finding that really helpful in particular. So again, we see these as tools that uh, will not only be helpful to the county and the city as they're preparing and developing that request for proposals, but then also useful for nonprofits as they are applying and preparing their grant proposals. The other tool I'll mention is the Promising Practices database, which is also an existing feature in DataShare. So this is a comprehensive searchable database of programs, practices, and policies that have been categorized as either evidence-based, so meaning they have the kind of typical rigorous research studies backing them up, um, or they've been categorized as effective, meaning that there are strong outcome evaluations demonstrating that they're effective at um, producing certain outcomes, or they're categorized as a good idea, meaning there's maybe limited evaluation data or it's more descriptive data, usually because the program is new or there just haven't been the resources to do a, a really thorough evaluation. But as the name implies, there's something about the program or practice that makes it a good idea. And so the Promising Practices database in DataShare has a very similar function that many other online clearinghouses of evidence-based programs and practices serve, or EBPs. Um, and, but the advantage here is that instead of someone having to go and one, know where to find all those clearinghouses and then you know, search multiple clearinghouses to see if something exists, this is all housed in one database and we have the ability to add programs and practices if they're not already in the database. So you can see that blue arrow. Um, and that's in fact what we're doing right now, working on compiling several different batches of program and practices to submit to the research team at Healthy Conduit Institute. They have their own criteria about how they categorize things. So they do kind of the heavy lifting in terms of deciding uh, whether and, and where to place something in this database. Uh, but the nice thing is that there's also an option if, if there's a program or practice that doesn't somehow meet that threshold of even a good idea, we still have the option to request that it be added as a local program or practice. So that means that um, even if something doesn't appear or can't be found in another online clearinghouse, we can basically create our own, that's what we mean by local library, that we can kind of add to and customize what shows up in the Promising Practices database for us. So that's what we're doing right now. We are both looking for um, e you know, EBPs, Promises, promising practices in other clearinghouses that don't yet exist in data share. And we're building a list of and gathering the information about programs and practices that core contractors have said that they are implementing. But again, those don't yet exist in the promising practices database. We're feeding all of that to HCI. And at this point, we're still waiting to see how they handle our first couple of batches of submissions. But you know, I, I want to say it's a kind of a slow methodical process, but much more efficient than us trying to create our own clearinghouse or libraries, as we've been calling it, 
Um, and so we plan to continue working with HCI um, to, to get as many of these additional programs and practices in their database, categorized at any level, evidence-based, effective, good idea, or local program. And so again, we think this will be very beneficial, not only to the county and city as they're preparing the RFP, but thinking about the nonprofits as they apply for grants, that the burden of finding you know, evidence-based best practices, you know, trying to verify the credibility of the data and evidence behind them while they're preparing a grant proposal, <laughs> that that burden doesn't fall on them during the application process. So we are working really hard to get these tools as functional and, and comprehensive as possible before the RFP is released. And so at that, I will, I will turn it over to Emily, who's going to share more about how these will be used and what the actual process will look like over the next few months. Thank you, Nicole, and good morning, board. Over the next six months, HSD staff will examine the many lessons learned from the last RFP process evaluation and determine how to incorporate those lessons into the next RFP framework. We will also be collaborating with stakeholders, including the city of Santa Cruz to align our goals for the RFP. Additionally, Nicole and her team will continue the work they've been doing to help people across the county learn about the suite of connected tools and practice applying them to various uses, including but not limited to funding proposals. In August, we will return to your board to present a draft framework for the core RFP. After incorporating your feedback, we plan to release the RFP in the fall. As in the past, we will provide opportunities for individual and group technical assistance to answer questions from applicants and connect them to existing tools and resources like the core results menu, data share indicators, and promising practices database. Next slide, thank you. Proposals will be due in the winter and will be reviewed in the spring. Later in the spring, we'll return to your board with award recommendations for approval and agreements will begin in July of 2022. As Nicole mentioned earlier, we are weaving together the core funding model and movement with the goal of moving together toward the shared aspiration of more equitable health and well being across the county, across the lifespan, and across the core conditions. And this concludes our presentation at this point, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you for that presentation. Uh, I'd like to just praise the work of uh, the, both the county staff and our nonprofit partners uh, who provide the services under the core contracts. Um, it's been a great cooperative effort. I think that the core approach to funding uh, community programs, as it came forward several years ago it, with the full, uh, support of the board. Uh, we recognize the need to align these uh, services with the county's strategic uh, uh, objectives that we've developed. And we also recognize the need to raise the bar for effective outcomes serving the most vulnerable in our community. I, I do believe this approach has substantially worked well, and I look forward to the next round of proposals for these services. Um, I think we are going to have a more deficient, a more efficient delivery of healthcare and human services uh, under these this uh, uh, core uh, proposal uh, than we have in the past, and it, it's moved forward very well. Um, are there any other questions that the board might have, members of the board? Chair, I'll I'll just jump in if that's okay. Sure, please do. I, I, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So um, first, let me say, when we looked at reforming community programs funding uh, about a decade ago at the city and then at the county, um, I don't think we envisioned such a uh, robust and thoughtful process. And I want to appreciate <clears throat> all the people who took the sort of desire by the board uh, and have run with it to create such an integrated, uh, thoughtful process. Um, and uh, I, I also want to say, you know, we just went through a long um, uh, recognition of county departments who have been working under very difficult circumstances. And our community programs have been doing uh, similar work under very difficult circumstances and really excellent work serving the needs of our community. 
Um, I think I think we all wish we had more money to allocate them to them so that they could uh, they could in, in, only increase their impact. Um, but uh, but I appreciate the framework uh, and the analysis that you all are doing. Uh, my only brief question is, what's your plan to engage with the city of Santa Cruz and the other cities, frankly, in the county uh, to see if we can all align our community programs funding to, to meet shared needs? Am I coming through in response, Supervisor Coonerty? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I do want to first and foremost recognize the city of Santa Cruz and lock and step with us. We actually, um, given the board agenda, made a decision in collaboration with them that they were fine with not co-presenting with us, but we are working with the city staff, and so we are in active conversation with them. The other three cities predate me, um, but we do have plans to engage them to see if, as I understand was asked during the last round when the city of Santa Cruz agreed to see if there is any interest, which is, of course, their jurisdictional decision to align. Um, so both Santa Cruz is active and conversations with the other cities will happen between now and August. Great, and are you gonna do a study session or something similar with the city council? You know that's planned? I don't think we have that planned. We will take any direction or advice from your board and, and when we consult with the cities, we'll follow the lead with the city of Santa Cruz staff um, to see how we lift that up. I understand that did happen with the city of Santa Cruz before. So I would imagine they would ask the same. Yeah, I won't. I won't give direction because it's obviously up to them. But I think it. I think it would be helpful to bring not only city staff but the the elected leaders of Santa Cruz, uh, you know, to make sure that they're understanding this process and and where the opportunities for collaborations and focus on outcomes is. So um, I'd encourage it if they're if they're open to it. I'd encourage us to to make that offer. Um, and similarly for the other elected bodies um, around the uh, uh, around the county, and in fact, as I think about it, you know, some of the maybe perhaps uh, the other funders who I know um, are involved, but making sure that we're getting out to their boards of the community foundation or um, uh, the other institutions in town to make sure that the boards are aware and that we're you know we're building a bigger a bigger army uh, who's moving forward collectively to address the many, many needs. But uh, thank you for all the good work. And, um, and I look forward to, uh, to hearing more as, as we get uh, closer to the summer. Any other comments from board members? There? Yes, Mr. Koenig. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I want to thank the uh, Human Services Department for this great presentation. Um, you know, I certainly understand how we arrived where we are today uh, and some of the challenges with the past way that we allocated some of these funds. Um, you know, my concern with looking at the presentation today is just how intensive the process has become of creating these metrics. And my understanding is that we're looking to allocate roughly $4 million. I grant that, that could change, but based on, on past allocations, we're looking at about $4 million. Is that correct? Um, yes. It after the 10% cut, it's just about 4 million, depending on budget process, it will or won't incrementally move up again, but that's that's approximately correct. Right. And how many, how much staff time do we anticipate uh, will go into creating this framework for allocating those funds? Oh, that, I, I'd have to calculate really quick, but yes, it's a, I think your point is it is a body of administrative work. Um, and I don't know if this is also where you're going, but it's a body of administrative work for us as staff to make sure we bring forward a framework that hopefully your board can support. And it's a body of work for community providers to put the time and energy into applying, which is always the conundrum <laughs> of uh, competitively awarding contracts. So yes, I, I don't have the answer and we can get back to you with the calculation if you'd like, but it, it, it will be um, work of our contracts often and us as department leaders to sort of work it through with the community between now and August. Right, yeah, you uh, correctly divine my, my point there. You know, we're, we're spending $50,000 uh, on a consultant. I understand that's not all county general funds, but nine, you know, nine and a half thousand dollars. Um, and additionally, of course, uh, your valuable staff's time on this, on this project um, and you know, just to point out the promising practices are. There's, if, if I'm looking at this website correctly, there's 234 pages of them. So that's a, a lot of information for anyone to either collect or sift through. Um, and I really think you know the more 
the more complex the, the, the framework becomes, the harder it becomes, the more time it consumes both for staff as well as for these organizations who are trying to compete for these dollars. So, you know, I would really encourage us to create a framework that uh, sort of does what it says on the tin. It is, you know, extremely straightforward. We have a very clear idea of whether or not people, you know, are meeting the goals they set out to. Um, and, you know, what we're communicating to organizations to do uh, is clear. And, and the longer the list of, of metrics or requirements becomes, the more difficult and time consuming it becomes to do that. Um, I'll, I'll just, uh, hoping I'm on point with what you're bringing up, I, I think it's worth reminding the community or maybe letting the community know and, and putting in perspective to the board as a department whose 90% of its budget is federal and state money and therefore the regulations that govern what we do are not in your jurisdiction. This is the one program that's 100% in your jurisdiction as the board of Santa Cruz County. So we completely take your lead on uh, trying to find that sweet spot and that middle ground of going from no competitive procurement with no clear rules and no outcomes to trying to create a framework that I think I'm hearing from you is digestible and understandable, but I would extrapolate not so simple that you end up with the wild west of saying, you know, because we will have way more applications for way more money than the 4 million, even if your board finds a way to increase it. So it's trying to find that sweet spot so that your board doesn't get put in a position of arbitrating when we go through the process, have panels, and then we come back to you with recommended awards that you can have confidence that we found that balance so that the process had the right integrity. This being a local process, we don't have the feds and state telling us how to do it. I think our job as staff is to come back to you in August with a framework that strikes that balance and your points are heard. Great, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, any other comments from supervisors? Yes, Mr. Mr. Chair, I have a brief one, or actually it's a questions from Mr. Morris. Now, thank you, Mr. Morris, for the presentation. Thank you, Ms. Young, as always, for your presentation. Um, my questions uh, deal a little bit with the set aside uh, funding. You know, the board, uh, as you well, it predates you, but the history of this was, and a little bit to Supervisor Koenig's point, we had a pretty complex process for the larger funding. So we tried to have a simpler process for uh, the set aside for new and emerging programs, but also for smaller programs. Do you feel that that smaller set aside is actually meeting those goals of, of addressing these smaller programs? Oh, I'm going to talking to an elected official. I'm going to probably sound like one in my answer. And I'm going to lean on Emily a little bit, who has some history. I, I would say, first and foremost, I wouldn't want to speak for those smaller programs because I'm in a very different position as a funder and particularly a new one year new uh, county employee. Um, what I understand was to have $150,000 to sort of purpose to fill a few small holes for some smaller organizations had real merit. But I think ultimately the question, if, if I'm hearing you right, Supervisor Friend, is those got coupled by a board action. I'm looking at my notes, it was back in November of 2019 to merge it all together before they were decoupled. So I'll, I'll ask Emily if she can come in. I think I hear your question is, are they filling those holes? Are they meeting those needs with the, the humility that I think the community-based providers who get that money would be differently and well positioned to answer how they feel it's working. I know for us, um, you know, it's a lot of workload to go through a procurement process for $150,000, mindful of what Supervisor Koenig just said. So there is a um, there is something very efficient about having them bundled together, but ultimately will follow your direction. So Emily, would you could you share more to see if I didn't quite respond to Supervisor Friend's question? No, I think you did, and I think the intent of the set aside was also to provide a more uh, lesser cumbersome um, process for those smaller agencies that may not have the administrative support to, to go through the entire, the larger RFP. And I, our intent is to at least to do the same, to, that they will have access to those funds to for one time and um, some emerging needs. So Supervisor Friend, could I just ask, would it be helpful if when we come back in August, we delineate the process for set aside funding um, as part of a presentation in August. Would that get at your point? Well, I, I think to Ms. Bali's point, I just want to reiterate what the board's purpose of creating it in the first place was. And it wasn't for, say, 
COLA applications for existing programs, right? And so what, what I think we need to do is be very specific. It shouldn't be a large processing on your side if we've simplified, simplified the application and expectations of the applicants. So the idea of the set aside wasn't to be hard for you and it wasn't to be hard for them. It was for, as Ms. Bali had noted, small programs, 15,000 in funding, for example, that didn't have the capacity or the potential for a new and emerging need we have a pandemic, maybe there's an add-on component to something. Uh, the funding was designed to be flexible by design. I just wanted to be sure that that's what it was. If you're getting inundated, for example, uh, with a lot of applications for requests that maybe are outside of what the board had sought, then maybe there should be greater clarity in the application process, or if you need greater direction from the board as to what we wanted that funding to be for. Uh, because I want to I don't want you to be getting 500 applications of with 450 for, I'm just making this up, but 450 are, you know, COLA requests when, when the whole point of this was you had $5,000 programs, $12,000 programs, $15,000 programs that for 30 years weren't allowed to participate in this process. And we wanted to come up with a way that they could do it and not have to meet the greater metric argument that um, the larger programs do. So. So to your point, should you come back and I mean, I don't really need the framework. I'm trying to ask your help and whether we need to provide greater clarity on what it's for or whether you feel so that it can be narrowed to be a more effective and sort of easy program for both you to administer and others to apply for. Emily, I'm gonna to turn to you again. I, I now think I hear the more focused question from Supervisor Friend, if we feel like we understand or we need to get ask the board for more direction. Uh, I, I think we we understand the board's direction, and I think when we provide the framework, um, that's another opportunity when we incorporate the set aside for for feedback from the board. Okay, and and I'll I'll uh, speak a little bit to the point that my colleague made, Supervisor Koenig, on the metrics, and and this has been. Um, I mean, we were we were really redesigning an entire program that had been entrenched for quite some time. So we went from, um, I mean, some would argue there were metrics in the previous programs, but really it was, for example, number of meals served, but it didn't actually talk about whether there had been changes to the underlying conditions of the individual that was seeking the services. And those were in, in many respects, not helpful metrics. One of the challenges I find with having sort of a simplified program, although it's a good ideal, is that these programs are so fundamentally different and cross so many different sectors of the county's um, strategic plan. I mean, they crosswalked all kinds of different worlds that we're interested in. It's really hard to standardize a system that shows across the board metrics. Um, for example, uh, very different from like a road situation where we can standardize number of miles paved is actually a very interesting metric versus number of meals served doesn't talk about how many people have left poverty as a result of the program, which is what this is about, is about cycle breaking. So I'm all for um, a system. And by the way, the, the providers have expressed concern over what they believe to be um, you know, a uh, onerous system of application, and understandably so, because it, it, it's much different from it was, you know, a decade ago. And if there's a balance to be made, I'm all for a balance. But I think that I was just trying to present why I think it's more complex than simply just uh, refining the system. I mean, it really is. I mean, a Meals on Wheels is fundamentally different from um, something the Diversity Center does, which is fundamentally different from what LiftLine does, which is fundamentally different. And so these these services are so different and what we seek out of them are so different that it might be hard from a metric basis uh, to standardize that. But, but if there's a way to do it that I'm, I'm missing, I'm all for it, but I wanted uh, county staff to know that I, that, I, that I completely understand why it appears the way it does. I mean, we're trying to meet a lot of varied goals that different programs do, and I just appreciate the transparency um, and the effectiveness now that that's outlined that wasn't done historically. So for me, just moving forward, that my my interest is really also in that set aside and ensuring that 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 it's not it's not harder for you than it should be for 150,000. I mean, this isn't this was meant to be easy for everybody all around. I mean, I didn't need a, a 50 page thing on each each deal, and I also wanted to make sure that people weren't trying to apply. Um, just maybe because they didn't know what the board's goal was, use the application process to meet other needs than what the, the, the board was doing, which made your life harder on that. So that was all. Thank you all for your presentation. Thank you. Um, any other questions from board members? 
Yeah, uh, if it's all right. Sure, go ahead, supervisor. Yeah, I, I, let me put my hand down. And put the, uh, sure. You're good, go uh, ahead. There we go. Yeah, I want to uh, thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, Randy and uh, Nicole and Emily. Uh, when we first uh, were dealing with CORE in the beginning, uh, the concern I had was, uh, like uh, Supervisor Friend uh, was uh, actually asking about, is that we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't uh, prevent small groups from getting some money to help projects that are very dear to the community of, uh, you know, each district that we represent. Uh, I don't know, uh, you know, some of the programs that are very vital, the small programs that are very vital to Santa Cruz, Felton, Scotts Valley, Davenport, Aptos, uh, but I do know uh, South County, and uh, I, I think you've done a wonderful job in getting the input of, the, of each supervisor from each district that knows their district better than uh, than others that don't represent that area. Uh, so that concern is not something that I have now because I've worked with you and I see that you are open to the idea that South County is different than Davenport or some of the other areas. Um, and I, I uh, you answered a lot of questions, Supervisor Friend, actually asked what I was going to ask, and I think you answered them. I don't want to see the small programs get buried under paperwork, especially during the COVID uh, uh, crisis we have going on now, because they don't have a big staff. They're not good at writing term papers and presenting them to CORE in order to get money. I don't want it to be, uh, become like a, a uh, competition where who writes the best uh, paper. I want to get actual input on what we see as representatives of our community, that the money is being used well. And Meals on Wheels is a great example. I believe a lot of the money they get, we give to uh, the Community Action Board. Uh, they're under that umbrella, am I correct? If any of you can answer that. Meals, Meals on Wheels is under Community Bridges. Community Bridges, okay. So we're watching to make sure Meals on Wheels is taken care of both in South County and Mid and North County. I yeah, it, it's a question. Was it's an open-ended question? question. Yeah, it's open-ended question. Um, uh, Meals on Wheels for the entire county, North, South, uh, mid county, uh, they're all under community bridges. Yes, and they are currently funded under the existing core programs. Okay, I just don't want them uh, to get uh, you know uh, left behind because I've seen, especially during COVID, how important it is for people that cannot get out and uh, to have a meal actually delivered to them. And that uh, actually also that personal contact, uh, other than the post office. I think you're frozen. Okay, I think, I think Mr. or Supervisor Cap had completed his remarks. Um, I'm not sure what's happened there, what the hang up is. Uh, I think each supervisor has uh, asked a question. Um, is there, are there any uh, comments from the public? Yes, Chair, I have one speaker. Go ahead. User five, your microphone is unmuted. You have two minutes to speak and the timer will begin as soon as you begin speaking. Uh, hello, this is Marilyn Garrett. I'm a retired teacher. I was listening to your presentation. In the future, I think it would be helpful to spell out the acronyms and what they stand for. But it seems to me we're talking about 
uh, I agree with Supervisor Koenig. Uh, this seems like a questionable use of money, and isn't the county facing bankruptcy like many counties during this COVID crisis uh, policy that is putting more people in poverty? Supervisor uh, Friend, you asked, you know, how many people have left poverty? Um, more and more have fallen into poverty by these policies. So it seems to me not, you know, in touch with the real, real problems are hunger, housing, unemployment, and policies that are increasing that. I heard that 84% of the so-called COVID relief money has actually gone to corporations and banks, and there's been a huge shift of money upward to the corporations and CEOs of Google, Facebook, Amazon, etc. So I feel like this is totally inadequate funding for the needs that are increasing by the policies the county is adopting to make the situation more. I'm not sure what happened to Ms. Garrett's uh, audio, but I think she made her point. Um, is there any other uh, comments from the public? There are no other speakers from the public chair. Okay. Um, we'll turn it to the board then. Um, this is a study session, so I don't think any really. Uh, we'll wait for your August report. We thank you for this. And I think the evidence based best practices uh, criteria that you're using uh, is showing some real dividends for the people of Santa Cruz County. So thank you uh, for this report. And uh, we'll look forward to. You're uh, coming back on this on in August. Thank you very much. Thank I, you. Uh, it, it's Pardon new, me, Chair. Yes. There is a vote on this item to direct staff to return. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was it was read into that. Okay. Um, we we'll have a motion for direct staff. Thank you very much to return uh, on or before August 24th. So moved, Coonerty. Coonerty was second. moved. Second by uh, I think it was Caput. Not sure. Also. Okay. Um, please call the roll. Thank, Thank you, you, Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, it is just about noon, and I we have one more item on the regular agenda before we go into closed session, and we have a scheduled 130 item. I would like to just go ahead. I don't think that item number nine should take more than 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, so I, I would like to move forward with that. Uh, we will then take a uh, go into our closed session, uh, probably about 12.30. Uh, it may be that that scheduled 130 item could be at 145 or something, but I'm not sure. Uh, but let's, not, let's go ahead and move on to item number nine. Consider authorizing county participation in state rental assistance program or RAP, R-A-P, except 8.123 million in federal ERA rev grant revenue, adopt resolution authorizing the county administrative officer to sign a state agreement and related documents to secure $8.742 million through the state RAP, authorize the planning department to administer local uh, section of ERA administrative funds, and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the planning director. That is the BCSH letter to jurisdictions, January 28, 2021. And it was Senate Bill, uh, State Senate Bill 91. Expression of intent for the, the state RAP or the rental assistance program, uh, federal ERA program. Conforming local re rental assistance program, February 3rd, 2021, a, re a resolution authorizing the participation and Senate Bill 91 stakeholder meeting presentation. Um, we will go ahead with this item. Let's see. 
Is there a presentation? Yes, uh, good afternoon, Chair McPherson. This is Suzanne Issey with the uh, Planning Department, Housing Division. And I'll be giving a brief presentation if I could ask uh, the clerk of the board to uh, show the PowerPoint, please. Pardon me, Mrs. Seaton. It is on the departments to share their presentations. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, uh, can everybody see the slide presentation? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so some of you may recall uh, last year we uh, implemented a rental assistance program related to the COVID pandemic through the CARES Act federal fund. Um, we used a portion of the CARES Act funds that the county received to provide that program. Uh, in late December, uh, Congress created a new uh, uh, funding uh, program for a similar program at the national level. Um, and that was through the uh, Federal Appropriations Act of 2021. So that uh, appropriation provided $25 billion for this rental assistance program nationally. So it is similar to the type of program we had in 2020 through the CARES Act, but it is now a little more defined both at the national level and also at the state level. Um, and it has a specific funding stream associated with it at the in the federal budget. So that federal appropriation essentially split the funds into two different pots. One pot of funds went to the states directly, and then each state is responsible for determining how best to distribute those funds throughout their state. Um, and then the second pot went to cities and counties that had populations of 200,000 or more. Um, Santa Cruz County, when we include the population of our four cities, meets that threshold. And so we received a grant of slightly over 8.1 million directly from the federal treasury. Um, in addition, we were notified in um, January by the state of California that we were eligible for an allocation of nearly 8.8 .8 million through that pot of funds that went directly to the state. And I'll be going into a little bit more detail about that state distribution. Um, so the state essentially uh, several weeks ago um, uh, informed us of the results of the Senate Bill 91, which was passed in Sacramento at the state level to do several things, one of which was to extend tenant protections for tenants and landlords that had been provided last year through AB 3088. Um, and then it also provided a little bit more uh, guidance and specificity for the state's um, use of the funds that it got through this federal rental assistance program. And so it um, created a system for distributing the money um, statewide, as well as some pro guidelines to be implemented by uh, both the state and any local governments that would be getting these funds. Um, so uh, a couple of key parameters about the program, uh, both the federal legislation as well as the state guidance um, makes households eligible if they are uh, low income, according to this definition, which is um, if their income is 80% or less of the area median income. However, it does prioritize households that are very low income, which means their income is at 50% or less of area income, area median income. Um, the uh, program funds themselves can be used, 90% of the program funds must be used for rental assistance, which can include rent and uh, utilities arrears. Um, as well as uh, a certain amount of uh, prospective rental assistance for a limited time. 
Overall, uh, Santa Cruz County is eligible for a total of 16, uh, nearly $16.9 million of this type of funding when both our um, direct grant from the Treasury as well as um, the state funds that we're eligible for are combined. So the state informed us that um, we had essentially three options with respect to the funding that the state received that um, can't, the county is eligible for a portion of those funds. Um, so they provided us options A, B, and C. Option A is that we join with the state in um, a statewide platform that will be available for all participating jurisdictions, as well as a number of smaller counties um, that did not meet that 200,000 population threshold. Um, this option would mean that we would essentially commit the local grant that we got into the pot that will be um, administered at the statewide level. However, all funds that are designated for our county will be reserved specifically for our county's eligible households. Um, in doing this, we essentially save on all of the overhead costs, the costs of procuring um, sophisticated software that would be needed both to uh, accept applications as well as do all the back end accounting and audit trails and, and fraud prevention on all these other um, requirements of the program. Um, uh, and instead, we can focus at the local level on getting the message out to our local communities and helping folks um, apply and get through the process of applying. So the program design that was set up through the state actually requires um, the state to contract with what they call local partners within each participating county. That means local community-based organizations that will be um, brought on board uh, by the state to ensure that there are actual uh, locations within the county where people can get in-person assistance if needed to apply. For instance, if people do not have smartphones or good internet or cell phone connections to be able to do the online process, there will be um, facilities locally where they can submit those applications on paper or however they need to do it, and also to ensure that we have local entities that can really do outreach and ensure that those least likely to apply will become informed about the program. The program design includes provisions for language access in multiple languages. They've built into the system uh, capabilities for uh, communications in 18 languages, but in addition, uh, if we have any languages at the local county level which are not among those 18 languages, we can have those accommodated as well. And so there'll be a process for our local CBOs and other stakeholders to communicate with this statewide um, uh, contractor to make sure that our language needs are met. Um, the state has um, provided this website that is, it, it has actually been operational since last year with information on, on the prior uh, programs for uh, renters and landlords that are impacted by COVID-19. There's a shortcut URL, it's housingiskey.com. If you type that in, it brings you to a specific page on the Department of Real Estate's website. Um, it also has a, a calculator so people could type in their income and their household size and figure out what income level they are. And it has a, a language line to provide phone assistance in multiple languages. This is a snapshot of what that website looks like. There we go. Oops, I'm sorry. Whoops. So um, 
Like I mentioned, there were three options provided to us. Um, option A was that we join with the state and that will make us eligible for uh, this extra 8.8 .8 million in, um, in state funds, um, as well as uh, including our local grant with, with the pot for our county. The second option was option B, which was that we would request that the state provide us with the block grant of the 8.8 .8 million, and we would be responsible for administering the entire program for our county locally. Um, however, in order to be eligible for that option, we would have had to have a program already running and operational by early February that met all of the requirements in SB 91. Now, the SB 91 requirements uh, have a long list of both programmatic and also technical uh, criteria that the program has to meet, in, including things like robust fraud prevention mechanisms within the software, the ability to deliver payments um, at a large scale, these you know large number of households, the ability to have a website that won't crash even if it has you know, 20,000 active users at the same time, just a whole laundry list of uh, technical and programmatic criteria. And we we do not actually have any rental assistance program that even comes close to meeting that kind of uh, scale or sophistication um, at this time. So option B was really not uh, something that, that we could have pursued. In addition, if we had pursued option B, uh, the state would have had to review our program and determine that it does in fact meet all of those criteria and performance uh, criteria set out in SB 91. And if they determined that it did not, then they would reject our, our request for that block grant. Option C was that we could administer our, our 8.1 million federal funds locally through a rental assistance program. And then the state would administer their statewide program and also offer that program to residents of this county. So essentially any interested residents would be trying to figure out which of the two programs they should apply to. They would be getting different you know, outreach messages, uh, different uh, application platforms. It would just create a lot of confusion. And more importantly, it would set uh, both of the agencies up for a, a high risk of what is called duplication of benefits, which is not allowed with federal funds, which means that there's the potential for, for example, to let's say a family wanted to apply for rental assistance and they applied to both programs at the same time and received assistance for the same months of rent or the same arrearages through bro both programs, then you know, when the federal treasury is doing this, they would create findings against both us and the state um, for, for allowing that duration of benefits to happen. So we felt like that was not um, a risk that we could recommend that the board take. Um, the state also provided that any jurisdictions going with option C, those jurisdictions would assume all liability for that risk of duplication of benefits. And we felt like that's just, you know, a risk we can't really take. So um, we are recommending that the county pursue option A. In order to go with that option, uh, we uh, would need the board to adopt the resolution that is attached to this, uh, this item today for your consideration. Um, and let me just uh, go back a slide. So uh, prior to uh, writing up this item, staff met with the staff of all four cities in the county, the housing authority. We had multiple uh, meetings with COPA and also uh, communications with a representative of all the water districts in the county who had reached out to us because they're concerned about water bill arrearages. We also discussed and reached out with um, various service providers, nonprofits in the county that do uh, provide these types of rental assistance programs, and you know other other stakeholders that contacted to us contacted us about this program. Um, all four cities, the housing authority, and the water district, after learning all the details about SB ninety one and about the program, 
both at the federal and state level, agreed that option A made the most sense. In addition, after talking with COPA and the service providers, and after they reviewed all the detailed information that was available from the state, they also agreed with option. Um, so we feel uh, very confident that this is the right path with respect to this program. Um, by per participating in option A, the state has informed us that we are eligible to participate, participate in a statewide advisory body that they are setting up so that all the participating jurisdictions can give input to the program's uh, contracted statewide uh, vendor. That is LISC, which is the Local Initiative Support Corporation, which is a CDFI or Community Development Financial Institution. They were selected by the state after an outreach or an RFP process for this purpose. Um, and so the um, state has indicated that the first meeting of that advisory uh, board will be this Thursday at 1 p.m. And initially, at least um, uh, staff, myself and Melody Serino in the CAO's office have been um, designated to be representatives on that advisory body at the board's discretion. Um, let's see, and the program is scheduled to launch. This is one of the criteria that was noted specifically in SB 91, that whoever is going to roll out this program, uh, it has to launch on March 15th, no later than March 15th. That was another significant reason why we felt that it was um, beneficial for the county to go with option A because we did not feel that if we went with one of the other options that we would have the ability to roll out the program that fast and that of course it is of benefit to all the people who would want to seek this assistance to be able to obtain it sooner rather than later. So the recommendations are on the slide before you and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. I have a couple of questions. Um, the way I understand the program is that any rent in arrears has to be dealt with before the tenant is eligible to get support for future rent. Um, how does that clear uh, clearing up the unpaid rent affect whether they're eligible for 12 months of support? Um, would they be eligible for a shorter period in the future then? Yes, my understanding of the program design is that it does prioritize arrearages first. And the reason for that is they want, the ultimate goal is to prevent eviction. Um, and so part of the program design, when um, the legislature was debating SB 91, they had a, a goal with this funds of maximizing the number of households that could be stabilized. And so they came up with, um, a requirement that essentially, uh, in order to accept this assistance, participating landlords would agree to accept 80% of the rent arrearages for a given tenant as payment in full. And essentially what that means is, is this program will have a savings of 20% across any um, households that are assisted and stabilized. And that way they'll be able to make the funds go that much further and assist more households. So by accepting that 80% um, payment, um, the funds can go further. And then there's a certain um, time period for which arrears can be paid. It is April of 2020 through March of 2021. And um, depending on certain other factors specific to the household, um, the client can also obtain forward-looking rental assistance for, I believe it's up to three months. So it's not necessarily that somebody's gonna get a 12-month forward-looking assistance. The priority is really on the arrears so right. that the landlord would not be able to go and evict that tenant. Okay, and can landlords change the amount of rent charged during the period of their uh their tenant is drawing support. Um, how will the leases that include a scheduled uh, rent increases impact the amount of funding available for two tenants? Can, can they go back 
and, and increase their, their rent? Um, I don't think they can do it retroactively. So if they had a lease in a agreement in effect for the period in which the arrears occurred, whatever the rent was in effect at that time is what the program administrator would use to determine, you know, the amount of the arrears. Now, nothing is to say that they they can't, you know, increase their rent going forward, but, you know, the priority is on the arrearages. So I think in most cases, um, it wouldn't be possible for them to say, okay, I'm going to implement a rent increase now for last year. I, I don't think tenant landlord law would allow for that either. Right. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the board? Uh, I don't see any. I believe Supervisor Caput has Excuse a question. Me. I got my hand up. There you go. Uh, thanks, Chairman uh, McPherson. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Captain. Uh, thank you. Yeah, you know, uh, with the state, I guess option A, uh, you know more uh, about this than I do, but it's uh, very complicated even with option A. We've got, uh, are we going to be ready when the money comes in to make sure that the money goes where it's supposed to go? And what I'm talking about is the small landlords, the uh, tenants that are having a really hard time. And are we able to uh, distinguish between uh, someone trying to manipulate uh, money that's coming in? Uh, I want to make sure that it, you know, it comes in and it goes to where it's supposed to go. If the state is going to run it, I guess locally we're pretty much responsible that it goes where it's supposed to go. Is that correct? Um, sort of. I, I will say, I think you've identified one of the main challenges in running a program like this, right? Because obviously um, there's going to be a lot of people wanting to pursue these funds. And so there's a challenge in sorting out legitimate uh, requests for assistance from potentially fraudulent claims, correct? So that's, that's a big challenge that's um, going to be faced by the program administrator. In this case, if we pursue option A, we will not be the program administrator. So LISC is the statewide um, uh, nonprofit entity that will be administering the funds and they will be responsible for vetting all documentation and applications to determine who is eligible and who is not. Um, the county, again, would be able to provide some guidance and maybe some problem solving suggestions and things like that by participating in this advisory committee, but we will not be responsible for the day-to-day -day administration of the program. Uh, now, uh, another point I think you raised is that it can be challenging to try to make sure that the small landlords, your mom and pop landlords who have one unit or a, a ADU or something like that, um, that they can access the program equally. That is also a priority of this program design as laid out by SB 91. So there is really a, a priority in trying to get um, information out and to make the program as accessible as possible and prioritize the households most in need. And so we would be helping at, with that at the local level, both county staff as well as these local uh, nonprofit agency partners that are likely going to be subcontractors to that statewide administrative entity. So we would help by messaging and getting word out in multiple channels, for instance, you know, at community events, through local radio PSAs, through, you know, social media blasts. There's all sorts of ways that we we will be able to help push out information at the local level in various formats and channels to make sure that those who might not be um, on social media all the time or have good internet access and so forth, or maybe speak other languages, to so make sure that they are getting the message and have an opportunity to apply. In addition, the program requires prioritization. So there's going to be essentially three application rounds. The first round will be open only to very low income households. So that's the first priority. The second priority will be for those locations and essentially neighborhoods or you know, county subregions 
that were the most impacted by COVID. And that data will be based on state maps that show um, communities that are um, most in need by a lot of, you know, your your kind of usual parameters, you know, high poverty census tracts and things like that. Um, in addition, we will be able to advise the state advisory board and the contractor as to what areas we feel specifically in the county need some special level of outreach or might qualify as heavily COVID impacted neighborhoods or zip codes or any kind of geographic areas of, of the county. So we will be able to provide that local input to the statewide operator to make sure that um, the right neighborhoods can be prioritized for that second round. And then the third round will be open to anyone who is low income who was not already assisted by the first two rounds. So anyone up to that 80% AMI level. Okay, uh, thank you. You pretty much answered that. Because uh, uh, with big money comes uh, big responsibility. And uh, what we're, we're looking at here is uh, uh, having to cooperate with the, uh, the state, obviously, is dealing with 58 counties. And uh, uh, we'll probably be dealing with uh, local cities and uh, housing authority and, uh, and different agencies locally to make sure the money actually goes where it's supposed to go. I guess I'm concerned with, uh, uh, you know, the bigger uh, picture of uh, multimillionaires that actually own a lot of uh, rentals and whether or not a year ago or two years ago, they raised the rent way up and, uh, and making it more difficult for the people that are actually trying to pay the rent. Uh, so I, I guess uh, uh, I, I just don't want to see where we get money and we find out that it's going to uh, people that don't necessarily need the money as much as the small a landlord that might own, uh, you know, a couple of rentals that, and, you know, people are having a hard time paying their rent. Right. Is there any other questions from supervisors? Okay, uh, are there any questions from the public? There are no public speakers for this item. Okay, we have um, uh, entertained a motion to adopt a resolution out authorizing the county administrative officer to sign the state agreement uh, and related documents to secure 8.7 for 2 million through the state rental assistance program. Mr. Chair, I'll move the recommended actions. Uh, Mr. Heath, did you have something that you wanted to add? Okay. No, thank you, Supervisor. I was just getting ready for uh, the next item. Thank you. Okay, no, sure. Um, so, Mr. Chair, I'll move the recommended actions with uh, great appreciation to our County Planning Department and CAO's office on this. I, I believe that any of the administrative challenges really are going to pale in comparison to the challenges that members of our community have been facing that may need this assistance. So, I appreciate their leadership on obtain, helping obtain this funding. So, I'll move the recommended actions. Okay. I'll, I'll second it unless somebody else wants to second it. That's okay. Uh, motion by friend, second by Caput. Kirk, uh, clerk, please call the roll. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, we will now um, go into closed session. Two questions. Uh, Mr. Um, Palacios, how long do you think this might take? And then Mr. Heath, um, is there any reportable action? What's your guesstimate on the time frame, uh, Mr. Palacios? Yes, I think closed session uh, will take at least an hour. Okay, um, it's 12.30, so I'm, I'm gonna move the scheduled item for 1.30 to 1.45. I think I can do that, all right. We'll just, we'll just open up the, the public, the scheduled item for 1.30. It won't be until 1.45. Uh, and Mr. Heath, is there, uh, Council Heath, is there uh, re any reportable actions? There are not. Okay. No reportable actions. Thank you. Okay. We will recess into closed session and come back to address item, uh, the scheduled item number 11 at one, uh, we hope at 1.45. So uh, let's take, um, 
10 minutes uh, and then uh, get into closed session. All right, or should we just stay on Mr. Heath? Is, uh, we can do that, all right? Uh, we can certainly stay on and gather everybody together uh, and then we can decide. Okay, why, why don't we just do that? Let's um, just go into the closed session right now then, okay? Pardon me, Chair, you do have a quorum of supervisors, although we're still waiting for Supervisor Caput to join. Okay, um, so we'll go ahead and reconvene the February 23rd, 2021 meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. It, the time is about uh, 10 minutes to 2 p.m. Uh, we have a scheduled item for 1.30. We knew we were gonna be a little late. Um, this is a study session on the injection drug use crisis in Santa Cruz County with presentations from the Sheriff's Office, the Superior Court, and the Health Services Agency. And defer to May 2021 uh, report with recommendations to improve syringe litter reporting as outlined in the memorandum of the Director of Health Services. We have two items, uh, the risk of infectious disease outbreaks associated with injection drug use and county syringe services programs role in prevention. And that is attachment A. And B, we have syringe access and, disposable in, uh, and disposal in Santa Cruz County, attachment B. And if we refer to SSP, it is the syringe services program. I think we do have a presentation coming from uh, the uh, health services. Hi. Yes, uh, this is Jen Herrera, Chief of Public Health. Um, I will share my screen and our health officer, Dr. Gail Newell, will uh, start with opening comments. I'll go ahead and start speaking as Jen shares her screen. I want to thank the supervisors for the opportunity for education for all of us uh, and our greater community um, on uh, injection drug use and its impacts on our county. And um, I wanna thank our partners who participated in preparing the study session and who have proved to be invaluable partners as we work on this problem together. Uh, with special shout outs to uh, the sheriff's office, the courts and probation. And I want to uh, express my special gratitude to the sheriff and his office for his willingness to uh, initiate uh, MAT in the jails, medical assisted therapy. Um, this is a pioneer and uh, landmark uh, effort in our county along with WellPath, our uh, jail medical services provider, to provide treatment for substance use, uh, including injection drug use, in our jails so that when our inmates are released into the community, they can um, already be drug-free and ready to be active community participants. And um, this has been supported by the courts and probation as well. So a big thanks to all of them as we move forward with that effort. And I wanna remind all, all of our community that when we work with this population, with this problem, with injection drug users uh, who are our community members, we are not just serving that population of individuals, but serving our entire community um, it's all of us who are impacted by the problem of injection drug use in our county. Um, not only those who use drugs and their families, but uh, the greater community as well. And by working on this problem of injection drug use, uh, we're serving everyone in our community, preventing infectious disease like HIV and hepatitis C, and also um, disability and death due to overdose and other uh, increases in mortality um, due to injection drug use. So with that, I'll turn it over to um, our staff. And uh, again, thanks to all of you who are here to learn more about this problem. Thank you, Dr. Newell. And thank you, uh, Chair McPherson and board. Uh, again, I'm Jen Herrera. I'm the Chief of Public Health and I will be facilitating this presentation today, this study session. 
On December 10th, 2019, following a presentation from HSA Syringe Services Program, the board directed the program to hold a future board study session by March 2020 on the IV drug study uh, drug crisis facing our county with presentations requested from the Sheriff's Office, the Superior Court, and the Health Services Administration on the law enforcement, criminal justice system, treatment and prevention efforts that are being made to address this crisis. HSA requested a deferral of the study session from March 2022 to today as public health had been coordinating the pandemic response. Today, I am grateful to be joined by a panel of experts to support this study session. This session will cover the following topics, an overview of injection drug use, a review of available local data with a presentation from the Sheriff's Office, injection drug use and substance use disorder with presentations from HSA's Behavioral Health Division, the County's Medication Assisted Treatment Program, and the SafeRx Coalition facilitated by the Health Improvement Partnerships of Santa Cruz County. And lastly, we'll have an overview of injection drug use in the criminal justice system with presentations from the Superior Court and the Probation Department. Defining injection drug use. Injection drug use or IDU is the act of using a needle to inject drugs under the skin. A common route is into a vein, hence the commonly used term IV drug use. However, there are, routes to, there are other routes to inject drugs, including under the skin and into the muscle. Why do people inject drugs? It can produce a rapid and powerful drug high, notably when injected into a vein or artery. However, the reasons why people inject drugs are personal. It can be based on personal preference or because their drug of choice is available through this route. Injection drug use is associated with drug addiction. As Dr. Gabar Mate had said, it is impossible to understand addiction without asking what relief the addict finds or hopes to find in the drug or the addictive behavior. Injection drug use is associated with an increased risk for illness and death, hence the public health impact. Because it involves breaking the skin barrier, injection drug use makes an individual, individual vulnerable to diseases and serious medical conditions, as Dr. Newell had mentioned, uh, such as HIV, hepatitis B, as well as heart infections, uh, such as endocarditis. Repeated injection drug use causes skin damage like abscesses. These conditions have impact on our healthcare system and communicable diseases can be difficult to control if widespread. Those who inject drugs may have a drug addiction, also known as substance use disorder. Addiction is a disease that affects both the brain and behavior. Drug addiction is a chronic disease characterized by compulsive or uncontrollable drug seeking and use, despite harmful consequences and changes in the brain, which can be long lasting. These changes in the brain can lead to the harmful behavior seen in people who use drugs. And lastly, the consequences of repeated injection drug use is intensified by social determinants, such as homelessness and poverty. For example, someone who does not have access to clean running water has a higher risk for infection. This is a list of notable California laws related to syringe possession. In summary, it is lawful for individuals to possess syringes for personal use if acquired from an authorized source, such as a pharmacy or a syringe service program. SSP participants shall not be subject to criminal prosecution for possession of syringes and safer use materials. And it is lawful to possess syringes regardless of source, as long as they are in a safe disposal container. This next section will review available local data related to injection drug use. Though there is limited data sources available, we have uh, SSP program data um, through the county's SSP program, as well as drug-related fatality data through the coroner's office. The county SSP collects information on the characteristics of its participants, which are posted monthly on the program's website. The following few slides show preliminary data for the entire year of 2020. From January through December 2020, the program served 481 unique individuals. The majority of participants are between the ages of 25 to 44, slightly more males than females, primarily um, those identify as white. Um, if you can please mute, please. Thank you. Uh, in 2020, the majority of SSP participants were from the city of Santa Cruz. 48% of participants noted that they are experiencing homelessness. 
Of the 481 clients served, the SSP had 2,110 total visits, the majority being secondary exchange, um, which uh, for our program definition, that means exchanging for themselves and for other people. The primary drug that is injected is heroin. Due to COVID safety precautions, the SSP staff have limited the face time with participants. However, at nearly every single encounter, we reinforce and support harm reduction education, and we continue to provide referrals and or education around drug treatment services. 73% of participants also receive overdose prevention education, as the opioid overdose uh, reversal medication, naloxone or Narcan, is distributed at SSP. In addition to the regular monthly SSP reports, the program conducted a more in-depth review of people who inject drugs in our community through the syringe access and disposal report. The full report includes field work and focus groups conducted in October 2019 and was presented to the board on December 10th, 2019. The following slides highlight some findings from the field surveys and focus groups, providing a glimpse into the injection drug use in community in Santa Cruz County. Uh, and I, I do want to emphasize that it is a glimpse of the community. These, uh, the results of these findings uh, can't be generalized to the entire community. The table on this slide shows the demographic breakdown of the field survey participants, all of which support uh, self-report as injecting drugs. The majority of those surveyed fit the primary clientele of um, the SSP demographic uh, the SSP program demographics, which are uh, primarily white, male, and between the ages of 25 to 54. This table shows that the majority of participants of the survey were currently experiencing unstable housing, many of which live in Santa Cruz. However, uh, this is likely to due to the design of the study as our field surveyors focus on um, uh, outreach um, uh, and walking in, in neighborhoods and um, asking people uh, out in the community if they could uh, participate in the, in the survey. This table shows the health outcomes among the survey participants. Uh, from these types of questions, we found that gaps in syringe access were associated with riskier injection practices, like reusing and sharing syringes, both of which have negative health consequences. Additional findings of the surveyed population include that participants who obtained syringes exclusively from a syringe service program were nearly half as likely to share used syringes with other people. 75% of survey participants reported reusing their own syringes, 29% of uh, participants reported sharing syringes, and participants who share syringes were found to um, be more likely to have skin abscesses. In addition to the field surveys, we also conducted focus groups of people who inject drugs. The next few slides highlight some quotes, which provides a qualitative glimpse into the perspective of this community. For us drug addicts out there, it's a problem. It's an addiction, and I think clean needles is safe needles. I think that makes a difference. I have a lot of friends who do use the needle exchange. I think that has a lot to do with recovery. They give hope. It's like, if they can do it, well, I can change things too. When you're sick, you have to take care of that first and worry about the rest. But if that is removed from the equation, it's one step toward a decision to better for your, to better for your situation. You start somewhere, just having clean needles. Okay, I'm taking care of myself a bit. Sometimes that snowballs into, I don't wanna use as much as I, I have been, you know? It can. That's what harm reduction is, it starts somewhere. As opioid overdose is a, is a significant risk with injection drug use, we also ask focus group participants about witnessing overdoses and their experiencing, experience using some naloxone. I can't tell you how many people I've had to bring back in the past couple of years, but grateful for the opportunity to do it. Another quote, there's a lot of fentanyl going around. Just in the last month, I've had to bring back five people. Fentanyl is a very, very different overdose than heroin. And this segues to the next portion of our presentation around drug-related fatalities in our community. And uh, this next report out is uh, from Dr. Stephanie Fiore, our sheriff coroner. And you're on mute, Dr. Fiore. There it is. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Jen, are you moving the slides? 
forward? Are you advancing slides? Yes. Yes, I am. Go to the next slide. Um, the the uh, sheriff coroner's office is mandated to investigate the circumstances, manner, and cause of death of all um, uh, deaths that occur in violent, non -tra or traumatic, non-natural, sudden, and, and, uh, and unexpected circumstances. Next slide. And this includes investigating all deaths that are related to drug use, including those from injected drug use. Um, the way that we can help is by providing data to um, folks in the healthcare community and the lawmakers to show them what some of the current drug trends are that we're seeing, and um, as well as uh, uh, highlighting the geography where this drug use is occurring in our community. And I do want to say that while injected drug use is certainly one of the most visible uh, uh, types of drug use we see in our community, it is only a fraction and there is more going on than just with the injected drug use, which you'll see in the following slide. Next slide. Um, when I came to the county back in 2014 and when people started becoming interested in the opioid epidemic, this was the graphic that the California Department of Public Health was putting out about the, um, the where Santa Cruz County fit in the state distribution of uh, opioid drug overdoses. And this is a, a per capita graphing showing um, that Santa Cruz, which is highlighted with the arrow, and I understand this is pretty hard to see, but Santa Cruz is towards the top. It's number six in this graphic uh, showing that we had one of the highest drug overdose deaths per capita of, of all the counties in California. Um, the state average is highlighted by the red bar. And when you look at the neighboring counties, San Benito County, um, San Mateo, Santa Clara, Monterey County, they all fell below the state average where we were way towards the top of this grid. And in, when they reported out a three-year average, we ranked number 41 out of 58 counties uh, for our drug death uh, uh, statistics. Next slide. Um, over the years, we've improved um, our ranking uh, in the subsequent uh, uh, grouping of three years, 2015 to 17, we dropped our rank down to 36 out of 58 counties. These reports, um, I have to stress, are for opioid deaths only, uh, which are not the only drugs that we see in our county. But we did improve our statistics, and by 2018, you can see that there was quite a bit uh, drop in the number of uh, deaths per capita in our county. We have seen a slight rise in those cases, but uh, the two bars on the far right show the national objective and the current average for the state of California. So we've been staying below that um, uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> this is more reflective of what I'm seeing. And the, the bars are showing the percentage of my caseload and below the bars, I have the number of actual, the actual number of acute drug overdoses versus the total number of my cases for a given year. And you can see that from 2015 to 17, we did slowly drop that number of uh, overdose deaths. But then in 2018, that number started to climb again, as opposed to what um, CDPH is reporting with just opioid deaths. Um, in 2019, we saw quite a few uh, deaths uh, compared to what we saw in 18. Um, last year with 2020, where the nation has been reporting a surge in drug deaths related to the COVID pandemic, we have not seen that in our county. The actual number of overdoses between 2019 and 2020 were actually the same the percentage of my caseload, however, uh, it was decreased because I saw quite a few more deaths overall last year um, than just drug deaths. 
So that's why we're seeing a slight decrease in my overall percentage, but the actual number of overdoses remain the same. Next slide. This is a graphic that kind of shows the class of drugs that we've seen over time from 2008 to 2018. And the red uh, line across the top are opioids. And you can see that that has always been the most prevalent drug we've seen in our county. But from 2014 on, those numbers have been decreasing over time. The other line I wanna point out is the light blue line, which has been raising, um, uh, increasing in number from 2013 to date. And that's uh, reflecting stimulant use. And we're starting to see more and more stimulant use and less opioid use over time. And we'll get back to that again in a few more slides. Next slide. This is a slide, our graphic shows uh, opioid trends over time with heroin being detected on the bottom in the orange bars um, and methadone, uh, the blue color, the green is what we would consider prescription opioids like hydrocodone and oxycodone, but they're not necessarily reflecting that they were prescribed. They're just that class of drugs. And then we have the designer drugs coming in in 2015, depicted by the gray bar at the top. We never saw a lot of fentanyl or the other uh, uh, fancy designer drugs that have been um, hitting the East Coast and the Midwest portions of this country um, over the last few years, but we're starting to see more fentanyl now. Uh, now. But you can see that um, uh, it, both in 2011 and 14, we had some spikes in drug use. Um, since 2014, the prescription drugs, the opioid epidemic that we've been hearing about has kind of disappeared. The numbers have decreased over time, but heroin has stayed relatively stable throughout the years. Next slide. This is the slide comparing methamphetamine use and heroin. You can see that from 2010 on, heroin use has uh, stayed pretty stable in our community, but methamphetamine use has continually risen. And in 2019, we saw a sharp increase in the number of deaths related to methamphetamine use. Next slide. This is a preliminary results for 2020. Um, I have most of my cases reflected here, but there's still some that are not uh, closed out. Heroin use uh, compared to last year has stayed again, relatively stable. We are seeing a lot more fentanyl this year than we ever have. And uh, it is a more challenging drug to reverse with the Narcan. The medics um, will say it takes more than one dose of Narcan to get somebody to come around. So it is much more challenging to reverse these deaths than with heroin. Um, and it's a big concern for me to see this rise in cases. Uh, the stimulants, cocaine is a little bit up. It's never been a big player in this county but we can see that methamphetamine wall down in numbers a little bit still maintains uh, the number one slot for the drugs that, uh, drug that I'm seeing most prevalently in um, deaths. And then uh, alcohol. Alcohol is, uh, is a big player um, uh, as well. And we see it mixed with both illicit drugs and prescription drug use. Um, uh, next slide and my last slide. Oh, no, it's not my last. So this is a graphic kind of showing some of the distribution of drug use. And um, just like with Jen's uh, data, most of it is taking place in Santa Cruz City. And these uh, plots are showing actually where uh, the death, uh, not the death occurred, but the drug use occurred that related to death. And you can see that it most frequently occurs around the San Lorenzo River Belt in the downtown area. Um, and that's why, you know, we, you know, with the drug use and the bench signs around the, um, the county building, it's right in our face and we see it a lot because that's where most of it is taking place. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the Watsonville, which is the other uh, high uh, incident location in our county. And again, most of it taking place in the downtown areas. Next slide. 
uh, route of administration. For us, uh, we don't always know what the route of administration is for our deaths. Um, we do have some information on, on them and inject, this is data from 2019 provided by California Department of Public Health. Um, inject, and these are numbers of cases, not percentage, but uh, injection um, was uh, listed in a fair number of cases, but when you can take in smoking, snorting and ingestion, it's still a small percentage of the number of cases that we see for deaths. Um, it does cause a significant amount of uh, um, health issues for the, uh, for the individuals because most of our cases um, have hepatitis C uh, infections. Um, uh, with a few also uh, HIV, but hepatitis is, is ubiquitous in our um, client population. I think that's my last slide. Thank you, Dr. Fiore. This next section, uh, injection drug use and substance use disorder um, will uh, be covered by a few speakers, uh, including our behavioral health director, our MAC program, and a presentation from the SafeRx Coalition. As stated earlier, someone who injects drugs and suffers from addiction may experience multiple barriers to access health and social services. Some of these barriers include stigma, trauma, isolation, lack of trust, and even just an unawareness, uh, not being aware of resources. Harm reduction is an approach to minimize the barriers that someone who injects drugs may experience. Harm reduction is a movement focused on shifting power and resources to people most vulnerable to structural violence. It incorporates a spectrum of strategies, including safer drug use, managed use, and abstinence. And it meets people where they're at, but doesn't leave them there. Harm reduction does not minimize or ignore the harms associated with licit and illicit drug use and sexual activity. It applies evidence-based interventions to reduce negative consequences of drug use. It moves past judgment of a person's drug use and sexual activity and addresses the whole person. It works to elicit any positive change based on the individual's needs, circumstances, and readiness for change. There are benefits. Uh, the benefits of harm reduction include challenging stigma, increasing trust, improving community and individual health, engaging people into care, and reducing utilization and cost in the medical system. These are the principles of harm reduction. In the following presentations of this uh, study session, you'll find that these principles are incorporated in our community's approach to support people who are injecting drugs. This slide shows the different types of harm reduction services, which includes medication-assisted treatment and syringe services. A syringe service program, like the county's, provides clean syringes and safe disposal of used syringes. It's existed since at least the 1970s, and it's played a central role in dramatically reducing HIV infection among people who inject drugs. SSPs are one piece of the harm reduction paradigm for promoting health and safety with people who use drugs. And it's never just the syringes. It's, an SSP is always part of a system of care. SSPs are at the intersection of multiple epidemics and provides a gateway to services which support linkage and education around things like overdoses and other infectious diseases. Syringe services support the entire community through a variety of ways beyond just the distribution of and collection of syringes. Again, it's never just the syringes, it's always part of a system of care. This next section covers another major part of the system of care to support people who inject drugs. HSA Behavioral Health Director Eric Ria will cover the County Substance Use Disorder Services. Good afternoon and thank you, Jen. Uh, if I could get the next slide. So we are very fortunate in the county to be actively participating in a state and federal waiver that has allowed us to significantly expand substance use disorder services within the community. And these are a highlight of some of the services that we provide to the residents of our county, including early intervention and outpatient treatment, intensive outpatient and residential treatment, 
our narcotic treatment programs, which you'll hear a little bit about later, along with medication-assisted treatment, withdrawal management, physician consultation services, case management, recovery support, and 24-hour access to treatment resources in the community. Next slide, please. So the drug Medi-Cal organized delivery system known as the ODS waiver has allowed us to expand services in the community and most importantly, leverage additional federal funds to support service expansion. The programs and services are targeted to individuals with Medi-Cal as their primary insurance. And in order to leverage those additional federal funds, local matching dollars are required. The ODS waiver also comes with a significant amount of state and federal requirements around access to care, timeliness requirements, and the use of a standardized assessment tool to determine the appropriate level of care for a client called the ASAM. Next slide, please. This is a listing of our primary service providers within the county, our Santa Cruz County Health Services Agency, Janus of Santa Cruz, Encompass Community Services, Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance, New Life Community Services, and Sobriety Works. In addition, if we lack capacity within the county to provide services to an ODS recipient, we do have contracts and agreements with out-of-county providers to provide access to those critical services as well. Next slide, please. This is some summary data in terms of treatment volume. Uh, you can see the different levels of service that we're providing uh, within the different service categories, um, as well as the total number of clients served in fiscal year 19 and 20, and our current fiscal year 2021 um, through December 31st. Next slide, please. This is a breakdown of the primary substance for those participants in our withdrawal management programs. Um, and you can see that 38% of the participants are being treated for an opioid addiction or abuse. And of that 38%, the majority of those individuals are using heroin as their primary um, drug. And that's it for my section. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And next, I'd like to introduce Danny Contreras, the Health Services Manager for the County's Medication Assisted Treatment Program. And Danny will provide an overview of this program. Hi, uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah? Yeah, you sound good, Danny. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, like Jen said, my name is Danny Contreras. Uh, we have three clinics, the Homeless Persons Health Project, Santa Cruz Health Center, and the Watsonville Health Center, uh, where we provide medication-assisted treatment. Uh, basically, anybody can come in as long as they have Medi-Cal, and uh, we can get them connected uh, with services. We have groups. We have uh, we have everything integrated in all our clinics: IVH, integrated behavioral health therapy, psychiatry. So they get pretty much everything wrapped around them as far as the services they need. And we have a pretty uh, robust and and I would say strong program uh, for patients to get involved. And uh, with that, I'm gonna pass it along to one of our peer mentors right now. Uh, we also have where we're training up some of our patients that are in long-term recovery to be able to give back in the community, work shifts and needle exchange, do outreach. And uh, if they choose to outside of this, they can step into the field and become drug and alcohol counselors and other, and anything in the field that they wanna do as far as that. So I have a couple of people before I introduce Coach, uh, one another guy who wasn't able to be here today, he's actually actually working at Salvation Army and the Disaster Service Workers. He's been with us for about four, four or five years, and he's got about that much time sobriety. Uh, he accessed care through the needle exchange, and from the needle exchange got connected to HPHP, uh, because at that time we only had a uh, map in, uh, at HPHP, and he was from Watsonville, so he would catch a bus or whatever he needed to do to get HPHP to get on mat services. And that guy is housed now, got, a, got his family back in his life, 
working a couple of jobs and he's and he's just doing great. He couldn't be here today, but he, he wanted to let everybody know, you know, uh, what what he's been able to accomplish and stuff like that. And so I'm going to introduce you to Coach. Let's see if I uh, start my video. No, it won't let me. Won't let me do it. Okay. Well, Coach, go ahead. Okay. Hi. My name is Kim Campbell. And is there on this day? Oh, is there? Okay. My name is Kim Campbell, and I'm a resident here in Santa Cruz now. I came here um, around December of 2017 after I was recently, or I mean, in 2017, I was released from federal prison from doing a parole violation on what was more commonly referred to as a career bank robber. And I came to your city to get cured. I am from San Francisco. Uh, I was at the end of my rope. Uh, everyone had given up on me. I'd been in and out of prison the majority of my life. Uh, I spent a good 35 years behind bars, mostly in federal prison for bank robbery. Those were unarmed bank robberies, I might add. I'm not trying to clean anything up, but I was an idiot. I uh, did all of that to secure the money behind the counter for heroin. I was what you call a full-blown heroin addict, in and out of prison, stealing, robbing, telling lies, and everything that went with it for the majority of my life. As I said, three and a half years ago, I came to Santa Cruz on the uh, wings of my parole officer who got me into Santa Cruz Residential Community Drug Treatment Program up on Rig Street here in town. I spent roughly four months there going through the program. I left there and moved directly next door to the sober living environment where I started to learn a new way of life. I also became uh, involved in the Suboxone program here uh, through the county of Santa Cruz, the Medication for Addiction Treatment, MAT as it's known. I've also been through the, I believe it was 16 week program for peer mentorship uh, and I come down the road, but being on the Zaboxin program, I don't want to go into that, is I made a big change. I'd been on methadone and things like that before, but through the new MAT Zaboxin program, it has worked miracles in my life, and I'm here to share them with you. I have basically turned my life entirely around with the help of the MAT program here at the county. And I mean, I one of my jobs, I worked for a year and a half as an Uber driver, uh, made a nice living at that. Of course, the pandemic came up uh, and I've been integral in a lot of volunteer work through the program here. Um, I have been able to make, um, what are commonly referred to as good choices as uh, opposed to bad choices. And even though my old th way of thinking disagreed with those choices, I made the good choices and they're working. What I do is, and let me get one thing to show you. They can't see you. Okay, I'm gonna come right back to you for right now. But they can't see you. Oh, okay, they yeah, can't the see camera's turned off. Okay. They got them turned off? Yeah, they turned it off. Okay. So anyway, uh, I want to put out that uh, the program here through the county is something that if a person is willing and able to take a small bit of direction from people like Danny or even myself and involve themselves in the program that's being offered over here, a person has a living chance of turning themselves around. And uh, it is something that is true. And uh, I'm a prime example. I was a, a given up person on, by my family and everyone that knew me. And finally, through the program here and through making good choices and learning as I go, I've been able to come up and uh, 
become an integral part of the community. And uh, to be quite truthfully honest, I'm having fun doing it, even though <laughs> some of it's not fun. And uh, it's uh, a whole different ball of wax when you do things and do them correctly. I can't recommend this program enough. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. So uh, there's a there's a bunch of other uh, testimonies of of uh, the work that we've been doing as like coach coaches put in a lot of work. But I just want to give some numbers. Uh, last month we had about 274 patients on our in our Suboxone part of the MAP program, and about 113 on uh, uh, our Vivitrol. So that's uh, the patients that are suffering from alcohol use disorder. So there, there's a lot of patients coming through. It's just us working with them wherever they're at. You know, Jen talked about harm reduction and, and it's just creating that safe space to be able to work with people where they're at and, and help them get to where they want to be as far as in the recovery. So thank you. Thank you, Danny. And thank you, Coach. Yeah. This next uh, presentation will be on the SafeRx um, Santa Cruz County Coalition. Our county MAP program has strong collaboration with other MAP programs in our county through the hub of the SafeRx Coalition. It is facilitated by the Health Improvement Partnership of Santa Cruz County, and Shelley Barker, the Behavioral Health Director for HIF, will provide the overview of SafeRx. Thanks. Go ahead to the next slide, Jen. So SafeRx was initiated in 2015, and um, we, we have these three primary goals, and we've placed some logos to just a partial listing of partners. Um, as Jen described, our intention is to really be a hub um, to foster ideal practices and to be also pragmatic in um, acknowledging that this is a challenging problem. And so when, when we think of safer prescribing practices, um, as all of you are likely very aware, you know, in the 90s, the tendency was to say that if there, if a person was experiencing pain, especially chronic pain, that you know the answer from Western medicine was a prescription opioid. And I think we've clearly learned that that has provoked a lot of problems. And so to be part of the solution, um, SafeRx since 2015 has really been convening local players from multi, multiple sectors. Um, but our work around safe prescribing practices we're really pleased with in the sense that um, we, we launched a concept called opioid failure. So really, again, being pragmatic and, and trying to foster um, person-centered care and um, realistic solutions for people. Um, the concept of opioid failure that's embedded in our pain management guidelines is to help pro providers have frank conversations where, so let's say uh, someone has been um, coming more frequently for higher doses of opioid, that prescriber can have a conversation and say, look, you know, we started, I, I started um, offering uh, an opioid because of your lower back pain a year ago, and here we are today, and you're using a lot higher dose, and yet you're still having the back pain, and we're also noticing some other things in your life, like you're, you're less available to your family, and you're losing your prescriptions, and anyway, noting some behavior, and then, it, but really saying, so it seems that this, this treatment isn't serving you, that the opioids have failed you, and so I share that brief story as an example of trying to be pragmatic and provide realistic, um, appropriate, beneficial solutions, which can open that door to new opportunities as, as Coach just described. Um, also, um, another layer of our work that has been very robust is around medication-assisted um, substance use disorder treatment. Go ahead to the next slide, please, Jen. Um, this is admittedly a very busy slide, um, and I think it shows that SafeRx is complex and we're busy and we're doing lots of prongs of our work. Um, what I wanted to really highlight here is um, we have always, we have a metrics work group, so there are several initiatives, um, and we have our medicine MAPT advisory group. And um, as you likely are also aware, so clinicians who need to, uh, who wish to prescribe um, medications like Suboxone and Vivitrol, um, need to take an additional training. Um, and so in that additional training, that training is not so onerous, although it's difficult to find the time, 
Um, but then there's often a, a reluctance. Um, and, and so what that advisory group has done is to really foster peer-to-peer -peer connections amongst prescribers so that they can be more confident in utilizing their X waiver, their license to prescribe those medicines, um, and therefore increasing access so that we can, we as a community, when a person is potentially ready um, to seek recovery or to, to look at their life differently, they have access to um, evidence-based best practices. The other thing I'd like to note here is, um, you know, our prescriber practice initiative, I already mentioned the prescriber guidelines, um, those were developed in a multidisciplinary way. So we're very much um, grounded in the goal of offering um, multiple solutions that could include behavioral health, as in mental health, mild to moderate mental health services, um, as well as medicine. So I think the, the other layer here that I wanted to mention is we also are deeply committed to community education. And our, our uh, goal is always to be nimble and responsive. So um, as Dr. Fiore shared, um, the We've noted recently, uh, the trend is that there is a lot of stimulant use that yes, there's an opioid problem, but there's also a lot of um, multiple drug use and stimulant use in our community. And so SafeRx has pivoted, we, the bottom left there is we've launched a poly substance work group. And Jen, go ahead to next slide, please. This list, um, I'll, I'll let you read it, but what I wanna speak to um, some of the accomplishments of this group. Um, and when I say this group, it's, it's really, it's the people on this, um, this conversation with you today. Um, that have been working together um, on a lot of these efforts. Um, so this polysubstance work group really is an example of, of SafeRx being driven by data and trying to respond and be um, <clears throat> effective in, in, um, in matching people with the resources they need. Um, so as we've seen stimulant use increase, um, SafeRx has brought together folks who want to focus on that, and we've brought stakeholders from multiple sectors, um, and we've really we've featured Danny Contreras's efforts. Um, part of one of the, the prongs of the work that he uh, leads is contingency management, which is one of the few well um, evidence-based practices around um, a response to stimulant use disorder as well as Dr. Dimitri Bakos, um, you know, you have amazing county leadership within your um, that with health services agency. Um, he has fostered an approach to using medicines for stimulant use, medicines to, to treat stimulant use disorder um, that has some promising um, outcomes and is has been featured regionally and nationally recently on some webinars. Um, I know that you're reading as I'm talking. Um, we've we've partnered. Some other things we're proud of is really, you know, when we think of of medication access, um, that means really starting, um, if if people are ready, starting MAT in the emergency room settings, as well as having access to MAT in primary care settings, both safety net and private. Um, and as Dr. Newell alluded to, also in the jails. Um, so. So there's been a lot of progress and, and we feel that we want to be a part of the solution and we're really pleased. And I will stop there and make sure that there's time for other components of this important conversation. Thanks so much, Shelley. This next section covers the overlap of injection drug use in the criminal justice system. First, we will hear a report from Katie Maida, Collaborative Court Manager from the Superior Court of California. Then we will hear from Fernando uh, Geraldo, Chief Probation Officer with the County's Probation Department. Hi, thank you so much for having us. Um, it's really been an exciting time at the Superior Court over the last three years. Um, we have had a complete investment in decreasing the population of mental health and substance use in our criminal justice system. And that really has happened through a couple of different grants, including um, what we had, which was the innovation grant that developed the collaborative justice system. This is in partnership with the DA, the public defense, Defender, county behavioral health, county substance use, as well as multiple other players that are um, on this uh, meeting today. And within that process, we have leveraged um, drug Medi-Cal funds in order to set up an assessment and screening process throughout the court system um, that we have expedited significantly so that judges and attorneys can have professionals that, that uh, work with substance use and also 
um, work with mental health to provide input on the direction of the criminal case regarding to the person's needs and their current um, access to treatment. And so we are able to, within a week to two weeks, do a screening for our clients to find out what their substance use concerns are and whether or not they qualify for any treatment within our community. And so we've partnered with the Sheriff's Department to really um, allow for what um, Eric uh, mentioned earlier about the drug medical to be able to access treatment. We're doing the ASAM assessments within incarceration so that the judges can make the determination to release someone from custody into treatment, right into residential treatment. And so that process alone has created just so much education for the judges and the court staff on how to address um, the overwhelming need for substance use treatment within our community. And we've also been able to establish several uh, collaborative courts that really focus on providing treatment in lieu of incarceration or penalties within that process. And so we have partnered with County Behavioral Health to have a court clinician that is available Monday through Friday for court in order to do assessments, to do recommendations for attorneys and judges for the, uh, so that they can move forward um, with an educated uh, and uh, more understanding as they move fo forward in the process of um, sentencing or moving forward to possible diversion. Um, we have a veterans court that uh, that works with substance use. We also have behavioral health court. We have a reentry court for people who are on parole. And we have a family drug court that works with dependency in order to support families in re reuniting. And then we also have our PACT court, which I know that you guys are very familiar with, which really supports um, the high utilizers in our community that really struggle with substance use that affects every aspect of their life. And so within this process, we have really been able to um, identify people that have needs, identify people so that we can reduce the recidivism and really prevent them from coming back into our services. Um, the one thing with the criminal justice system is we don't want to see people again. And so these uh, programs and the systems that we've put in place have really taken us into a brand new, really exciting um, movement. And part of that is through um, the champion of probation and their support, um, as well as the DA's department to really implement um, neighborhood courts, which is another way of being able to divert people out of the criminal justice system. Um, and in all of these, we do address um, IV drug use as well as other um, uh, multiple um, uh, drug use and mental health. So um, we're kind of really excited what's going to be happening because we have several new grants within the court system to continue these programs for another three years. What this does is this also provides treatment and housing options for people within our programs. Um, and thanks to the CAFES program that I'm sure will be mentioned um, right after me, uh, we have access for people to, that do not have Medi-Cal to get into programming as well, or people who do not qualify for other types of funding sources for them to really get the treatment needed. So I'm actually um, really excited about kind of where we're launching to and how far we're gonna progress within the next three years within our criminal justice system. So thank you. Thank you, Katie. And we'll turn it over to Fernando, our probation officer. And then don't see, um, I am not seeing Fernando on the attendees or the panelists lists either. We have contacted the department. Okay, thank you. So I'll just go ahead and read the slides. Um, this is, uh, these slides were, the content was developed by the probation department. Uh, so what probation does is they complete assessments and recommendations to the court regarding custodial status and sentencing, as well as providing monitoring and supervision 
for justice involved individuals under the jurisdiction of the probation department. How probation interacts with the injection drug using population. As part of monitoring and supervision for the IDU population, they provide program and resource referrals associated with injection drug use, as well as other risk or need areas to support the individual's overall health and well being to promote public safety. Building relationships and trust with injection drug users is especially important in creating readiness for treatment and recovery. How probation is part of a greater system of care to support people who inject drugs. Probation staff are actively involved in the organized delivery system of SUD services throughout the county. They provide oversight of AB 109 treatment dollars and BSCC Prop 47 grant funds for treatment and housing under the uh, CAFES project. We are, uh, they are under an active partner with Collaborative Court. Uh, they've initiated the uh, Vivid, Early Vivitrol project and they run a probation service center, which serves as a co-location for a variety of services targeting justice-involved individuals, including SUDS assessment and program referrals. And this is the final slide um, of this study session. Um, a quote that comes to mind is, um, as I was putting this slide uh, together, is uh, the opposite of addiction is connection. This is a quote that's said by many in the field of addiction. The opposite of addiction is connection. An effective response to injection drug use requires a coordinated system of care. All of these agencies who presented today, um, the voices of those who inject drugs through our focus groups, um, we all are connected to ensure that those who are using drugs have access to health and social services. And this concludes the study session. I want to express sincere gratitude to all of the panelists and their respective agencies for their contribution. I also want to thank the CAO's office for their support and coordination of the presentation. And I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for that uh, very detailed presentation from a broad range of uh, participants. We appreciate it very much. Uh, and I. I want to thank you for this report today. I, I know that uh, drug use has taken a heart-wrenching toll on our individuals and families and our community at large in Santa Cruz County. In fact, it's true across the nation, as we know, unfortunately. We also know that law enforcement response alone um, really can't reduce the amount of IV drug use, and we need a strong public health response focused on prevention, treatment, and uh, harm reduction. And it's really Encouraging to see the coordinated effort from the federal and state uh, governments on down to the county level. Um, but I know that preventing disease through exchanges and preventing harm to the community uh, by properly discarded needles are equally important. Um, we have an obligation to approach really all of this uh, work with the goal of improving public health for everyone. And you are really doing it a dynamite job and it's uh, good to hear some testimony and first of all I want to congratulate and say thank you to those who have gone through the effort and I imagine it's not a very easy uh, regression to go through but uh, thank you for your efforts and keep at it. I just want to encourage you for, for your own cause in particular but for the community's cause as well um, and we don't really have data I, th I think on the people using IV drugs but um, we do, what's really been a concern is uh, the litter uh, as, uh, and we'll get to more to that later, I think in a presentation later in the year. Uh, but I know Supervisor and Coonerty especially, and we have some of the city of Santa Cruz in our district have long, long supported the downtown streets team, uh, which is a, a tremendous organization that are making, individuals are making great comebacks in their lives. Uh, who they've contracted with the county to collect needles in our districts uh, as part of a, a work training program for people experiencing homelessness. And uh, uh, some of the what some of the data that they have got received or, or uh, collected, I should say, uh, from I think it was July 2019 to December 2020, and just 18 months, uh, just that downtown streets team uh, picked up 12,000 needles in the city and on the North Coast. Uh, uh, and that's that's a lot, a lot of, uh, well, I think it, somebody said it was 168 gallons of litter. 
So um, we have a problem. We know it's undeniable and we need to act swiftly on a more comprehensive response, uh, especially for the litter issue as we're, we're, we're looking at. But from a purely health perspectives and the co uh, collaborative effort that you've put forth and we have done here in Santa Cruz County, um, I just want to say thank you to those who are participating and in, in getting uh, helping get a lot of people get their lives back together. And for those who you have done so, and we heard some of those uh, from, I think it was Coach Campbell and so forth, uh, congratulations. It's just stick with it. And uh, you're going to be a shining example for others uh, in their road to recovery, I hope. And uh, so I really want to thank you for stepping out in front. And I know nobody could be happier about that than you. So uh, just stick with it. And I hope we can have many more like you. Um, that uh, participate uh, in this program, the programs that have been mentioned. Uh, I, uh, I don't know if there might be any other uh, comments from members of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, I have some questions, uh, if you don't mind. Sure, please go ahead, Supervisor Coonerty. Sure, so um, one, I wanna thank the staff. I know you all are um, responding to a global pandemic. Uh, this was requested before we were uh, in that pandemic. and um, while, uh, while I think you've given us some really important information and great work has been done in the midst of the pandemic, I do think that as we emerge, hopefully soon, uh, from the challenge of COVID, we can really focus on this public health uh, crisis um, that our community faces. Um, I guess I, I have a lot of different questions, but I guess I'd start with, do we know how many, um, methamphetamine uh, users there are in Santa Cruz County or heroin users there are in Santa Cruz County? Um, I will we'll defer to um, other members of the panel, uh, maybe our behavioral health director, uh, Eric, if you can take that. I don't have that specific information, Supervisor Coonerty, no. Do we do we know it, and you don't have it, or do we, do we not know it? I don't think we know it. Okay, because I was looking, you know, during this presentation, I was looking. We know fifteen point six of the adult population smoke, and twelve point four percent of teenagers smoke, and eighteen point two percent of our population binge drinks. Um, I think we should, as part of our data dashboard. Uh, be able to to have a sense as to what that number is, um, in order to in order to understand the scope of the problem. Um, do you think not? Again, I understand everyone's very very busy responding to a, a global pandemic. So uh, you know, not right away, but over time. Do you, is there a is there a mechanism by which we can assess the number of uh, people? using those specific drugs? I can look into it further. I think as one of the things we we showed during the presentation today, the, the use rates vary pretty dramatically by substance, by county, um, as reflected in Dr. Fiore's presentation. The data that we have is based on people who are actually engaged in services, but what we don't have are the actual prevalence data or estimates by population in the county. Um, but I can certainly continue to look for that sort of information to make some estimates. Okay, yeah, that would, yeah I think it would be helpful to sort, of, to sort of know where we are within the, that, that county. I guess... For Dr. Fiore, my question was, um, you know, the Santa Cruz County, both the board and the health department have long been sort of national leaders in a harm reduction strategy. How come the adjacent counties to us uh, who are uh, engaged in less harm reduction strategies, uh, but have similar rates of poverty and underlying uh, health disparities, why are their overdose rates uh, lower than ours? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think that when you're looking at San Benito County, which is a really high Hispanic population, um, we 
most of the drug use in our county has to do with our Caucasian population. There is some in the Hispanics, but it's actually underrepresented for the number of Hispanic people we have in this county. So maybe that's part of it. Um, and then I think in the larger counties like Santa Clara, um, it, it's probably just because of the, I don't know, the size of their population and the demographics and other things go with it. So I, I don't really have a good answer. It, it's an interesting thing. And, I, and, uh, and as we've improved, um, they still remained below the state average. Some of the other counties have shifted around like San Francisco now is towards the top of the ranking because their fentanyl cases have you know shot through the roof. Um, but I don't I don't know. I, it just has to probably has to do with the way the demographic of the the individual counties and um, you know I, I just don't know. I don't really have a good answer. Okay. And I, yeah, I mean, that's sort of, um, I, I appreciate that. And I, you know, I don't think we are similar to San Benito County, but I think we are, you know, on a per capita basis, probably very similar to Monterey, San Mateo and Santa Clara counties, right. um, you know, demographically. And so it's trying to figure out a little bit about what's going on, especially when we know they're handing out fewer needles, less Narcan, they're engaging in less harm reduction, you would think that their numbers would be higher. Yeah, I haven't looked at their numbers uh, lately. I mean, these are from 2014 before we really started doing a lot of harm reduction. So we've improved our status. I, and I don't know how they are, you know, in comparison if they maintain a status quo instead of improving it. I, I haven't looked at the other counties as much. I don't have that similar graphic to compare the rankings of the other counties to compare it with. Yeah, I, I just did a quick look at the, the health data website, but I, at, at, um, because I, because I saw that, that that data was from a little while ago. So I thought that yeah. I'd check, but it seemed as though while we had improved, they had also stayed steady. And so it's a little bit, I don't know if Catherine, if you have an answer to the question. Yeah, I don't have an exact answer, but I can tell you that those countering um, counties have uh, a lot more programming that is targeted towards substance use comparison to our program, um, our programs here. We do not have a lot of detox beds or residential treatment facilities. Um, unlike these other programs, they have a lot of other nonprofits that already do provide that treatment. And so I think that when we're talking about um, addressing this need, we're addressing it with um, minimal services. And so the progress that we have made has been really incredible with that limited access of the detox beds, um, as well as residential beds that focus on substance use only. I think, um, and again, recognizing everyone's really busy, I think that would be incredibly helpful as a follow-up information, which is to look at the availability of detox uh, or or these other residential options on a per capita basis um, for comparable counties that may be performing better. Uh, and if that is uh, if that is a solution or a, you know, a, I guess a tool in in addressing the issue, um, it would be helpful to know because then we can start building strategies to, to construct more beds. Because um, I think if that's, uh, certainly there seems to be there, there's a need and if other counties have, uh, are getting better outcomes, um, then we should, be, we should be looking at where our deficiencies are and what we can do to, uh, to address them. So I'd love follow-up information on that if there's time. Catherine, can you also let us, uh, for the um, uh, for the drug Medi-Cal and the, the efforts, uh, I think it's it's been great to have these vertical courts or these specialty courts. Um, do we know how many people complete treatment uh, who have been diverted and then how many uh, re-offend versus, you know, in the years prior where we didn't have these programs? 
Great question. We're actually in the process of finalizing some evaluations right now that have that data. Um, I can tell you that with our reentry court, um, we have, it's about 90%, It's uh, um, I think it might be like 92 or something, of people who have not committed new felonies while they've been participating within the program. Um, a lot of the complications come to trying to find comparable data for people um, either after they graduate or um, or also if they're um, people who are not on parole, we want to have a comparison and we haven't been able to do that. Um, we can say with our packed court that we have had a lot of success, um, but that court has only been relaunched within the next or the last two years. And so an evaluation of the relaunch um, is in process right now. And I can get you um, that data. It will be posted to our website probably by next month. That would be great. I mean, I think um, for, for all folks here, whether it's expanding mat treatment or uh, detox beds, um, getting that information as sooner as we come up on budget time, uh, would be helpful because it helps us evaluate where we want to make these investments. Um, uh, can I ask Danny Contreras if you're still around? Yeah, what was that? Yeah, um, so how have you had to adjust SSP operations during COVID? Oh, I think uh, we would have to bring uh, Rashawn on. I'm I'm not uh, in the SSP, uh, so my staff are in the SSP, and maybe Jen can speak a little bit more to that. Uh, but they've still been running SSP, and uh, like I said, our peer mentors have been working shifts in there too. So I don't know if Jen wants to share a little bit more. Sure. Uh, yes, for our syringe services program, uh, what we've done is we've adjusted the the physical location of, um, it's it's still on the Emmeline and Watsonville campuses, um, but we've reorganized it to ensure that physical distancing is in place. Um, we're minimizing the amount of face time that our SSP staff have uh, with individuals. Um, so, you know, just, just to minimize the amount of time people are in a closed environment, um, uh, obviously, we are enforcing masks and uh, face coverings at all times. Uh, we have, over this past year, uh, per the board's direct direction, uh, we've expanded hours. So we're operational five days a week. Um, and uh, we, we expanded our hours based on participant input, uh, which was primarily that we should have more evening, evening hours. And we're looking to um, ex uh, uh, improve upon our South County services as well. As Dr. Fiore's presentation showed, uh, there, there is a need in Watsonville in South County area um, for uh, syringe services. So we wanna make sure that we're accessible. And, and, and it looks like even, even under COVID restrictions, you've been able to essentially maintain the same number of uh, participants as in 2019. Is that, is that correct? Or in 2020, you were able to? Um, I believe it actually decreased, um, but I'll have to review that data. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm trying to, I have this data here, but it's, it's a little hard to read. It looks like maybe it was a little over 500 at times, but it dropped below that mm -hmm. in Q4 2019 uh, and beyond. We'll plan on having that information included in the SSP biennial report this spring. Okay. Um, and then uh, uh, Coach Campbell, are you still around? I am, I am here. Uh, cool. Um, so one, congratulations on your sobriety. That's, I'm I great. wanna thank both of you gentlemen for complimenting me. That means a lot to me to have people of your stature say something about an old guy like me. <laughs> Um, so can I ask, like, what brought you to Santa Cruz? Like, why, San of all the places, why Santa Cruz? I'm so glad you asked me. There was something that I did not say during that presentation, uh, which I put together in first time. Rick, see, you know. A federal judge in San Francisco, believe it or not, the men that used to send me to prison for 10 years at a pop, 
decided that prison wasn't working for me. And he insisted that I get treatment when my own attorney, my own parole officer, and of course the USUA wanted me back in jail as a lesson. The judge said, no, I want him in treatment. And they sent me to Santa Cruz Residential. And I guess I got the luck of the draw because the program in your city came to my aid. And there were many times I wanted to walk out and go right back up into the tenderloin, right back into the jaws of nastiness. But I stuck and I stayed. And that's part of what I preach during my peer mentorships to people that are trying to come in and get out. That you gotta stick and you gotta stay. Even if it hurts, you have to stay and listen. Take the cotton out of your ears and stick it in your mouth, as we say and listen to people that have the experience and that have leadership skills to help you in the right direction. And it's everything that you ladies and gentlemen have been talking about today. And Danny Contreras, I'm handing a big time kudos to him because he's been a big part of my recovery here. He's always been there for me and he's got me going here and doing volunteer work and, I, and I'm enjoying every bit of it and I've come to really like Santa Cruz and love it and I heard you talking about why maybe things are a little higher in Santa Cruz you know the reputation of Santa Cruz it's a beautiful town it's always been that town that people come from all over the world here and the people that use, they probably look at it as a party town. So it might be kind of up a little bit there. But that just gives us more work to work on. You know, I, yeah. I turn a negative into a positive there. But that's about uh, all I wanted to add. And I'll just say that if you stick with it, yeah. And you're right. And the first man that gave me a kudos, you're right. I am the person that's the happiest out of this. And then comes my family that talks to me again and is instrumental in our relationship. So yeah, it works, gentlemen and ladies. It works if you work it and stay with the prescriptions from the clinicians here. Kind of back up. I'm, I'll be 70 next year. And it took me till this age to learn that I need to follow the rules that were taught to me by my mother and father. And I learned in school and the stuff and make good decisions. That's all, all I can say for today. And I really appreciate you guys letting me be a part of your meeting today. All right. Well, thank you for, also thank you for your volunteer efforts. Sounds like uh, they're making a, making a difference. We're um, so uh, I, uh, I, I, I've taken too much time, but I just want to, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to provide this information. Um, I do think as we emerge from one public health strategy, hopefully we can take some of the lessons learned um, from that uh, sort of a multi-departmental, multi-faceted uh, approach and apply it to this health crisis. We spend a lot of time in this community um, responding to, I think, what is the you know, um, consequences uh, of, of drug, drug abuse in homelessness, in property crime, uh, in violent crime, needle litter, um, and I'd like to spend some time. We certainly need to address all those all those impacts, uh, but I think I'd also like to spend some time uh, trying to, to do more upstream work and more preventative work. Um, so thank you, thanks for all for taking the time, and um, hopefully, as more capacity emerges, we'll be able to uh, to address this this crisis. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Kruger. Any other supervisor have uh, any comments they want to make or input? Chair, I've got some questions. Yes, uh, Mr. Coney. Thank you. Um, my first question, uh, just some clarification, um, is that my understanding is that we currently have no dedicated funding for the syringe services program. Is, is that correct? Uh, that... That was correct. Uh, we did recently receive um, some additional funding, uh, a grant called the California Health, uh, California Harm Reduction Initiative, also known as CHERI, um, but it is primarily funded through general funds. 
because you know, we received uh, uh, and roughly how much is was that grant for or were those specified um, funding it was approximately around 150,000 at uh, the multi-year grant for so for how many years would that cover it is a three-year grant okay thank you um and then my next two questions are you know in the in line with uh what um, Supervisor Coonerty was asking, just trying to get a sense of the overall uh, population that we're dealing with uh, here in our county. Um, I noted um, in one of the attachments that there were 1,170 HSA clients who inject drugs. And I just want a clarification if that was um, you know, necessarily illegal drugs, such as the ones we're talking about, or if that could include insulin or, or other just regular medications. Supervisor, this is uh, Mimi Hall. So um, what you're referring to is um, information from our clients who are accessing services through behavioral health. So um, when they're reporting on their primary routes of delivery, so it would not be for insulin, for um, medical reasons for um, injection. And the question is posed as um, regarding your drug use. And I'll provide another point of clarification uh, regarding Supervisor Coonerty question, kind of around the same area, is for tobacco and other things, the state provides um, a lot of comprehensive efforts across the entire state and each of the counties to do surveys regarding certain risks and behaviors. And um, it's easy for us to have that data because it's collected statewide. But when it gets down to the more detailed information, local information, um, that we don't, in order to get what's being asked for, we would have to start an effort to proactively collect it. But what we can do is provide data that we do have in terms of, of the patients who see us, of those people who are either our patients or our clients, um, their reported use. And, um, and that provides somewhat of a picture. That's great. So of the so we've got 1,170 clients who inject drugs. Of of how many total? Of about 7,000 substance use disorder clients. So okay. So then others would be using alcohol or not injecting. But there, that's seven. The universe of 7,000 um, clients who are dealing with some kind of drug addiction. Correct. And it, this is um, reporting uh, primary route or preferred route of administration. I see. Got it. Regardless of the drug. Okay. Thank you. Um, again, just to try to get a sense of, of um, you know, how we compare with to the rest of the state, um, I really appreciated Dr. Fiore's uh, review of some of the uh, overdose deaths and how we compare to uh, other counties, uh, although I'm a, a little confused at this point. Um, I read again in one of the attachments that in 2018, uh, our opioid overdose rate was 48% higher than the state average. Um, so where, whereas it seemed like some of the other numbers uh, that were shared suggested we were perhaps now uh, lower than that. But um, you know, is that approximately still where we're at? Is 48% higher than the state average? Um, so again, I will defer to some of our, my panelists, uh, um, again, uh, Behavioral Health Director Eric Riera or uh, Dr. Fiore. So were you talking about one of my graphics that said um, that it was 40% higher in 2018? Uh, actually, the, that stat came out of uh, the attachment risk of infectious disease outbreaks associated with injection drug use and county syringe services programs role in prevention. So, but I was and I was trying to reconcile it with uh, some of the graphs that you'd shared, Dr. Fiore. Right. Um, the data that I gave you was uh, um, from California Department of Public Health in combination with my caseload. Um, we have had some disparities in the past, but we have uh, been working in collaboration over the last couple of years to tighten up the, the um, consistency with the data from my cases to what they're reporting. But 
um, in 2018, there is an, for me, there has been an increase in deaths since you were asking about deaths in 2018 for all comers of all drugs. Um, I know that in the graphic from California Department of Public Health, it showed a decrease, but that was just with the opioids. And I'm not sure what this other uh, data that you got where that came from. So I can't speak to their data, but um, as far as my graphs, I mean, I'm the only one doing uh, 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 investigating drug overdose deaths. So I would think that my data is more accurate because it reflects my reality. <laughs> so I'm not sure where they got their data from. Yeah, it looks like either uh, maybe according to CDPH. Yeah, you have to be careful with the data that comes from CDPH because they talk about very specific things. So they're, they may be reporting uh, specifically out of uh, one type of drug and they also normalize all their data to a per capita uh, basis to so that kind of um, sometimes skews the data. So I'm, I'd have to see exactly what you're looking at in order to help you interpret it. Okay. And just generally speaking, if we're seeing, you know, whatever the number is, I, I'll just use the for, the, for sake of comparison or uh, example, this 48% number, if we were seeing 48% more overdoses um, from opioids in our community, could we assume that we have 48% uh, more uh, or, or larger per capita um, population of people who are using those substances in our community? I don't know where this 48% of drug overdose is coming from. That's a huge amount of increase, but um, it, yeah. Um, if if there are more if there are more deaths, then there has to be more people using in order to get that uh, that increase in deaths. But I don't know where that forty percent increase is coming from. That seems just like a huge amount um, for this county. Maybe that number is for the state as a whole. I don't know. Uh, I'm happy to share the document. It was one of our attachments for this item. Yeah, that would be helpful. Sure. Um, I wanted to move on to the, um, the syringe services program a little bit. I was looking at the December 2020 report, um, and it looks like of uh, I believe 137 visits, um, just six people uh, or 4% of total visits um, received some kind of, um, I believe this is a, a um, MAP type referral. Um, so. Uh, yeah, drug drug treatment. Um, so I'm just kind of curious, um, you know, how come we're not prioritizing MAT referral more in our process of, of working with people who visit syringe services? I can take that um, question and I, I definitely invite uh, Danny or um, others to chime in. So when it comes to um, through our syringe services program, you know, part of using a harm reduction approach, you know, meeting people where they're at is um, we provide that referral when people are interested in that referral. So when that um, when our we mark that education was provided or referral was provided for drug treatment uh, services, it's because there is a specific engagement um, in the uh, participant identified motivation to seek drug treatment services. It is offered to every participant and we offer if people want to get uh, know more information. Um, many times they don't, but whenever there's the opportunity for people to be engaged in that conversation, um, we take, you know, we take that opportunity and provide that referral. Um, but certainly Danny uh, would be able to provide more input on that. Okay, so you're saying that potentially 100% of patients who, who visit the syringe services program are offered some kind of drug treatment. Uh, I'm just asking for clarification because the syringe services program report says uh, education offered uh, drug treatment 4%. So is that, maybe there's some confusion there that that's like acceptance versus? So when, uh, uh, yes. Uh, happy to clarify, Supervisor Koenig. Um, so when, when people, when an individual, a participant goes into a syringe service program, um, we ask them what they need. We usually, so it is typical that 
our SSP staff will ask, would you like any information about Matt or other you know, social service referrals? And then, um, but what we do is um, we don't check the box that we provided education or referral unless we had a significant conversation with that individual. Maybe they actually asked about um, resources for Matt. Uh, it could be that one of our peer mentors was down there working SSP and they were able to engage in a more detailed conversation um, and were able to actually do a referral for Matt services and set up an appointment. Um, so that's when that box is checked, that there was a, uh, it was a significant encounter related to drug treatment education. Great, yeah, and I'm, and, and I'm glad you mentioned um, the peer counselors. Um, I don't know if, if Coach is still on the call, I also really wanted to commend you for overcoming uh, a, a really difficult and, and debilitating addiction and emerging that much stronger today. And uh, I'm really inspired to hear your story and I uh, am heartened to hear that you're also working as a peer mentor today. Um, so my question is, do we currently, uh, it, we're currently employing some number of people uh, who have personally overcome addiction in the syringe services program? And, and if, is that correct? And if so, how many? Um, am I there? Any, Can you hear me? Yes, yes. You hear me now? Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, so our peer mentors, our peer uh, support specialists, uh, they go through a curriculum that we have set up for them uh, on on those services, you know. And and once they go through that training, then we uh, get them through our VIP process. And basically, they're just they're not. None of them are paid positions. I wish we had some paid positions. That'd be awesome to uh, give uh, them some paid positions, even if it's uh, some extra help or something. I don't know if there's some way to work that in some way, but uh, they're basically volunteering and they come in and, and they get to give back in that way. And that's, and that's what we have set up for now. You know, something down the road comes in. I mean, I would love it if uh, we can offer them a job and then they could step right into the field that way, you know, or even that experience right now, they're getting all that experience and they're giving back. Some of them, like I said, are in school. There was a couple other guys that wanted to share today too, but they have class at uh at two o'clock and so they weren't able to come uh, and, uh, and then the other ones were working. So, but uh, we, they're not paid, not paid positions. Got it. How, and, and how many people currently volunteer? And this, this is at the syringe services program or is this? At this is through our, location? this is through our MAP program in partnership with the syringe service program. So COVID, COVID, uh, you know, like Mike Tyson says, everybody has a plan until you get hit in the mouth, right? COVID, COVID hit us in the mouth and we had to rearrange and do everything and uh, how we do our workflows and whatnot. And so that kind of really hampered things and getting people in here. You know, we had to change how we did stuff in the clinics, telehealth and whatnot. And uh, a lot of our patients weren't coming in or they were coming in every couple of months and it was just real quick in and out. So right now we have, I want to say we have like maybe around five. I'd, I'd have to go look that are, that are, uh, actual peer mentors we have, I think there was about 20 of them that went through the curriculum. And I'm right now I'm in the midst of working with the uh, UCLA to, we have a more updated and uh, better curriculum for them that we're gonna uh, start teaching them uh, and do more of our cohorts in there. So there's about probably about five right now, but we're starting to ramp up people. It's a little process. I'm not sure if you know, for the VIP process, you just, it's like getting a job. <laughs> They got, we help walk them through getting, uh, you know, a cover letter explaining criminal background, um, um, the resume, uh, saying what a letter, why they want to be in this field. They have to go do fingerprints. There's a, there's a whole process of going through that. And that takes some time sometimes. And you can imagine that with uh, this pandemic and going in and out. So uh, we're starting to ramp up and I feel like we're going to start to get more and more of our uh, patients that are in long-term recovery involved. And, and we're gonna have more of our cohorts of these guys and women go through uh, the training that uh, I'm getting set up through UCLA for all of them. Great, that, that's really encouraging to hear. Um, and I, I have to say, if I, um, you know, again, coach's experience was really inspiring. I can't think of uh, a better use for some of that $150,000 grant that we got than creating some paid positions uh, for people like coach to, um, you know, really be, um, part of the face of our county program um, and, and directly working with people who are still struggling with addiction today. 
Yeah, so Rashawn, Rashawn corrected me. Uh, there, we got three actively in working through the uh, exchange, and then we have a bunch of them in the works. Uh, when I say in the works, they're doing the completing all those processes and steps. Okay, but those are still volunteer positions. They're all volunteer, yes. Right, right. Maybe, maybe, maybe we can get everybody to make some permanent positions for them. Right. <laughs> uh, happy to look at that. Um, so this is just a, a simple question that I've been asked by um, by folks in the community, various constituents. It's just, just, you know, why why wouldn't the county just totally focus on um, on leading with a MAT program, right? Whether it's methadone or suboxone, um, why don't we just put all our, our resources in, in leading with that program instead of uh, providing needles to people? Is that question to me or everybody? Uh, I, I, it's wh whoever wants to answer it. Um, I mean, I'm just what? curious if, you know, have other communities um, tried this kind of approach? I mean, I definitely un understand, you know, the public health challenges around limiting, um, uh, you know, diseases related to IV drug use. Um, but has, has any community tried leading um, with, with offering mat related services instead of needles? So to answer your question, this is Nini, the Health, Health Services Agency Director. Thank you for your question. Um, you have to think about the reason that we provide services and the approach that public health takes for any public health issue. Um, it's, it's kind of like saying we only want to prevent heart disease by one approach and that's diet and exercise or one approach, it's medications. So the primary reason for syringe services programs is to address communicable disease from injection drug use. And that there's a reason that these programs are under the California Office of AIDS because HIV is one of the key um, diseases that we're, that we're trying to prevent transmission, including other bloodborne pathogens such as hep C. And so for that approach, um, if we're only focused on that, and we know that harm reduction means you meet people where they're at. So rather than saying you cannot receive any services unless you agree to a prescription, um, really means that there's so many people in our community who are actively um, drug users that will not be able to access a whole slew of services. We take the same approach when it comes to preventing pregnancy, when it comes to preventing STDs and chronic diseases as well. Rather than saying we will withhold treatment or not provide access unless you take the best, you know, what we deem as the path for you to take, um, we need people exactly where they are. And so that's the approach for SSP. And then the reason for SSP is always to reduce disease. Um, the end goal of MAT is not to reduce, reduce communicable disease transmission of bloodborne pathogen. So they, the two programs work hand in hand, and that is an avenue to um, to get people off drugs, to get them into recovery. But it's certainly not um, the solution for um, reducing HIV transmission and Hep C transmission through using it. All right, thank you for that explanation. Yeah, I, I would also say this is Danny. Uh, you know, you can't force nobody to do anything. You know. There, there's a saying, you know, uh, what if you could take a horse to the water, but you can't make them drink. But the other part of that is you can make them thirsty, right? And so the way we make them thirsty is having our, our peer mentors and our other staff be in there to, to be able to be there to catch them at that time and meet them where they're at. You know, you can't say hey, everybody has to do Matt because, uh, you know, this ain't, this ain't a, I always tell people this ain't a cookie cutter treatment, you know, what works for some people work doesn't work for other people, you know, and they have, that's why this, like me was saying, this is one avenue, you know, so we can't try to force everybody down that avenue. We're gonna have a lot of uh, problems with that, you know, and we just gotta work with people where they're at and when they're ready to come and with us making them thirsty, every time they come in there, you see how Jen was saying, it's offered to everybody. Uh, right. You know, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna say one day, and that's been my experience, all right, hey man, Danny, I'm ready, man, or I'm tired of this. How do I get connected, man, you know? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I uh, I like that analogy. You can't you can't uh, force a you you can lead a horse to water. You can't force them to drink, but you you can make them thirsty. <laughs> um, just a couple more quick questions. I was re really encouraging to hear that we began a MAP program in jails in August in the midst of the pandemic. Um, 
And I'm just curious, you know, how we're managing the transition when people get out. I, you know, I understand from other programs like Rhode Island um, that that um, that's really the critical piece is is making sure that when people get out and now they, um, you know, have access again to maybe some of the injection drugs that they were using before, uh, how do we ensure that they continue treatment? So we're we're on a. a... It was every Tuesday. Now I think we're going once a month with the jail, a bunch of different agencies and the county. And uh, we're, we've been working through that since August, maybe a little bit before August. And, uh, and so if somebody's, somebody uh, needs math services, they call us, whatever agency that is, and then they connect them. And so that, that is working. And as, if things don't work out, we kind of check in all with each other and figure out what went wrong and how we do things better. And you know, people are still learning, we're still growing. As a county and different agencies, and so that that is working right now. Uh, it is it is up and running, and uh, it's starting. It's starting to people are starting to come in. I don't know, Cat Catherine, you want to say something? Yeah, thank you, Danny. Um, I know it's weird calling me Catherine. My name's Kate, Katie, but <laughs> it says Catherine. Um, so actually, I just wanted to address, I know that Sarah Fletcher is actually on, she was going to be doing the presentation for um, probation. Uh, and so I just want to kind of add a little bit about our Prop 47 CAFES grant. Um, part of this is that the Sheriff's Department does have a position that's a discharge planner that is specifically for the MAP program. And so um, once someone is connected, there is one position that is currently in the process of getting hiring that will link them to the clinic or other services um, for MAT. But then part of the CAFE's grant is um, a six million, a little bit under $6 million grant that came in to probation that really supports decreasing the population with substance use in the criminal justice system. And part of that is that there are two positions that are called discharge planners that um, are currently hired by Encompass that can provide linkage to services from the jail into treatment. And so um, it kind of goes beyond just doing the assessment and being able to case manage to support for people who are not linked to other services um, or other programming. And so with someone that's linked to collaborative courts, we work with them, we get them out of and um, out of the jails as soon as possible, but then there's several other people that are not linked. And so these discharge planners are specifically for that. Um, and a lot of that is not only linking to MAT services, but also linking to um, detox treatment and also housing. So part of the CAFE's grant also has um, a significant portion that is for treatment funds for pe uh, people who don't qualify for maybe AB 109, things like that. And so there's this full continuum of care that is happening in order to get people out of incarceration, linked to services, and then also moving them forward so that they can kind of address their substance use um, in advance before it becomes kind of a re repeat into the criminal justice system. Right. So the majority of people have a discharge planner to work with is what you're saying. And, and our goal is to hire two, but we have one today. We have um, two discharge planners that are through the CAFE's grant that um, is within Compass. And then we have one that the Sheriff's Department has hired that is just about to start that's specifically for the MAT program that's in the jail. Got it. Thank you. Uh, my final question um, is, I, I know we're trying to create a centralized syringe litter reporting um, service, and I, and I was just curious, I, I think this would be a question for Mimi, uh, if we've looked at using the My Santa Cruz County app as a, as a way to do that. Um, I know today that um, if I pull up the app on my phone as a way to report uh, encampments or potholes or, or, or other kinds of trash, um, and it would seem natural enough to uh, use that same app to report needle litter. Um, and, you know, maybe there's already have been some reports through that app. Um, have, have, uh, have any needle related um, reports come through that app today? And, and have, you, have you considered using it in the future? Um, thanks for the question. Yes, we have had lots of discussion about using the existing app as well as um, other apps. I think the barrier the reason we're deferring the report and recommendations is less because we don't have ideas, but more because we want to engage uh, not only our SSP advisory board, but also 
we have city partners that we need to work with um, because the directive of the board was for um, a centralized systemic approach. And, um, and we wanna make sure that all of the partners that are a part of public works, of disposal of all, you know, there are many, many stakeholders that we would like to bring together. And there may be a very, very simple solution, which is find a contractor to do that once we put the system in place. Um, I will say that when we get to that place, part, part of the barrier is funds. You asked a question before about um, dedicated funds for the program. So um, we don't have any permanent staff like truly funded for the program. We do get the grant that uh, Chief Herrera mentioned, and then out of um, out of the um, net county cost or general funds that we apportion, that we get as an agency, that we apportion to public health, more than 20% go to support the syringe services program, because it's not like it's a there's a dedicated funding stream from CDPH to uh, the, the state to do that. And then we add our, um, our epidemiological staff, we add our admin staff, we add our chief of public health. Our, so there's a lot of folks who are working on this and um, we're, we're using public health discretionary dollars to fund it. And it's getting harder and harder because, um, because of the financial situation of um, the health services agency in the county. So um, we're trying to find ways to fund things that, um, live both in and outside of public health in partnership with, um, with other partners who have responsibility in those areas, such as disposal. Got it. Right, so I'm gonna just clarify what you said, um, Director Hall. So of the 20% of discretionary funds that HSA receives, or, or sorry, of, of the discretionary funds that HSA receives from the general fund, 20% are somehow involved in the certain services program? No, let, let me clarify. So HSA receives a certain amount of net county costs and every division receives some. So of public health, so syringe services program lives in the public health division. So of the entire public health division's net county cost or general fund contribution, um, over 20% goes to support the cost of the syringe services program. And over time, as we've gotten more directives from the board and asked, been asked to expand the program and accessibility, and um, you know, we, we've had several directives this year, the cost of the program continues to increase, but we have no additional funds set aside to, um, to do those things. So we do the best that we can with the discretionary public health funds that we have, but it often means that our staff are simply just working over time, um, trying to make things happen. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think for the clarification and for the hard work. That's all my questions. Thank you. Hey, uh, I, Supervisor Kappa, did you have any questions? Are you? Yes, uh, real quick. Uh, I don't expect uh, detailed uh, uh, answers on all this, but I want to thank all of you for being. Uh, seems like we have a wealth of information here at our disposal. So uh, let's take advantage of it. Um, any, any, any one of you uh, could probably comment on this, uh, mental health uh, counseling. Uh, when somebody is uh, trying to get off of an addiction, would you say all of them need uh, follow-up uh, mental health uh, counseling? Hi, I can start with a response. Um, hey, how, how you doing, Eric? Good. How are you, Supervisor Caput? Okay. okay. Good to see you. I think when you look at the success of each of our programs, it's based on a combination of different approaches, um, counseling being one of them. Um, often we're supporting counseling with medication assistance, such as the program that Danny oversees. Um, so it's often, you know, a tailored response based on the person's needs, but the more components that we can add and that they're accepting of, the higher the success rate we're likely to have on a long-term basis. Okay, great. And then I guess uh, uh, let's uh, just take a, a, a 
couple of situations that have happened <clears throat> uh, that our office has dealt with trying to refer people and get help. <clears throat> uh, single mom will take, uh, uh, and uh, the dad's gone, and the mom has an addiction. Now the children then end up with our uh, child's uh, protective services and all of that. Are, are they getting counseling as, and also they're getting, uh, you know, a lot of services from the county? In terms of the children? Yes. <clears throat> so behavioral health has a formalized relationship with our human services division and we get referrals directly from them, um, particularly from child welfare. So um, we're often the ones that are working directly with those children and helping to support the children through um, the services that we offer. And we're also often working with the parents as well and helping connect the parent who has the substance use disorder with services in the community. Yeah, that's where it gets real difficult. Like the mom will say, uh, hey, I, I want my kids back. I want my kids back, but they're still uh, it does. It does get difficult, um, but it's often a strong motivator for parents as well. Um, and it's something that, that we can work with them to support that as a goal. Um, their goal being to get their children back in the home. There are certain conditions that often come with that, and we use that to help support them connecting with and remaining in treatment very often. Right, and so uh, we're also talking with like CASA, uh, court-appointed court uh, advocates or whatever for the children too, right? Yeah, there's often a number of, of different groups and advocates involved in that family's care, and we're trying to coordinate and use whatever support we can to ensure that the needs of the family are met, both for the kids and the parents. And, and all of this seems to be uh, overlapping into all the other problems we're having, like homeless uh, problems uh, right outside my door here uh, at the vet's hall. We have 71 uh, people here uh, and some uh, with, um, you know, the mom and their uh, children. Uh, so I, I guess uh, we're, we're dealing with them also, right? We are, and I also wouldn't, um, I, I would be remiss in, in not saying that the impacts of, of having schools closed for such a long period of time has resulted in lots of kids that we would ordinarily be receiving referrals from the school um, for behavioral health services. That's that's declined significantly because kids are home right now and we're just not seeing those referrals come in. So I know in behavioral health, we're looking forward to seeing schools reopen so that we can get those connections back in place and provide access to the services that they need. Yeah, I just saw four uh, children uh, uh, during our break uh, that are here. And I guess uh, they're set up with the school somehow also I, uh, here at the vet's hall. I'm not sure about that though. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Supervisor. I don't think that there's any more comments from the board. Um, I don't know if we have any uh, anybody from the public that wanted to comment um, on this. We do not Thank have you. speakers for public comment. Pardon me, we do? We do not, no. Okay, okay. Uh, well, this, um, this has been a very uh, enlightening uh, discussion for two hours and I really appreciate this report. I think, um, I thank you everyone for participating and presenting in this. And uh, I think we'll just make a, uh, have, if I could entertain a motion to defer this to May for a report with recommendation on we're improving the syringe litter, and uh, I'm sure the other aspects of this um, subject will be come up at that time. Uh, if I could just have a motion and a second to do that. I'll move so the recommended second. action. Move second. By Clarity, second by Koenig. Okay, uh, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. 
Cabot? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, that concludes our board meeting for today. Uh, I want to thank everybody for participating in this last discussion. Uh, very, very uh, interesting. Uh, we will adjourn this uh, Board of Supervisors meeting of uh, February 23rd, 2021. Everybody have a safe week. Thank you very much for everything. I'm really going to have a late thank lunch. You. <laughs>